Honourable Senators, the President. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area and pay respect to elders past and present of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. Senators, I invite you, as I read the prayer, to pray or reflect in your own way on your responsibilities to the people of Australia and to future generations. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. <clears throat> Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Are there any documents to be tabled by the clerk? Yes, President, I table documents pursuant to statute and returns to order as listed on the dynamic red. Are there any proposals for committees to meet during the sittings of the Senate? I call the clerk. Mr. President, committees have lodged proposals as shown at item four of today's order of business. I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. Um, Senator Gallagher. Thank you. I move that the following general business orders of the day be considered this week at the time for a private senator's bill. Number 29, Migration Amendment Evacuation to Safety Bill 2023 today and number 30, Northern Territory Safe Measures Bills 2023 on Thursday, the 9th of March 2023. Thank you. I call the clerk. Oh, so the question is, the motion as moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. Private senators bills ordered the day number 29, migration amendment, evacuation to safety bill 2023, resumption of second reading debate. Senator McKim. Well, thank you, President. On the 19th of July 2013, Australia's government, a Labor government, reintroduced a policy of offshore detention, making it clear that someone who arrived in Australia by boat to claim asylum would never settle here and instead would be forcibly transferred into an offshore prison. That policy has resulted in murders, rapes, child sex abuse, state-sanctioned child abuse, institutional brutality, deliberate dehumanisation of innocent people and the destruction of countless lives. The policy was arbitrary, it was illegal under international law and it was contrary to Australia's international obligations. It established Australia's offshore gulags. They were designed to harm people so grievously that those people would be forced back to the country that they fled from in the first place to face the persecution and the risks that they had fled from in the first place. It undoubtedly qualified under international law as a system of torture. This is because it consisted of the deliberate infliction of severe harm on people for the purpose of coercing them and others into particular actions. I want to say today I hope those responsible for this system's design and implementation one day face the consequences of their actions. Charge them with torture, convict them of torture, lock them up for a while and give them a taste of their own medicine. That's what should happen to those people. That Australia's offshore detention policy framework has been seized upon and promoted by fascists, Nazis and far-right political parties in Europe, even to the extent of using the very same words and even the very same font 
as Australian government communications tells us everything we need to know about its philosophical underpinnings and the kind of people it was designed to appeal to. Right now, as we debate this bill, the UK government is seeking to implement its own version of Australia's shameful policy. This is one of the most shameful exports that this country has ever produced, and it has seen us go from an international human rights champion to an international human rights pariah. Offshore detention has been a humanitarian calamity, and it has been one of the darkest and bloodiest chapters in our country's story. It is time that we wrote the ending to that chapter, and this bill will help us to do that. After 10 long years of offshore detention, it is beyond abhorrent that about 150 people remain in exile in Papua New Guinea and Nauru. Every one of those people is suffering. Some of them are suffering grievously. It is no exaggeration to say that the passage of this bill will save lives. It will save the lives of some innocent people who have been used as human billboards, who, like thousands of others, have been tortured in order to send a message to other people that they should not attempt to come to Australia by boat to claim asylum. This is the Senate's opportunity to make right a small part of the injustice the lies and the degradations of the last decade. This legislation does not require the government to settle people permanently in Australia, although that is the Greens' position, but it does require the government to offer to bring them to Australia to support them until a durable third country solution is secured. It is entirely consistent with Labor's policy platform, and on that basis there is no barrier to the Australian Labor Party voting for this legislation other than their own political courage. The fact that the Australian Labor Party sent every one of the 150 people who are still exiled in Papua New Guinea and Nauru to Manus Island and Nauru in the first place means that every Labor senator today has a moral responsibility to vote to end their exile. When Labor was in opposition, Labor senators and MPs were happy to support the Greens' Medivac amendment. This bill gives Labor the chance to finish the job. It represents a compassionate and practical solution to the ongoing calamity of offshore detention. It provides a necessary step towards a durable solution for people who have been without one for nearly a decade now. It will offer people a chance at safety in Australia with the support and the medical attention they need while awaiting resettlement in a safe third country. This is a critical step in ensuring that people who sought asylum in Australia and were treated so abhorrently finally get an opportunity at the dignity and respect that they deserve and a chance, a much needed chance, to rebuild their lives in safety and freedom. Now, the explanatory memorandum goes through the provisions of this bill, but in short, it will compel the government to make an immediate offer of evacuation to all refugees and people who sought asylum in Australia who are still offshore in Papua New Guinea or Nauru. That is about 150 people. It will compel the government to place all refugees and people seeking asylum who accept the offer into the Australian community and not into held detention, and it will compel the government to make available any medical assessments and treatments that people evacuated to Australia need. There are many other provisions in this bill, and I urge senators to educate themselves about it through reading the bill and the explanatory memorandum. But at the end of the day, there is one thing that this bill will undisputably do, and that is it will save lives. It will actually save lives of people who have suffered for 10 long years now. And it will do that in a way that is completely consistent with the Australian Labor Party's policy platform that they took to the most recent election. Now, I could quote you chapter and verse, but time will prevent me from going right through all of Labor's policy positions. 
that this bill is in line with, but Labor uh, commit to uh, giving permanent protection to those found to be owed Australia's protection. And I make the point here that almost all of the people that this bill covers have been found to be owed protection. They've been found to be owed protection, and under Labor's policy, they should be given permanent protection. Labor promises that people in detention will be treated fairly and reasonably within the law and promises that people in detention will be provided an appropriate standard of care, including the provision of health, mental health and education services to a standard consistent with that afforded to the Australian community. Well, that is not being delivered to the people in Papua New Guinea and Nauru. And I want to make it clear here. The people in Papua New Guinea whom the previous government, the LNP government, washed its hands of in a disgraceful abrogation of its duty of care, still should be and are under Australia's duty of care. And it is beyond shameful that a Labor government has refused to redress that decision made by Mr Morrison and Mr Dutton and instead is carrying on like some kind of pale version of the LNP. It is beyond disgraceful, and the people in Papua New Guinea have to be considered under Australia's care because we owe them a duty of care, having exiled them under a Labor government, I might add, uh, so long ago. Now, it's critical in this debate that we hear some of the voices of the actual people, the actual people who are uh, suffering and who have suffered under this disgraceful policy framework. And I want to place some of those on the record now uh, in a de-identified way. Firstly, uh, here's some words from Sharif, who is a refugee in Nauru who is awaiting urgent evacuation to Australia. I might add doctors in Nauru and an Australian specialist have recommended Sharif be transferred to Australia for treatment. That still hasn't happened, disgracefully, and it has been a decade since Sharif has seen his family, including his two children. Sharif, Sharif says, it is important to get evacuated because we do not get any treatment here in Nauru. At the moment, I cannot imagine being able to think about resettlement. I can only imagine after I receive treatment. Here's Raja, a Tamil refugee held in Nauru, who is in excruciating pain, which is increasing each day. Raja says, take one minute for us and think about our feelings and our families. We're separated from our children, our siblings and our parents. It is not easy. If we have done anything wrong, tell us. Jam uh, Noor Muhammad is a refugee recently transferred to Australia from Nauru for medical treatment. He said this, Australian immigration forced me to Nauru. I did not want to go, but for 10 years I followed the rules. I want to see justice for my friends in Nauru and in Papua New Guinea. Open your hearts and your minds and do something. So those are some of the many case studies that uh, the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Committee heard about during the inquiry, the report of which was tabled in the Senate yesterday. I want to just diverge slightly and refer uh, to, uh, to only one further submission to that inquiry, and that was the only submission that the inquiry received, I might add, that called for this bill to be rejected by the Senate, and that, completely unsurprisingly, was from the Department of Home Affairs. Now, it is beyond belief that those rampant hypocrites in the Department of Home Affairs would dare try to use the Convention on the Rights of the Child as an argument against this bill. I mean, please, these people have been torturing children on Nauru for a decade. They oversaw a system of deliberate state-sanctioned child abuse on Nauru, and then they have the gall, the barefaced gall, to argue in their submission using the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. Give us a break. I mean, seriously. 
These people who deliberately tortured children have no right to be quoting the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. Get back in the bin, you absolute monsters. You absolute monsters. Get back in the bin. You're a disgrace. 150 people left stranded in Nauru and in Papua New Guinea are the small remnants of the thousands who were exiled in the first place. Innocent people who face murder, who face rape, who face child sex abuse, who face medical neglect, who face deliberate dehumanisation and who witnessed the destruction of so many lives. They were innocent people who reached out a hand to our country and asked for a help and they were treated disgracefully and abominably. They were used like the corpses that used to be impaled on the walls of medieval cities to send a message to other desperate people that they should not try to enter. Those who remain stranded today have been suffering for 10 years and they are still suffering today. And we've got an opportunity today to take a small step towards ending some of that suffering. Many have chronic and critical health conditions that need urgent treatment that is not able to be provided in Papua New Guinea or Nauru. There is simply no point in extending their suffering. It achieves precisely nothing. It is simply brutality for the sake of brutality. Surely, colleagues, we are a better country than that. Well, we're about to find out. Senator Green. Thank you very much, um, Acting Deputy President. Um, uh, I'm pleased to be speaking on this bill today and I rise to speak on the private senator's bill on amending the Migration Act. Um, I rise and speak on this bill as chair of the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Legislation Committee. I've had the opportunity to discuss the bill um, with um, the senator that's moved this bill and receive a wide range of evidence from stakeholders and the department. Uh, over the course of the inquiry, we received over 150 submissions about the bill and the issues it seeks to address. And I do want to place on record, um, I want to thank the organisations and individuals that took the time to make a submission to the legislation inquiry. I understand that on this issue, we, um, views are deeply held and strongly felt across the community and across the parliament. At the last election, the Prime Minister spoke of the need to be strong on borders without being weak on humanity. Being strong on borders without being weak on humanity. It's an important balance and it's one that we are getting right in government. It's one that only a Labor government can get right. Which is why we have already followed through on our election promise to provide a permanent visa pathway for existing temporary protection visa and safe haven enterprise visa holders. And perhaps inconveniently to the mover of this bill, since the election our government has since the election, our government, the number of displaced people on Nauru has more than halved. Has more than halved. And look, through you, Chair, I'll take that interjection. What I'm going to do today is stand here and calmly state the facts and the policy and the actions that our government is doing. What I'm not going to do, what I'm not going to do is grandstand and speak over other senators and allow other senators to um, draw this debate into an exercise in making um, viral social media videos um, using emotive language. Uh, what I'm going to do... Senator, Senator Green, on point of order? Yes, um, improper reflection on another senator. So, firstly, uh, Senator Green has said that somehow people being removed from Nauru uh, is inconvenient to me. That is a personal reflection which is not true and I ask her to withdraw that. And secondly, uh, she has stated very clearly that uh, my you. outrage is confected and, and for the purpose of uh, delivering social media content, it's not confected, confected. Uh, it is genuine and appropriate. And I ask her to withdraw that as well. On the point of order, 
Um, respectfully, senators across the chamber sat through the language that was used by the senator who moved this bill. There were no okay. points of orders called. I appreciate this is an emotive debate, but I, there is no point of order. Thank you. Uh, I'll, 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 I'll rule on that. Uh, I don't believe there was a point of order, but uh, it may assist the chamber to, if there was anything that uh, you could withdraw. But it's up to you. Thank you. Um, uh, if I made an, uh, a reflection on the previous senator's um, uh, motives, I withdraw that to assist the chamber. Um, but what I will say is, as I progress with my speech, it would assist the chamber and myself um, if there were no interjections and I didn't have someone speaking over me while I'm trying to give my speech. Um, what I was saying, what I was contributing to this debate are the facts, the policy and the actions that our government is taking. That is what I'm doing today in this speech. I highlight the developments that the Albanese Labor government is doing now to determine that our government is creating a functioning, effective migration and humanitarian program. That is what we are doing. Again, at the election, the Prime Minister was very, very clear. We can be tough on borders without being weak on humanity. Regional processing does both of these things. I have to be clear that the Albanese government is committed to Operation Sovereign Borders and regional processing, including our ongoing partnership with Nauru. We know that people smugglers <coughs> exploit and encourage vulnerable people to risk their lives on dangerous voyages to reach Australia. Regional processing is designed to break this model and to prevent deaths at sea. An essential aspect of this model is providing people currently on Nauru permanent options through third country settlement. For all their talk, the previous government achieved very little regarding third country resettlement on, for people on Nauru. But since coming to government, let me say it again, we have more than halved the number of displaced people on Nauru. And we have secured resettlement into third countries like the USA, Canada and New Zealand. For these people, they can finally begin the process of rebuilding their lives. I appreciate that some in this place want to see additional reform at a faster rate. And I appreciate, I'm sure, as other senators do, that not everyone in this place supports um, Operation Sovereign Borders and regional processing. But that is the government's policy and we are delivering it. Regional processing has settled policy on both sides of politics for almost a decade, and the government has been clear and consistent in its position on delivering this. The minister has consistently reiterated that this government is strong on borders. Strong on borders because we know that regional processing breaks the business model of people smugglers. If you want to talk about saving lives and protecting people, that is what we are talking about today. In doing so, it saves lives of vulnerable people who would otherwise be exploited onto leaky boats to attempt a dangerous voyage at sea. It sends a message that persons will not be settled in Australia when they take a dangerous and often deadly route. It's as simple as that. And I recognise, I recognise that that is a tough measure. But that tough measure has broken a model that exploits vulnerable people. It exploits vulnerable people and we have broken that model. The government has been determined and focused in its conduct and support of Operation Sovereign Borders. But unlike the previous government, we haven't sought to politicise this issue in some sort of attempt to weaponise or, or sow distrust in the community. What we have done, what we are doing today, is calmly getting on with the job. We have a view that it is important to, um, an important undertaking to be pursued with and deal with it in the seriousness that this issue demands. On third country resettlement, can I say an essential part of delivering this policy is working with third countries. It is working with the government that has led to the number of people on Nauru almost halving. Our government finally took action on third country resettlements, including the long-standing offer from the New Zealand government, which was ignored by the previous government. Only our government, only a Labor government, has taken action to ensure work to resettle people is happening. 
Only our government is ensuring that this is happening through our close engagement with New Zealand. We had a first group of refugees depart Nauru and resettle in New Zealand and start new lives. We continue to go about this work in an orderly but diligent way with the care that it requires. As a government, as a government we know that two things can be true at once. The Albanese government is committed to strong borders, but we are also committed to being a modern, responsible nation that finds space for vulnerable people fleeing persecution. We can do this important resettlement work because of the enduring deterrent value of regional processing. It is a system that has and will be kept in readiness to respond to any contingency. While there may be disagreements about policy, the fact is that regional processing saves lives by discouraging dangerous voyages at sea. Our government is working hard to obtain viable third country resettlement options for those on Nauru. Now, I do want to address one of the other things that our government is doing um, to deal with some of the aftermath of the previous government's neglect of this migration program. Just last month, the Albanese Labor government confirmed it would provide a permanent visa pathway for existing temporary protection visas and safe haven enterprise visa holders. This was our government delivering on our election commitment to end the state of limbo for refugees who have been kept in Australia for the last decade. Around 19,000 refugees have been provided a certain future here in Australia. These are people who have been found to be refugees. They are also people who have made a life in our communities. They have worked here or built small businesses. They have often made outstanding contributions to rural and regional communities. And despite their contributions, their visa status means that they couldn't buy a house or pursue further education. These people were left in limbo for the past decade because of the belligerence of the previous government. But now, they are on a fast track to build their lives with a sense of certainty that cannot come from rolling protection applications. Just this weekend, the Minister for Immigration, Citizenship and Multicultural Affairs, Andrew Giles, announced further funding to our government's Economic Pathway to Refugee Integration Grant Program. This program supports social enterprise that delivers employment opportunities for refugees. Programs like this not only provide an opportunity for communities to harness the potential of our diversity, but they also provide refugees without a sense of stability. Our government takes the view that support for those fleeing persecution entails more than just visa approvals. We do recognise how much security and certainty that it can provide. We understand the urgency that many on TPV and CHEV holders would feel about settling their visa status. To assist with this, the Albanese Labor government has committed $9.4 million over two years for specialist legal support. In summary, our government is taking the important vital steps in giving certainty to those people whose future was kept in limbo by the previous government whether it's by promptly processing visas after the unacceptable backlog, or providing third country resettlement options finally for those refugees on Nauru, or providing certainty for thousands of refugees who have been on rolling TPVs. You can have tough borders and, and without being weak on humanity. Our government seeks to do both. We are the only government that is doing that. We are the only party of government that can do that. We have been and we will continue to be consistent in this approach. Now, those on the other side of the chamber might seek to say that we're not being tough enough on borders. And some at the end of the chamber might say that we're not being strong enough when it comes to humanity. The truth is that none of this is black and white. That you do need a balanced approach, but only with a Labor government, only with a Labor government can you actually deliver a system which ensures that people are not enticed to take a vulnerable trip across the seas, that there is a regional processing and operation sovereign, sovereign borders that is well resourced to ensure that people don't put themselves in that dangerous position. 
At the same time, we are working through years of neglect under the previous government to make sure that third country resettlement is a priority and it's happening. We're getting on with it. We have halved the number of people on Nauru. We are working through this. We're doing it in a diligent and organised way without being sensational about it, without putting people at risk. This is what our government is doing, and it's because we can be tough on borders that we are choosing to not to be weak on humanity. Only a Labor government can do that. Only a Labor government is ending the years of uncertainty for TPV and Chev holders, and I, um, uh, and I want to ensure those people who have um, contributed to the um, inquiry into this bill that we have undertook, undertook to balance those very fragile um, considerations. This bill should not be supported. This bill um, is not the policy of the government for a very, very good reason. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Green. Senator Scott. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, at the outset, uh, can I say that uh, I deeply respect uh, Senator McKim in the introduction of this bill. Uh, I respect his passion with respect to this subject, and more than that, I think he, uh, he demonstrates that passion and concern in terms of the actions which he and his office take to advocate for, um, for personal cases, individual cases. So, uh, Senator McKim uh, puts his argument with great passion and. I think it's, um, it's based on a foundation of deep care for the people who are in the invidious position of being in regional processing centres. So um, I will uh, certainly I respect his motives in terms of bringing this bill. Uh, in terms of Senator Green's contribution, uh, I think Senator Green did appropriately summarise the activities of the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Legislation Committee. We did receive submissions from a very, very wide number of stakeholders who gave detailed evidence with respect to their concerns regarding the impact of regional processing on individuals, uh, and I commend each of those organisations for their advocacy in this regard, and I also commend them for the services and support which they've provided to people in regional processing centres. This is not an easy issue. This is certainly not an easy issue, and certainly over the time since I've become a senator, uh, I've uh, developed uh, relationships uh, through my office with people who have been in regional processing centres <clears throat> and sought to assist them in particular in terms of uh, advocacy to uh, provide a pathway for family and friends in particular after Afghanistan fell to the Taliban, to come to Australia. And that is very difficult. Many of those people are located in Pakistan, in Iran, uh, Turkey, other countries, and there is an overwhelming demand for the humanitarian visa allocations which this country provides. So this is not an easy issue, not an easy issue at all. One thing one thing which Senator McKim did not address in, in his contribution and which was not addressed in his dissenting report is the fact that between 2008 and 2013 some 50,000 people arrived by boat in this country. And that's 820 boats arrived in this country. And those boats, organised by people smugglers, organised by people preying on the most vulnerable in our world, um, led to a situation where Australia's system was essentially being overwhelmed and at least approximately 1,200 people died at sea. An absolute tragedy. And I commend everyone uh, who's in Australia's border force and our armed forces with respect to uh, the efforts and the tasks which they had to undertake in response to that unfolding tragedy. So regional processing Operation Sovereign Borders was in fact introduced to address that particular problem. It was introduced to address that particular problem of 50,000 people arriving between 2008 
to 2013 by 820 boats, with at least 1,200 dying at sea. That was the issue. That was the issue. And I think any, any contribution to this debate needs to, needs to recognise needs to recognise that fact, that there was an unfolding issue which caused the Rudd-Gillard-Rudd government to actually introduce regional processing. And that fact, those facts, need to be considered and weighed in the course of considering this private member's bill. And the tragedy of that, the tragedy of that was uh, that the Howard government, the Howard coalition government, had effectively, had effectively managed to deal with the issue of people smugglers providing boats for uh, the most vulnerable in our world to arrive on these shores in an uncontrolled fashion. The problem had been solved. The problem had been solved, and we wouldn't even be having this debate. We wouldn't even be having this debate, apart from one of the biggest policy failures, certainly in my lifetime from any public administration at a federal or state level, and that was the Rudd-Gillard-Rudd government reversing, reversing the previous policies of the coalition government. So Senator Green can talk about the actions that are currently being taken by the present government, but again, but again any reasonable and balanced contribution to this debate needs to recognise that this issue had been addressed. This issue had been addressed, and there would not be people currently on Nauru and in PNG, but for the fact, but for the fact that the Rudd Gillard gov Rudd government reversed the previous policy of the coalition government, the Howard Costello coalition government, and then and then had to scramble, then had to scramble to introduce regional processing. So that's why we're having the debate. That's why we're having this debate, the failure of the Rudd Gillard Rudd government. And that's a fact. And it was that failure, failure that led, between 2008 to 2013, Kevin Rudd elected as Prime Minister on 2008, and that led directly to 50,000 people seeking to arrive in this country by boat, by boats arranged by illegal people smugglers, 820 boats with 1,200 deaths at sea. One of the biggest public policy failures I have seen in my lifetime. So it's a bit rich to sit here and listen to Senator Green's contribution as if everything was light and uh, intelligent understanding and uh, only a Labor government can fix this problem when it was the Rudd-Gillard-Rudd government that failed, that failed to address this issue, changed Australia's policies, and actually, which directly led, directly led to 50,000 people arriving in Australia through unauthorised uh, maritime arrivals. Those are the facts, indisputable, indisputable. And any contribution in this debate, for it to be seen to be reasonable and balanced, should recognise that fact, especially in those contributions from the other side. It is also a fact that the coalition government, when it came to power under, uh, under Tony Abbott, Malcolm Turnbull, actually did take positive steps to arrange third party third country resettlement. That is also a fact, and, and again, it's indisputable. And there's been plenty of publicity about uh, a phone call between previous Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull and then President Donald Trump of the United States with respect to those arrangements, which had been entered into by a previous coalition government. So again, that's a fact. But the issue now we have to deal with is how do we humanely and appropriately deal with those people who are still within Nauru and are still within Papua New Guinea, recognising that Papua New Guinea is no longer a regional processing centre. And I agree with the majority report in the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Legislation Committee that this bill, this private member's bill, however well intentioned, however well intentioned, is not a bill which is going to fundamentally address this issue and which perversely could actually lead to a restart of the people smuggling business, even though that's not the intention. Even though that's not the intention. I recognise that's not the intention. But that is my concern. 
That is my fundamental concern. We cannot get back to a place where we have hundreds of boats coming to these shores, organised by people smugglers, and people, women, children, dying at sea. We simply ca cannot allow ourselves to go back to that place. And we have to, as quickly as we can, humanely deal with those who are in Nauru, with those on PNG, as humanely as possible, but we can't change the policy parameters in any way, in my view, that's going to lead to a restart of the people smuggling business. We did that once before as a country. We did that once before as a country. The people smuggling business was broken under the Howard Coalition government. It had stopped. It had stopped. The policy levers were changed. However well intentioned that was, the policy levers were changed, and then 50,000 people arrived, unauthorised maritime arrivals, 820 boats organised by the illegal people, the people smugglers. That's the reality. That's what happens. That's what happens. We can't give ammunition to the people smugglers to recommence their trade, to recommence their trade where their commodity is, is the most vulnerable of human beings. We simply cannot allow that to occur. It would be irresponsible in my view, however well intentioned, it would be irresponsible, irresponsible in my view to allow that um, awful, awful trading people to recommence. And that is the fundamental reason why I and those sitting on this side of the chamber, in dealing with this very, very difficult issue, uh, recommend that the Senate uh, reject, reject this bill. I do want to say, uh, with respect to um, the, the regional processing, that we do need to be respectful of those who this place, through our policies, through our legislation, have imposed burdens to uh, implement what the Australian government policy is. And I do commend all those people in the Department of Immigration, in Border Force and throughout the Australian government who have had to deal with this awful issue over so many years. We don't want to get in a position. We don't want to get into a position again where, where Australians in our armed forces, in our border force, are forced to deal with horrific, horrific scenes of uh, people dying at sea, being lost at sea. We simply can't let that to reoccur. And in my view, having carefully read Senator McKim's private members bill, the intention is clearly to bring an end to regional processing, and I, I respect that perspective. Uh, that would be the effect of the bill. I think it could not have any other effect the way it's drafted. Uh, and in my view, the great danger posed by that was that it would provide ammunition for the people smugglers to recommence their vile trade in the most vulnerable of people. So with those comments, Madam Acting Deputy President, in conclusion, I deeply respect the work that Senator McKim does in this place. I deeply respect his passion in relation to this subject. But considering the facts, considering the background, uh, I'm firmly of the view. I'm firmly of the view that this is the wrong course and it would present a risk, a real risk that the people smuggling business would recommence and we would go back to that period between 2008 and 2013 when 50,000 people arrived on these shores, uh, the subject of the vile people smuggling trade on 820 boats with at least 1,200 deaths at sea. And from my perspective, this chamber simply cannot let that occur, however well intentioned this private member's bill is. Senator Pocock. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. And I thank Senator McKim for this bill and the opportunity to debate this. I, I welcome this bill. For more than 20 years, the plight of asylum seekers and refugees in trying to reach Australia has been politicised. Successive governments have been in what seems to be a race to the bottom, campaigning on fear, division and cruelty. But this is an issue about people. We must remember that. This is, this is about people and not politics. As politicians, we have a responsibility to the people that we represent, and we have a responsibility to build a nation that we can be proud of. 
a nation that treats everyone with respect and dignity and that faces complex challenges uh, with courage, uh, with, with open debate and ultimately, in the end, I would hope with unity. In recent years, we have not faced this issue with unity and courage. People seeking asylum and refugees have been used as political footballs, with all sides using them for cheap point scoring. The 150 people that remain in Papua New Guinea and Nauru are victims of our collective political failure. There are certain basic human rights that everyone should have. We should all have the right to work, to put food on the table and have a roof over our heads. For those 150 people, these rights have been grossly violated. This bill is an opportunity to change that. If this bill is passed, there would finally be an offer to transfer people from offshore detention in PNG and Nauru to Australia, with the significant caveat that they are not subject to an adverse security assessment by ASIO. That's a, that's a really important caveat, and I think something that people pounce on when we talk about security threats uh, and uh, you know, the impost on communities here in, here in Australia. In Australia, they would have access to the medical treatment and mental health support that they require. The mental health support that, in many cases, they desperately require. Uh, reading through the submissions to the inquiry into this bill uh, was a moving and sad experience, it just reinforces that this is dealing with human beings like all of us, people who have hopes and dreams for their lives and for whatever reason have found them in a situation where they were so desperate that they decided that they needed to up and leave everything they knew, their family, to seek safety. And they have sought safety from Australia, and I, reading this report, we are failing them. In the words of one of my uh, constituents, a Canberran, uh, Peter, who made a submission to the inquiry, I'll, I'll, I'll quote him. The human face of the policy for those remaining in Papua New Guinea and Nauru is one of desperate misery, and this for people who risked all to flee oppression, torture and death in their countries of origin. The human face is missing from the committee report into this bill. In fact, accounts from those that are suffering are not even included in the text. So here are some of the stories taken from the submission from the Asylum Seeker Resource Centre. Mohammed is a Hazara man from Afghanistan who is currently in PNG. He's been recognised as a refugee. He is currently under severe mental stress because he is worried about his family in Afghanistan who are living under Taliban rule. Mohammed has suffered in offshore detention in PNG for over nine years now. He has a multitude of untreated health conditions which makes it difficult for him to eat. He also suffers from depression. His doctors suggest he exercises, but Mohammed does not want to leave his house for fear of his safety. To quote Mohammed, my hopes are to be with family, find work, stand on my own feet, feel independent and feel like a human, to have a peaceful life. Just do not forget us and hopefully you can help us get out of this situation. We are stuck and cannot do anything to change our life for the better. Kora was hospitalised in Nauru earlier this year after he experienced severe pain. He has been approved for transfer, transfer but has still be, not been evacuated or received the medical treatment needed. He says, My brother is in Australia. I need to go to Australia for treatment. It is easier for me in Australia. I have been to Australia three times, had an operation in Brisbane in 2014 for kidney stone removal. Good hospital. I stayed for two weeks with a lot of facilities proper doctors and professionals. There is a lot of humanity. Human beings' health is important in Australia. It is nothing here. 
Australia is spending a lot of money and could have spent it in a better way. Hiren has been held in Nauru for over nine years now. He was transferred to Australia in February 2023 for urgent medical treatment for chronic pain conditions. Hiren has been held in closed hotel detention. He has not been told when he will be released from detention. He says, people are getting crazy. Health issues are worsening. People are scared for their safety. Locals swear at refugees. Get people out of this situation, please. They are under a lot of stress and face a great uncertainty. Pay attention to the corruption and torture that is continuing to go on in offshore detention. Former Australian of the Year, uh, Australian of the Year in 2010, uh, psychiatrist Professor Patrick McGorry has described offshore detention centres as factories for producing mental illness. It's no surprise we hear stories of people who've been locked up for a decade and they have health conditions, mental health conditions, and that's on us. That's, that is on us. That is a direct result of politicians' policies. We have, to, we have to own that and we have an opportunity to change that. Medicine Sans Frontier found that amongst the 208 refugee and asylum seekers they had assessed on Nauru, 129, or 62%, were diagnosed with moderate to severe depression. The second highest diagnosis was anxiety disorder, one in four, followed by PTSD, 18%. Mild depression, 11%, complex trauma, 6%, and resignation syndrome, 6%, also known as traumatic withdrawal syndrome. We can't ignore this. We know, we know what is happening. There are a small number of people who we keep offshore for political reasons. Please think about these people. And then clearly there's, there's the economic cost. Offshore centres cost around $9.6 billion in the three years between 2013 and 2016. That's an extraordinary amount of money. They continue to cost around a billion dollars a year to run, which comes to over $500,000 per asylum seeker per year. This, this doesn't make sense. There, there has to be a better way to do this. Offshore detention is cruel. It causes the destruction of the physical and mental health of those who seek our care and our community. The time has come for Australia to adopt a more compassionate and humane approach to refugees and asylum seekers. We have to grapple with this issue. We have to grapple with the national security concerns, the concerns that uh, Senator Scar rightly raised about border force having to deal with horrendous uh, scenes. And we have to grapple with the fact that, that these are people who are desperate, people like you and I who are seeking our support and we're locking them up and spending a huge amount of our money to do so. We can and must find a way to ensure that people do not die at sea and people also do not languish in indefinite detention. I believe we need to start to play a more active role in our region. People are only leaving because their situation is intolerable or their, or their life is at risk. We need to stand up um, alongside calls that call out human right, rights abuses in other countries. And we really need to start thinking about how we're going to deal with climate refugees. Because if we look back at the last couple of decades, if we think we've had a refugee problem over any of those years, we haven't seen anything. And the thing to think about, and I'd encourage the major parties to start thinking about this, is that when we start seeing the 
spiralling, compounding effects of climate change, our Pacific neighbours are probably not going to be in a position to just do our dirty work. People in those countries are going to potentially be looking to Australia, saying, we can't cope here, we need, we need support. This is, this is a really tough problem, but ignoring it or locking up 150 people and hoping that that solves the problem doesn't. So I, I urge the Senate. Uh, I understand that this is not something the major parties will, will entertain, but I urge you in your, in your party rooms and in your thinking, start listening to the Australian community. Once we see these sorts of uh, stories, we, we start to understand um, the people and how, how desperate they are seeking our support. People want a more pragmatic, humane approach. So I thank Senator McKim for bringing this, uh, this bill to the Senate, and it does have my support. A number of Canberrans contact me on a regular basis about this. Not only this, people languishing in our community on bridging visas, people who have had business, small businesses for 10 years, contributing, paying, uh, paying tax, but don't have access to, to services, to tertiary education, all of the things that, that many of us take for granted. So thank you, Senator McKim, and, and I support this bill. Senator Waters. Thank you. I move that the question be now put. Those of that, the question is that the question be now put. Those of that opinion say aye. 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 Did you say aye? Uh, I, uh, those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The question now is that the Migration Amendment Evacuation to Safety Bill uh, 2023 um, be agreed to in the second reading. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against no. no. I think the noes have it. Division required, ring the bells.
Lock the doors. The question is that the Migration Amendment Evacuation to Safety Bill 2023 be second reading be agreed to. The ayes will move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator McKim, teller for the ayes, and Senator Scar, tellers for the no. And before the tellers tell, I appoint my question and my vote with the noes. Results of the division, ayes 12, noes 24. Therefore, the question is resolved in the negative. The Senate will now proceed to the consideration of document, gov, sorry, government business, and I call the clerk. Government Business Order of the Day number 1, Consideration of Closing the Gap Ministerial Statements and Documents. With the concurrence of the Senate, the clerks will set the clocks in line with informal arrangements reached by senators. Minister. Uh, I move that the Senate take note of the documents. Can I start by first acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet and paying my respects to Elders past, present and emerging, and I want to particularly acknowledge First Nations senators. Uh, I will speak briefly because I uh, believe it's important that Senator Dodson and Senator Stewart give the balance of the government's contribution today. Fifteen years ago, on his first parliamentary sitting day as Prime Minister, Kevin Rudd offered a formal apology on behalf of the nation to, the Australia's, to Australia's Indigenous peoples, in particular the Stolen Generations. In acknowledging the past, Prime Minister Rudd said we were laying claim to a future that embraces all Australians. And part of that future was a commitment to close the gap for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in health, education, employment, life expectancy within a generation. Well, today we still have a long way to go. The last Closing the Gap annual report, tabled a few months ago, shows that gaps not only persist but in many areas they are already widening. They are widening. This includes the number of children being school ready, rates of incarceration and deaths by suicide. For too long, policies designed in Canberra imposed on First Nations communities without meaningful consultation have failed to deliver the outcomes which we hoped for. We have tried to close the gap, but we have done so without listening sufficiently to the voices of First Nations people. This government takes responsibility for doing better. The Albanese government's first Closing the Gap implementation plan details the next steps that the Commonwealth will take towards achieving the targets and priority reforms of the National Agreement on Closing the Gap. It shows all Australians what tangible and practical actions are being taken in partnership with the Coalition of Peaks to achieve progress. New measures in the 2023 implementation plan include support for water infrastructure to provide safe and reliable water for remote and regional Indigenous communities. 
a partnership with the Northern Territory Government to accelerate the building of new remote housing, funding for the National Strategy for Food Security in Remote First Nations Communities, support for family violence prevention and legal service providers, more on-country education for remote First Nations students, including greater access to junior rangers and culturally appropriate distance learning, and additional support for boarding for rural and remote students. While the implementation plan sets out our immediate path for action, long-term and lasting progress requires structural change. And this year, Australians have the opportunity to be part of that change. A referendum for a voice to Parliament is about two things. It is about recognition and it is about consultation. The Voice will give independent advice to the Parliament and Government, making recommendations on matters relating to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Community-led, empowering, inclusive, respectful and culturally informed, and working alongside existing organisations and traditional structures. Before I conclude and leave, as I said, the majority of the contribution to the First Nations colleagues that I have the privilege of serving with. I want to make some observations as Foreign Minister. As well as having so much to gain within Australia from closing the gap and achieving reconciliation, we have much to gain in the world by elevating the experiences and voices and wisdom of First Nations people. This is a national asset. It is a source of our strength. It opens new ways to engage on shared interests with partners in our region. In the countries of the Pacific to which I have travelled, I have been welcomed by traditional owners and the centrality of traditional custodianship, of custom, of leadership in the Pacific way is something we should respect in our regional engagement. It is something we should be sharing with the Pacific family by elevating perspectives and voices of First Nations people across communities around across the Blue Pacific. Yesterday, I had the privilege of announcing Mr Justin Mohammed as Australia's inaugural ambassador, ambassador for First Nations people. He is a Gurung Gurung man from Bundaberg with extensive experience across many roles, and he will lead the Office of First Nations Engagement in the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Together, they work in genuine partnership. They will work in genuine partnership with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to progress Indigenous rights globally and help grow First Nations trade and investment. This new, nation, this new position ensures for the first time that Australia will have dedicated Indigenous representation in our international engagement. Thank you, Senator Wong. Uh, I'd seek leave to just continue for about 30 is seconds. Is leave granted? More. Thank you. Leave is granted. I thank the Senate. Elevating First Nations voices in our international engagement makes us stronger in the world. I was very proud to attend the United Nations General Assembly with Senator Pat Dodson. And I'm very proud that today, on International Women's Day in New York, the Australian dele delegation for the Convention on the Status of Women is led by Senator Malandiri McCarthy. That is a great thing. So this today is about closing the gap, but it is about more than that. It has greater ambition than that. It's about our nation. It's about achieving our full potential as a nation. And that can only happen when every Australian has the chance to realise their own potential. Senator Birmingham. Thank you, uh, Madam Acting President. Closing the gap is, uh, is a powerful concept. It's a powerful concept uh, because it bridges from the symbolic to the practical. The concept of closing the gap is to establish and pursue measurable, verifiable targets to achieve genuine equality in outcomes, in outcomes that are real to people's lives, in outcomes that are real to the opportunities that they and their families and their children have. And that's why it's important that we each year assess progress, speak honestly, address directly the challenges that come with closing the gap. It is a stain on Australia that the gap exists and the gap is as wide as it is. It is a stain that successive governments of different persuasions have invested significant sums of funds, of energy, of policies in attempting to address. And in some areas, 
some success has been achieved. But too much of it has not been closed. The gap is too wide and, we must acknowledge, in some areas still widening. The Closing the Gap report that was handed down late last year, as I acknowledged at the time, uh, was uh, the first such report following the new national agreement and implementation plan that had been released just 12 months earlier under the previous government. It had involved a long and genuine process of engagement and consultation to establish new targets in genuine partnership with First Nation peoples. It had worked closely with the Coalition of the Peaks. I want to again acknowledge for their work in the establishment of the targets and the process uh, against which closing the gap policies and measures are now pursued. It's pleasing to see that against those measures there are new priorities and, importantly, new, more granular targets in place, which reflect very genuinely the input of First Australians to establish them and to identify their priorities. But most importantly, it is about giving that direct focus on the attributes that we seek to achieve change through in terms of genuine closing of the gap and the changes that are necessary to do so. In too, too many areas, we are not making progress or even going backwards. School readiness, adult incarceration rates, suicide rates are all highlighted statistics that paint a bleak and continually concerning picture. Sometimes, indeed, they present as contrasts in the Closing the Gap report if we genuinely get into the data. We have seen significant growth and achievement in terms of the percentage of children enrolled in preschool. Target three, which is identified as being on track, improving. Similarly, in terms of target two, identified by the Productivity Commission in babies born with a healthy birth weight in 2019. Improving, on track, according to the Productivity Commission assessments against targets. And yet, we see in target four, the rate of children commencing school who were developmentally on track going backwards, worsening. So much work is required to drill down below those types of statistics and understand if we are achieving more babies born with healthy birth weight, if we are enrolling more children in preschool, what are the causes that are seeing fewer children commencing developmentally on track when they begin their school education? The same type of questions can be posed across a range of areas in relation to incarceration, employment, health and other types of outcomes that are assessed in detail through Closing the Gap. That's why this is a valuable process, because it has set transparent targets for government, because they are transparently assessed independently by the Productivity Commission, because it is done with direct engagement with community as it should be, but ultimately because we can use this information and analysis to see what is working, but to see where things are failing and to pursue the types of policy changes through consultation and engagement with all those affected that can help us to genuinely close the gap. We owe people no less to remove such stain on Australia. Senator Cox. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. And I want to begin by reinstating the Greens' support for closing the gap and equity into First Nations health, but also for First Nations people more broadly. And as a proud Yamaji Noongar woman, I'm proud to be the portfolio holder for the Australian Greens on First Nations issues. First Nations people are overrepresented in our health system, but also across all systems. We get sicker, we die earlier, we are poorer, we are arrested and locked up more, and we have our children taken away from us more and we are less likely to finish school. And on top of all of that, we are more likely to experience poverty and have less money. But make no mistake, this not, was not always the case. For thousands of years, First Nations people managed their land and we managed ourselves. We looked after ourselves, we followed our cultural protocols and practices, and we are and were deeply connected to our country, our culture and our community. 
And this has changed since colonisation across various parts of different parts of our wonderful country. First Nations people have been subjected to countless policies from successive governments since Federation, both with good intentions but also with bad. Unfortunately, when the intentions have been good, such as with the Closing the Gap initiative, the results have been average. But when the intentions have been bad, the results have in fact been catastrophic for First Nations people. It is these policies that have resulted in circumstances we are facing today that are uh, the Closing the Gap initiative are aiming to address. The impacts of government after government telling First Nations communities what they need instead of listening to them and working with them and allowing First Nations communities to do what they have done for, in fact, generations. Unfortunately, what the last Closing the Gap report showed was that many of these gaps are not only continuing to exist, but they are also growing. In key areas such as health, education, incarceration, life expectancy, suicide rates, children in out-of-home care, we are, in fact, going backwards. And this is shameful. In fact, four out of the 18 socioeconomic targets are on track. Only four, which is absolutely disgraceful. The other 14 are either not on track or there is no new data, so we don't even know if they are, in fact, on track or not. This in itself is a huge problem that needs to be addressed. We are pleased to see the investments into closing the gap in the 2022 but October budget, specifically in the areas of health, housing and justice. However, since its inception, governments have invested millions into closing the gap and, as I said earlier, if only four of the 18 targets are on track, we absolutely need to see progress. Now the current government has released its implementation plan, which sets out a plan for making progress towards these 18 targets. This plan includes more funding. The Greens welcome this and, of course, we want to see these gaps closed, but the reality is that nothing is happening. We are not seeing the results we need to. What is integral into the success of closing the gap is not the amount of money that any government chooses to invest in it, although, don't get me wrong, that does go a long way. It is the involvement of First Nations people. First Nations people need to be deeply embedded as we tackle these issues. From housing to health to education to incarceration, it's not enough that First Nations people provide just some input and then go away and they make all the decisions at government tables. We cannot do the same things we've done before and expect different outcomes. And as the Minister for Indigenous Affairs said, uh, more of the same is not good enough. We need to do things differently by working in partnerships with communities to get better results. We need to make sure that cultural protocols are followed, that cultural differences and nations are considered, that information is communicated in language. And the only way we can do this is by having First Nations people in the driver's seat and at every step of the way involved in driving this process. This is key not only in achieving the targets but also respecting our sovereignty and our self-determination. I'm disheartened that this could not have been a more po positive speech. However, I look forward to working with the government on making actual progress on these 18 targets because First Nations people deserve better than this. And further to that, the government needs to implement the recommendations of the Bring Them Home report and the Deaths in Custody report. And these reports have in fact just been collecting dust for decades. Thank you. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. Labor loves that it was one of the very, their very own who delivered the Stolen Generations apology. Kevin Rudd did the hard sell on the apology, telling the Australians it was necessary for us to move forward together as a nation. However, Anthony Albanese has decided to turn us backward as two separate nations divided by race. That's the real end game. That's ultimately where the racist voice to parliament will take us. Labor is committed to implementing the Uluru Statement in full, so the voice is only the first step. The next step is truth-telling, but Labor can't bring itself to tell the truth about its plans for the voice. Labor can't admit the truth that the elitist, out-of-touch Aboriginal industry, which concocted the Uluru Statement, has for decades now been responsible for the failure to close the gaps. Labor won't admit the truth that our uncounted billions 
of dollars the Aboriginal industry has stolen from taxpayers has failed to help Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people living in the violence, plague, economic and social dead ends we call remote communities. The truth is this industry is made up of thousands of corrupt and dysfunctional Aboriginal corporations and land councils. The truth is these organisations are only interested in lining their own pockets and using their power to punch down on the truly disadvantaged Aborigines they despise and the few good people who are really trying to help them. The truth is that like 80 per cent of Aborigines, this industry's leaders don't live in remote Aboriginal communities and they're not remotely disadvantaged. They've done very well for themselves, better than most of us. The truth is these leaders are the very same failures and frauds now eagerly looking forward to well-paid, constitutionally protected jobs with the racist voice to parliament. The truth is this mob doesn't even have the discipline to follow the Prime Minister's script to downplay the powers and scope of the voice. They started that way but their naked greed for race-based constitutional power has been on full display recently. What an embarrassment for the Prime Minister. Megan Davis last week made it very clear that, of course, the voice will have tremendous power. This was always the true intention. She's effectively admitted that what constitutional experts have been saying for some time now, that the courts will play a significant role in determining the powers of the voice. That's right, this woman appointed by the Prime Minister to advise him on the voice, anticipates challenges in the High Court over the voice's powers. She has directly, directly contradicted the Prime Minister, who has been telling us only Parliament will do it. The truth is Parliament will be repeatedly held hostage in a series of constitutional crises while the unelected High Court extends the voice's powers. The Prime Minister and his mob of voice cheerleaders also keep repeating the lie, the voice is necessary to close the gaps. The truth is that a voice filled with the same frauds who have failed Aborigines remote communities for decades will close nothing. The truth is these frauds have a vested interest in keeping those gaps as wide as the Grand Canyon, otherwise they won't have the excuses they need to keep demanding more and more power and money. And the truth is Anthony Albanese will just roll over and let it all happen. Another truth is that every parliament to come will be paralysed for months while activists demand to expand the powers of the voice and take each parliament to the High Court if those demands aren't met. So much for moving forward together. The truth is the voice is a racist black nationalist vehicle for chaos, lies and an Australia constantly in conflict. Australians must reject this racist voice that will take us backwards more than 50 years. We must prioritise helping those Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in real disadvantage in neglected remote communities. The only way to really close the gaps is to close those communities down and help the poor people who live in them to go where they can take advantage of the economic and educational opportunities the rest of us have. You want some real truth telling? Then let us have an audit and all the money stolen by the Aboriginal industry, where it's all gone and why it's failed to close the gaps. Let's have some truth telling about the sexually abused children in these communities that you don't do anything about. Let's give them a future. Senator Dodson. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. Uh, Madam President, uh, I rise to note the 15th anniversary of the National Apology to the Stolen Generations and the Commonwealth's Closing the Gap Implementation Plan 2023. The apology from the uh, Prime Minister, Mr Rudd at the time, was a momentous occasion for the nation, a huge step forward for reconciliation in Australia. We should never forget our history, the good, the bad and the ugly. But we also need tangible action to address the poorer outcomes for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. That is why the tabling of our government's first Closing the Gap uh, implementation plan under the National Agreement is important. 
It is a strong demonstration of our commitment to improving the lives of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. I was actually grateful to attend several events in honour of the anniversary of the apology and speak with survivors of the stolen generations from right around the country. It is both humbling and motivating to hear their stories and their optimism and their hope. In statements today, we must not shy away, though, from the landscape that is before us. While there has been some progress, the efforts of previous governments have been ineffective. The data speaks plainly of a stagnation in addressing the needs of Indigenous communities. Progress across most socio-economic outcomes areas has stalled. Some have even gone backwards. In the midst of all of this, we must not lose sight of the very real human cost of inaction. Aboriginal lives must not be treated like some beads on a departmental abacusus. Closing the gap demands a spirit of transformation, of genuine partnership, of focused attention on outcomes. The government, in, partner in partnership with the Coalition of Peaks, is committed to securing real and transformational change for First Nations peoples. The new 2023 implementation plan is about exactly that. It gives purpose and direction to our efforts to transform government in line with the national, agreement, uh, uh, the national agreement's four priority reforms. We are investing $424 million in addition, in additional funding to closing the gap across water infrastructure food security, family violence and health. This is the top up of the $1.2 billion in practical initiatives already being implemented following the October budget. These announcements are significant. Real funding and real investment in Aboriginal communities on the issues that matter most. But the implementation plan is also about accountability and transparency by bringing together the actions that each department is taking over the next 12 months. But perhaps the most significant, the implementation plan exists in a context that is in need of broad structural reform. What has been missing is the voice. It's the missing piece, a key element of the government's commitment to improve outcomes and closing the gaps is our pursuit of a referendum to establish a voice to the parliament. It is grounded in evidence. Outcomes for our people are simply better when we have a say, have choice and make decisions about our lives. The voice will do exactly that. Consistent with the national agreement, the voice will be transformational and will better enable First Peoples to be engaged in decision making and priorities. This prospect should attract bipartisan support, especially given these priority reforms were agreed by the previous government. The 2023 implementation plan and up-and-coming ref referendum promises a truly transformational moment for First Nations and real lasting change. Recognition in the Constitution and ability to make representation to the government and to the parliament on matters that affect First Nations peoples and a, and a uh, matter for which a voice is needed to improve the outcomes in this closing the gap space. Senator Nampanyi Price. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, I would like to take this moment to recognise that it is 15 years since the apology to the stolen generation, but I'd also like to acknowledge the current neglected generation who are being left to languish in dysfunctional circumstances because of their race, which is uh, an absolute crime, I believe. The rights of children, Indigenous children in this country who are being left in dysfunctional circumstances because of their race. I'd also like to acknowledge the Indigenous voices in Parliament. My colleague who just spoke before me, of course, has had um, a long career as an Indigenous voice in Parliament. Uh, and to Parliament prior to that. Fifteen years ago, in his apology, Prime Minister Kevin Rudd called for a future where we harness the determination of all Australians, 
Indigenous and non-Indigenous, to close the gap that lies between us in life expectancy, educational achievement and economic opportunity. He called for a future where all Australians, whatever their origins, are truly equal partners with equal opportunities and with an equal stake in shaping the next chapter in the history of this great country, Australia. Just 15 years later, the new Labor government seeks to divide us. The new Labor government doesn't want us to be equal. They don't want us to be equal partners. They don't want us to have equal opportunities. They don't want us united with an equal stake in shaping our future. They want us constitutionally divided by race. They want to give one group, based on nothing but their differences, special privileges to stall, to halt, to hinder the work of governments if they don't like what they're trying to do. This is not how you close the gap. This is how you increase it. This is how you open up a new one. This is how you open up the gap between the Aboriginal industry, the professional activist class and the vulnerable Australians living in remote and rural communities across Australia, out of sight, out of mind, to Canberra. This is how we open the gap between the middle class and elite Aboriginal people in the cities, in the marginalised Aboriginal Australians in remote communities. Two years ago, during my tenure as the Director of Indigenous Research for the Centre for Independent Studies, our research uncovered where the gap truly exists. The gap does not exist between Indigenous Australia and everybody else. It exists between those in remote communities whose first language is not English, who still live by their traditional culture, who are out of sight, out of mind to places like Canberra and everybody else, including urban Aboriginal Australia, who in the major cities and towns have access to services, who have better educational outcomes and health outcomes. That is where the gap truly exists. That is where the focus should be, not suggesting that all Aboriginal people are disadvantaged because of our race. That I would consider a racist concept. In my report, I highlighted that the approach that has governed Indigenous affairs for a number of years, <coughs> focusing on symbolic gestures and separatist thinking behind the voice to parliament, is not working. Now what has changed? The separatist thinking behind the voice has gotten stronger. The calls to give the divisive politician's voice more teeth has gotten louder. The push for division has gotten stronger. If the Aboriginal industry comprising of service providers, bureaucrats, academics and politicians are truly serious about closing the gap, then they must be prepared to no longer exist and must be prepared to wean themselves off the millions of taxpayer dollars they rely upon to exist, because only then will the gap truly have been closed. The voice does not seek to do this. The voice seeks to constitutionally enshrine the gap because a voice suggests we will always be disadvantaged as a matter of our racial heritage. Such a shame. If this government is serious about closing the gap, it will not widen it by continuing this push for a divisive, dangerous and costly politician's voice. They will move away from the ideological race-based thinking and they will look for real solutions to real problems and treat all Australians equal, regardless of racial heritage. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I also rise to speak to the failing closing the gap statement on the anniversary of the apology to the stolen generations. By now we are getting used to what this report contains year after year, the so-called gap between First Nations people and non-First Nations people in this country. It's not closing, but actually widening in a number of areas. One of these areas is the removal of our children, the stealing of our children. Another one is suicide. These are not separate from each other. You cannot take a child from its mother without causing trauma. You cannot remove a child from a family, from a community, from its culture, from country, 
without causing lasting, deep and intergenerational trauma. My people are dealing with this trauma every day. Every day. This is what I have not stopped calling on the government to fully implement the recommendations of the Bringing Them Home report. My own mother was a commissioner on that report, and I will keep the pressure on day by day until we finally see action. You don't need to go out looking for new solutions. The solutions have been there for 26 years. Just on the weekend, Sunday, I was asked to support a young single mother with a disability who had just given birth and had her baby taken away shortly after, a baby that belongs with its mother. These first hours, days and weeks are essential to forming bonds between mother and baby, to establish breastfeeding and so much more. You can't get that back. The so-called child protection in this country is many times more likely to remove black children than a white child and all the circumstances being the same. It is being done with such good intentions. Well, those good intentions are destroying our families and communities. They are a continuation of the stolen generation and it is also an act of genocide, genocide in this country. According to the UN Genocide, as a crime committed with the intent to destroy a national, ethnic, racial or religious group in whole or in part, taking our children is an intent to destroy us as the first peoples of this country. It is an act of genocide. What our families need when struggling from systemic oppression is support. This support should be wherever possible provided by First Nations community-controlled organisations in culturally safe ways. I cannot tell you enough about how amazing the Grandmothers Against Removals are. No one supports them. You don't hear their voice. Even government departments deny a meeting with the elders, the grandmothers, who are fighting for our children out of this system. They have safely and caringly supported and kept babies and mothers together with no support, no funding. Real support cannot be provided by just another one of your colonial institutions where blackfellas don't feel safe and where at every moment they feel like they're doing something wrong, not fulfilling another one of your colonial criterias and risking being reported and having their child taken. If Labor is serious, about its former Prime Minister's apology, where you have a morning tea and celebrate 22,000 Aboriginal children in out-of-home care, then he should look deeply into the practices of the system that has been created to destroy First Nations people in this country. You're attacking our children and the mothers and fathers of these children. When are you going to implement the recommendations from the Bringing Them Home report, which provides you with all of the solutions, self-determining solutions, from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voices that you so care about? What do you say about 22,000 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander kids in out-of-home care? Do you say sorry again? Senator Stewart. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, speaker, last month we marked 15 years since, since then Prime Minister Kevin Rudd delivered an apology for the cruel and unjust policies and practices that tore apart Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander families across the nation impacts of which are still evident today. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people sat with their family and friends in the gallery, together on the lawns of parliament, and watched on their screens in workplaces and schools right across the country. I chose to watch the apology with my community at the Aborigines and Advancement League, a proud and long-standing Aboriginal rights organisation in Melbourne's north. The hall was so full it was standing room only. It was a truly significant moment for our country, one seeped in optimism and hope 
for a better future for all Australians. For a country in which we can all live happy, healthy lives with equal access to employment and education opportunities. Tragically, but not unexpectedly, there have been significant and damaging consequences to the neglect of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people over the last decade from the former government. The 2023 Closing the Gap report sets out the truth of the matter. The gaps are widening. As I've spoken about in this chamber, I remember sitting in a classroom when I was 15 or 16 years old and the teacher talking about the Closing the Gap statistics. As one of the only Koori kids in the classroom, it felt like the teacher was painting a picture of my future as a First Nations person. Dire statistics on health and life expectancy for First Nations people, for my people. It's hard to articulate what it is like to read about and listen to someone tell you that you're going to die 10 years younger than your peers, that you were less likely to finish high school and go to university, that I was more likely to be unemployed and have a chronic health condition than my peers. But this was the reality 20 years ago and not much has changed since. And it's an absolute shame that we must continue to speak the truth now. While the opposition leader seems to think that public policy doesn't have any unique impact on the lives of Aboriginal people in this country, I certainly beg to differ. If you need more proof about why the voice of parliament is needed, this is it. Ten years later and the statistics are getting worse. The proportion of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children assessed as developmentally on track in all five domains of Australian Early Development Census to 55 per cent has dropped to 35.2 per cent. The target for healthy birth weights for babies has gone from being on track to not on track. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people deserve better. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians need a seat at the table to work in partnership with government to come up with the solutions for our families. This is one of the only things that has proven that the evidence is there to suggest that positive outcomes are possible and can only happen when we have a seat at the table. I am proud to be part of a government that is committed to closing the gap, and not just in an ad hoc way or when there's an opportunity to cause division, to win some political points like the Peter Dutton opposition. I'm proud to be part of a government that is committed to doing things differently. And we're just getting started on this work. In our first budget back in October 2022, the Albanese Labor government committed over $900 million to closing the gap. Earlier this week, the Minister for Social Services announced more than $50 million of funding to help address the overrepresentation of First Nations children in out-of-home care by 5 per cent by 2031, something I'm deeply passionate about as somebody who's worked in the sector. This includes a delivery of innovative community-led ideas from First Nations communities to design service models that better support families and support organisations and workers that, and supporting organisations and workers to better able to deliver prevention and early intervention services that are culturally safe, trauma and healing informed. We're determined to close the gap. We will continue to deliver on closing the gap implementation plan in partnership with the coalition of peaks and state and territory governments. We will continue to target investment where it will make a real and tangible difference to the lives of Aboriginal people. I want to acknowledge the Aboriginal organisations around the country, and particularly those from my home state of Victoria, who shoulder the burden of this work. And I want to thank each of you for your tireless advocacy for our mob. Thank you. To, re to really and meaningfully move forward as a country, we must accept the generous invitation set out in the Uluru Statement from the Heart to walk together for a better future for all Australians. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Little. Thank you. I acknowledge on International Women's Day the contribution of all women and in the context of this contribution, the enduring valuable contribution of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women and uh, my fellow Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander senators. We of course all agree that it is right and just to focus on closing the gap in life expectancy in our cities, in regional and remote communities, the statistics demonstrate the real divide and consequences of not being effective in closing the gap, but we know that the data is an issue and so it is likely much worse. However, closing the gap must not be the work of a single entity or group. Closing the gap will only work when all of us are involved and understand how we benefit from that outcome. 
Non-Indigenous Australians must remain critical to be part of the solution. It is well and good to have a well-funded strategy, but if on the ground it is not happening because the very people charged to help them fail to act, then the gap won't close. It won't matter what we do. I speak again, and I feel like I'm going around and around in circles, about the family that I came across in Alice Springs about two weeks ago. It's a lived example where I heard of so many gestures of concerns about those people living on the slab, and they've been there for two years. These 20 women, children and elderly, and those with serious medical conditions, today remain on that slab, with exposure to the elements and greater risk to their life experience and expectancy, not just from the last two years, but they remain on the slab today. Their life and life experience may have been diminished as, this, as a consequence of this, but not their hope. It is known that the social determinants of health are the non-medical factors that influence self health outcomes. Without a roof and action, nothing will change for these people, and every day their life experience will remain on the wrong trajectory. These people haven't fallen through the crack. They have fallen through a cavern of apathy. They have, people have driven past their plight. They have dropped off medical supplies, picked up people, dropped them back there, and nobody has seen it as their responsibility to take the greater step of advocacy and get a roof over their heads so that they can control their own destiny, improve their own outcomes. These people have been invisible in plain sight. It's 40 degrees in summer, minus temperatures in winter, no shelter, no running water, an open fire to cook on, nothing to address their basic needs. It's unfathomable. Just imagine living like that for two years, let alone overnight. This is certainly not the way for any person in Australia to live, nor in the middle of a town whose economy tragically and increasingly is fast becoming more solely reliant on welfare. The economy in Alice Springs has been devastated by welfare. The tragedy and irony of this story is those service providers, funded by the Northern Territory and Australian governments, they're engaging with this family, they know their circumstances, but they failed to provide an integrated, effective response and a timely response to ameliorate this situation. It highlights the deficit in poor local service delivery planning and coordination, currently obvious amongst many funded agencies, and not just in Alice Springs or Central Australia, it's even in South Australia. If these issues and limitations are not addressed as a matter of urgency, then the potential to maximise effect from any financial investment or effort is significantly constrained. Whatever the excuses or reasons, what resulted here was a family and their children enduring two years of the consequence of bad service provision, with the likely deteriorating health in their wellbeing. And we know the link between environment and wellbeing. The Prime Minister, in reference to health, said he would leave no one behind, and I look forward very much to seeing that promise delivered uh, by engaging with the Northern Territory Government to get the right outcome for this family. The lack of effort to ensure high-level accountability will continue to fail to deliver the right outcome and continue to leave families falling between the gaps in service coordination and far from the reach of anyone's ability to close the gap in life expectancy. Governance within these organisations is critical. Good, governments, good governance demanding good governance if you really want to close the gap. We saw um, the inability to get a faster response when the Stronger Future legislation was uh, ending in the Northern Territory. Expired. Thank you. Uh, Senator Muriel Smith. Um, thank you, Acting Deputy Speaker. Um, I want to acknowledge the speakers who came before me and associate myself with the remarks of Senator Dodson and Senator Stewart. It's an absolute privilege to serve with you both in this place. And I want to acknowledge the remarks of all the speakers who came before me and in doing so note that I'm standing here um, not as an Aboriginal person, 
but as someone who wanted to make a contribution to this debate as a representative of the state of South Australia, a debate which I think it is important that we all seek to be part of, not just in this chamber, but in our communities as well. 2023 marks 15 years since the first closing of the GAP report was delivered to our parliament. And the past 15 years have been marked with plenty of good intention, but on far too many indicators, these good intentions haven't been enough. The latest data update for this year shows us that the gap remains unacceptably wide. It's not closing fast enough. And indeed, in too many places, we're going backwards. Of the new data we received this month, nine targets are not on track and just two are on track. Combined with the existing data, there are 11 targets that are now not on track and four on track. It was Mandela who said there can be no keener revelation of a society's soul than the way in which it treats its children. So we should all be sitting pretty uncomfortably in this truth when we look at the data as it affects Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children. The target for healthy birth weights for babies has gone from being on track to not on track. That means we have gone backwards. And we've seen that the target to increase the proportion of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander youth who are in employment, education and training is also not on track. The AEDI data remains unacceptable as is the proportion of people attaining year 12 or equivalent qualification. It's not okay. All children in this country deserve to grow up safe, healthy, happy, nourished and valued. Those are their fundamental rights as little people among us. But Deputy President, this isn't happening. Their rights aren't being met. And I know there is no shortage of goodwill to close the gap. But what we have been doing in Australia just has not been working as fast or effectively as it should have been, and it is our children who are paying the price. I note today that the new Closing the Gap implementation plan, which was launched last month, sets a clear path forward for achieving the targets and priority reforms. The Albanese government is also making significant changes in the delivery of First Nations policy and providing additional support for communities to get ahead. And I acknowledge in particular the support provided for communities in my electorate, including um, the, the significant commitment to Aboriginal health infrastructure right across my state, but including in places like Sejuna and Murray Bridge. Our policy work also includes over $400 million in funding, additional funding to provide safe and reliable water for remote and re regional Indigenous communities, to accelerate building of new remote housing in the Northern Territory and to bolster the national strategy for food security. But as Senator Dodson said in his remarks before me, we also need structural change. And this year we have a chance to forge a different path. In the referendum that will be held towards the end of this year, I hope Australians join me, join us in voting yes. Because a voice enshrined in the Constitution will mean more consultation and new partnerships. It will mean Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people get a more genuine say in the matters that affect them and a real hand in shaping the solutions. And that's important because we know that when they do, policy works better. Of course, the voice is just one part of what is needed. That generous offer given to us was about more than voice. It's about treaty and it's about truth too. I want to reaffirm as a senator for my state, my commitment to all three, that our government is committed to all three. We must remain devoted to this challenge and continue and double down on our efforts always to make our country a fairer place for children, but especially Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children, where there is no doubt in the statistics before us, in everything we know, that we are currently failing them. Senator Davey. Uh, thank you. And I too acknowledge the comments that have um, already been put to the chamber. And as Senator Smith said, it, it is over 15 years since the Commonwealth and a coalition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community controlled peak organisations, state and territory governments and the Australian Local Government Association came together and agreed that more needed to be done and entered into the Closing the Gap uh, partnership. Much has been done over the years and very good intentions to work together to close the gap. But unfortunately, the latest report shows that while in some respects we are making progress, in others we are not, and in others still we have actually gone backwards. For example, 
while we now have 89.5 per cent of babies, Indigenous babies born with a healthy birth weight and 96.7 per cent of children enrolled in preschool, only 34.4 per cent of those children in school are developmentally on track or school ready. And these are not good statistics. And the statistics show there are still too many children in out-of-home care, too many suicides, too many adults in prison, too many uh, poor results in, in the health statistics, and um, too many unemployed or under, underemployed. But while everyone is focusing on what we're not doing and the areas we're missing, what I'd really like to do is focus on what is actually happening on the ground in small communities or by individuals and groups that are making a difference in their communities because from that we can learn and we can actually try to progress to close the gap. For example, um, there are so many Indigenous people at the moment who don't have their birth certificates. There is an organisation um, based out of Glen Innes in northern New South Wales, Pathfinders National Aboriginal Birth Certificate Program. This organisation gets no government funding, yet they work with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to help them to access their birth certificates at no cost. Because without a birth certificate, you can't get social services, you can't enrol in school, you can't vote and have your voice heard. And so this program is so vitally important. And through the hard work that Pathfinders are doing uh, to help progress this, and I, I acknowledge Rosemary Curtis OAM for her work with Pathfinders, um, they've also noticed other gaps that they're trying to fill, such as uh, converting a former villa in Armidale into independent living accommodation for young people in care, such as uh, purchasing a disused hotel in Glen Innes uh, to convert to a rural foyer and a centre for education and employment options. These sorts of things will help close the gap in those communities, and they're doing it with no government funding. Another important program, the Black Rock Industries, Steve Fordham, who was actually invited to this year's uh, job summit. He's worked with and managed to get employment for over 111 Indigenous men that were incarcerated. Uh, and out of those 111, he's only had one be put back into prison. It is a success story, but unfortunately, his funding ceased at the 1st of July 2022. Um, and uh, under the new uh, Indigenous Skills and Employment Program, he's been told that his program is, is not eligible, but we will be looking to see if we can rectify that. Another program, a fantastic program in Dubbo, Ready, a Changing Lives. I spoke in this chamber about Tyron Cochrane and Jolie Archer, who Ready helped to get to New Zealand to compete in Golden Shears. Ready have also purchased the Wilcannia store and they've seen purchase of clean, Fruit and vegetables go from 50 kilograms a week to 500 kilograms a week in this largely indigenous uh, community. They are employing their own people. They are providing career pathways for people. They are working with people to get them housing. These are programs that will help Order. close the gap. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I serve all people of Australia. I want to celebrate. I want to celebrate especially the Aboriginal people of this country. You know, there's a higher proportion of Aboriginals among the NRL, the National Rugby League's elite athletes, a higher than, than across the community. There's a higher proportion in the AFL. Scientists, lawyers, parliamentarians, government, Aboriginals are part of this and doing a fine job. In business, people like Warren Mundine, in the carers, people like police, nurses, doctors. And then the previous speaker mentioned Steve Fordham from Black Rock Industries, doing a phenomenal job. And now he's been gutted 
by the bureaucracy. And I, I note Ash Dodd in, in Queensland, who is sponsoring the um, Collinsville Coal-Fired Power Station project. Senators like Nampajimpa Price and Karen Little for telling the truth. Telling the truth, it's so important. Senator Pauline Hanson, she's uneasy with praise, but she's probably watching in her office. When I first was elected, I approached the Albion office, suburb in Brisbane of our party, and I was met at the door in the car park by three Northern Territory Aboriginals who had come down specifically to meet with us because they said, Pauline Hanson is the only one who understands the Aboriginal plight and the only one willing to stand up and say so, what they need. I'll say it, that if the Howard government had adopted her policies, we would now have no gap or little gap. The people I've met in travelling through every Cape York community, Caucasian and Aboriginal, the people I've met in Northern Territory communities, are quietly getting on with it, quietly getting on with it and doing a stellar job. They're closing the gap. I, I'll talk to you about uh, an islander who was on a council in, um, in, the, in Torres Strait, and he told me that closing the gap perpetuates the gap because the consultants that feed off this program actually have to maintain the gap in order to keep their money. That's what perpetuates the gap. Now, there are many challenges our nation faces. Every problem I can see around our country is due to government. I'm ashamed of governments, state and federal, and churches who blindly assume they knew what was best for the Aboriginals. Good intentions may be, but arrogantly and ignorantly paternalistic and patronising, cruel, damaging, stultifying. I'm angry with the Aboriginal industry. Communities tell me of Noel Pearson interfering, land councils, effectively barons, controlling land, water, resources and funds. Billions of dollars every year going, supposedly going to the people on the ground being, inter being inter interceded by these robber barons. The Aboriginal industry perpetuating victimhood, worse, fomenting hate and separation, because that's what their industry is based on, so they can continue. The current government proposing the voice to instill and make racism systemic, separating and dividing. It follows and perpetuates a disgraceful legacy of paternalism and victimhood, which harms all members of our Australian community. Actions need to follow words. We need to unify, not separate. Solving problems requires listening to people to understand needs. Giving people freedom to get on with their lives builds responsibility and freedom. We need to give the Aboriginal people freedom, especially in the Aboriginal communities. Give them freedom. Addressing all Australians' problems begins with acknowledging government as the cause of the problems. And the solution is getting government out of people's lives. Honouring and respecting our Commonwealth of Australia's constitution. I want and look forward to uniting Australia into one nation. Worst of all, the voice will perpetuate the hollow, deceitful policies of Labor, Greens and, to a lesser extent, the LNP. It's a dishonest distraction that will perpetuate the gap, perpetuate the, the cruel infliction of punishment and deprivation. We need policies for lifting all Australians. That requires policies for restoring sovereignty, implementing sound and honest governance based on data and facts, honest policy, and first of all, listening to understand people's needs. Then, instead of doing things to look good, actually doing good. Senator Green. Um, in regards to the closing the gap statement and the close, closing the gap implementation plan um, that our government is implementing. But before I do, I just want to acknowledge um, the contributions to this debate um, uh, from Senators Dodson and Senator Stewart um, uh, and, un, and you know, associate myself with those comments but really um, extend um, my respect and my thanks to them for being so generous with their contributions um, and assisting senators on this side of the chamber to understand 
uniquely their perspective and understand, I think, um, how uh, deeply affected this closing the gap statement can um, be for communities um, and to understand that this is a time to acknowledge um, some very difficult um, outcomes and to really reckon with the fact we have not closed the gap and that we have some, a lot of work to do. Um, when it comes to housing, health, education, employment, the fact is that year after year, when this statement is made, um, we have to recognise that we are not closing the gap and that there is a lot of work to do um, and that no government um, has been able to uh, wrestle with um, these issues in a way that puts First Nations people at the heart of decision making. That is something that no government has been able to do. It's something that our government is seeking to do. At the last sitting of parliament, the Prime Minister and the Minister for Indigenous Australians of um, our government's um, first Closing the Gap implementation plan. Um, the plan provides details on the next steps the Commonwealth will take towards reaching the targets and priority reforms of the National Agreement of Closing the Gap. Uh, the implementation plan that many have spoken about today commits more than $400 million of additional targeted spending, including investment in $150 million over four years to support First Nations water infrastructure, ensuring that communities have safe and reliable water in remote and Indigenous communities. Um, there's funding for the National Strategy of Food Security, funding for family violence and prevention legal service providers, and extra support for those impacted by family violence. And there's also a boost to the on-country education program for remote First Nations students. This includes increased access to Indigenous ranges. Um, this is a plan with a whole of government approach, and that's incredibly important, I think, for getting this right. It brings together all of the actions that each department and agency is taking to achieve the closing the gap outcomes in one place. This plan is a significant step forward in the Albanese Labor government's first set of investments laid out in the 2022 budget, um, which committed over $1.2 billion over the next six years to these programs. Uh, it's interesting um, when we talk about closing the gap that there are so many different areas of public policy that need investment, that need commitment and that need delivery. Um, whether it's uh, health care, whether it's health infrastructure and treatment, whether it's improving access to early education for Indigenous families or immediate boosting for housing and essential services or community-led justice reinvestment initiatives, these are all programs that deserve um, support across the parliament, that des deserve the funding um, that our government is committing uh, and deserve the opportunity um, to make a difference in the lives of First Nations people. Um, finally, for the, the communities that I work with in North Queensland, I'm incredibly proud and privileged to, to work with them, particularly um, in the Cape York and the Torres Strait. Um, we're also delivering um, a new TAFE health hub on the Thursday Island in the Torres Strait to make sure that we have um, skilled healthcare workers um, in the Torres Strait to deliver those outcomes. But what we know and what I'm being told on the ground um, from First Nations people in their communities is that in terms of getting the delivery of these programs right, that for too long governments, even those with the best intentions, have made decisions on behalf of First Nations people without asking communities what they need or how best to deliver it. This is why the consultation must be at the centre of the approach of every Commonwealth government moving forward, and it's why a voice for First Nations people matters directly in what affects them. President, uh, these are complicated and sometimes sensitive matters, and I'd like to acknowledge all the contributions that have been made, uh, varying as they may be across the chamber. Um, when you look at Australia's success, and we have been a very successful country, uh, Australia has not been a good country in broad terms for Indigenous people. Uh, that is a fact. And in terms of the representation that I seek to offer the people of New South Wales in this chamber, uh, we have the largest Indigenous community in Australia in New South Wales. Uh, it's a community that I have 
try to engage with, and it is a community which is spread right across our community, uh, ranging from remote western New South Wales up and down the coast, and there is also a heavily urbanised population uh, in central and western Sydney. Um, I indicated in my first speech to this place that I would in engage on these issues because I regarded them as very important to our country's soul. Um, I don't think we have made the progress that was imagined would have been the case when the initial apology was issued some 15 years ago. Having said that, I think it was good that when the apology was issued that there was uh, some attempt to address these issues with an institutional framework. But as has been well documented, that initial framework was driven by bureaucrats with insufficient input from the community. And what has happened in the past few years under the Coalition and the Labor Party, there has been a much greater effort to put the community's requests at the vanguard of the Closing the Gap agenda. And only two years ago there was a significant rewriting of the Closing the Gap framework. And we can see from the latest report uh, issued by the Productivity Commission that there has been some progress uh, in relation to babies being born at a healthy birth rate, uh, children being enrolled in preschool. But of course there's also been some disappointing results in relation to imprisonment uh, and, as has been referred to many of the speakers in this address, there has been a very disappointing position when it comes to children being uh, removed from their homes. And that is a, a great shame and that is something that uh, we ought to work on with vigour. Uh, it's been very clear to me that over these past 250 years that paternalism has failed completely. And that is one of the reasons that uh, I have been of the view that the voice was a concept which was worthy of very detailed consideration. Uh, one of the reasons that has come into my mind recently as I've travelled around regional New South Wales is that the country needs new institutions. We need new institutions to help close the gap uh, because, particularly in remote and regional parts of Australia, um, the, the communities have not been given the opportunity to participate in decision making about service delivery on the ground, which is why I believe that as part of the detail that has been sought from the government about the voice plans, it is very important that we understand exactly how the local and regional voice structures will work, because I think they will be key to making improvements on the ground. When you speak to people in communities about what they are looking for from government, uh, it is very common to hear things like, well, we want to participate in the judgments that are made about our community. Uh, we want to have a say in service delivery. There might be uh, Aboriginal medical services, it might be a bus timetable. And these are the sort of things that, if done properly, I think could make a real difference over the long run. So many Indigenous people say to me in these communities, there was a program that was about to work and it was abolished by a government or it was doing good things and it disappeared. Uh, there, has, there has not been enough considered decision making. And the whole point of this exercise, of course, is to ensure that we move to a, a shared decision making model, uh, which is, which is community-led, uh, because we know that paternalism has failed. So uh, I always welcome an opportunity to make a contribution on these issues. Uh, I look forward to participating in the debate to be held later this year in relation to the voice. Senator Stilljohn. Thank you, um, Acting Chair. Um, I would like to pay my respects to the traditional uh, owners of the lands and the waters on which I speak today, the Ngunnawal uh, and Ngambri people. So I would also like to acknowledge uh, elders past, present and emerging in my uh, home state of Western Australia. I appreciate deeply the wisdom and the perspective uh, that they share with me as I undertake my role as Greens Health Spokesperson. Um, I look at the collective action and progress uh, on the Closing the Gap targets uh, with dismay and deep frustration. Uh, 
I will focus my contribution today on access to health services and access to disability uh, support services, including the NDIS, particularly the uh, ability to access these essential um, services while in prison. Noting we must increase the minimum age of criminal responsibility. That must be an absolute priority for government at every level. Uh, we must also uh, do so much more to reduce the number um, of First Nations people confined within the prison system, noting that Australia has the most people in for-profit prisons in the world. When I talk uh, to members of the community, they are surprised to learn that people in prison do not have access to Medicare. Shocked that Australia's universal health care system uh, is in fact not universal at all. Health care is essential uh, to the enjoyment of the human rights of all people, including those people in prison. And on average, people in prison experience significantly poorer mental health and physical health than those in the general community, and more complex, longer-term health needs. Healthcare services in prisons are funded uh, by the state and territory governments, which effectively means the people in custody do not have access to any of the federal health care, uh, including the Medicare, and Medicare system and the pharmaceutical benefit scheme. Extending Medicare services to people in prison would be a first step towards achieving better physical and mental health outcomes for people in custody. Introducing Medicare into prisons has broad support uh, from Medicare and legal organisations. We must get this done. Additionally, those in prisons uh, have extremely uh, limited access to the National Disability Insurance Scheme. Disabled people are overrepresented uh, in the prison system. Um, and as a starting point, I would love to get our disability service provisions in this country to a place where every disabled person uh, can access the therapies they need if they find themselves in prison, and that the moment that you are released from prison, uh, you have disability uh, supports and services in place uh, to enable uh, you to thrive. I'm calling on the government this afternoon uh, to include uh, in their closing the gap uh, statements in the future an implementation plan and pathway to allow prisoners to have access to Medicare, uh, the PBS and uh, the NDIS. In closing, I will say simply this, uh, truth, treaty, voice. Thank you. Senator Walsh. Acting Deputy President, and I too rise to speak on the Closing the Gap report. Uh, and I note the historic moment last month when our government stood with the coalition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Peaks to table uh, the second Closing the Gap implementation plan. Um, this joint tabling shows our commitment to partnering with Aboriginal controlled organisations, our commitment to working with First People. Um, for practical action, because closing the gap is as much about how we work together with communities as it is about how much we invest in communities uh, and how those investments are made on the ground um, in partnership with self-determined Aboriginal organisations and communities. Last month, the Closing the Gap joint tabling coincided with the 15-year anniversary of the apology to the Stolen Generations. Fifteen years ago, Prime Minister Rudd said, I am sorry on behalf of our nation. This was a significant page of truth-telling in our history as a nation, and it was acknowledged um, to be um, a historic moment um, in which the pain and the burden that members of the stolen generations um, could be told on the, on the national stage. Of course, the apology was not the end, but just a beginning towards a real voice for First Nations, towards treaty and towards truth. We are implementing the Uluru Statement from the heart in full. Uh, and we are proud to be doing so. 
um, and we're committed to the partnership with the Coalition of Peaks to deliver the Closing the Gap implementation plan. Um, our government's first Closing the Gap implementation plan um, details the steps that we'll take. And closing the Gap is not just about making statements. Um, it needs real action and real funding and real links to people on the ground in community. And that's why we're investing an additional $424 million in funding towards closing the gap. Um, it is wholly um, unacceptable that in Australia today many First Nations communities still don't have access to clean water. Um, and so we will be investing um, $150 million over four years to support water infrastructure and provide reliable water for remote and regional Indigenous communities. We're also working with the Northern Territory Government to build new remote housing with an investment of over $100 million as a Commonwealth contribution because, quite frankly, everyone deserves good housing, particularly in a country as rich as ours. Everyone deserves affordable and accessible food. It's an essential right. So for the next two years, we're investing in the national strategy for food security in remote First Nations communities. Tragically, we know that family and domestic violence disproportionately impacts First Nations women and children. And so the plan seeks to prevent and respond to family violence in a trauma-aware and culturally responsive manner. The plan includes funding towards supporting families impacted by violence. Education is a pathway to more opportunities and it should be accessible everywhere. So we'll be investing in boosting on-country education as well, increasing access and providing a choice for culturally appropriate distance learning. And we will invest more to support boarding education for rural and remote students as well. Um, and all of that, of course, is on top of the record 1.2 billion we committed um, in the October budget. This plan is about partnership between governments and self-determined Aboriginal communities and organisations. The Uluru Statement from the Heart reflects this sen sentiment of partnership. It's an offer to bring us closer to reconciliation as a nation. Uh, it will lead to better decision making and it will lead to better outcomes. And I have faith in the Australian people to vote yes in the referendum and take our nation forward. Um, all of this work is about enabling self-determination and full participation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Um, closing the gap is a commitment that all of us need to make in this place, to work together to respect the voices of First Nations people, to invest in their futures. Uh, and it's our commitment that will do just that. Um, and I conclude by saying that I have huge pride in serving in the Senate with my friends, um, Senator Jana Stewart from Victoria, sitting next to me, Malandiri McCarthy and the father of reconciliation, Senator Pat Dodson. We're richer for their contribution. Thank you. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Nanawal and Nambri elders and knowledge holders who have paved the way for those here now, those following proudly in their footsteps, and those yet to come as custodians and owners of country. I acknowledge Wajak country as my home base, where I live care for and maintain continuing reciprocal relationships with all who share this land. Sovereignty has never been ceded. It always was and always will be Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander lands. I am proud to be part of the Labor government committed to the implementation of the Uluru Statement from the Heart in full. More than 60,000 years of wisdom from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people is all around us if we care to listen. This year, we mark the 15th anniversary of the apology to the stolen generations when the works of Prime Minister Kevin Rudd reverberated across Australia. I am sorry on behalf of our nation. Truth can be hard, but it helps us move forward together. There is a long way to go, and as we saw with the last Closing the Gap report a few months ago, the gaps not only persist, some are getting bigger. The Albanese Labor government's implementation plan reaffirms closing the gaps 
as a, tr as a top priority and reflects our unwavering commitment to working in partnership with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. In May, it will be six years since the Uluru Statement from the Heart was delivered after the First Nations National Constitutional Convention, and later this year, all Australians will have the opportunity to vote yes for an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice to Parliament. The voice is about recognising First Nations people in our constitution, and it's about consultation. Recognition is the what, and the voice is the how. This is, about, this is above politics. It's about people, and it will bring us all together. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people deserve to be recognised as custodians of this country. Recognising that truth will unify our nation and help us on the journey towards reconciliation. The voice will help achieve real practical outcomes and improvements for First Nations people working to close the gap. Since colonisation, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have, told, have been told what to do. The voice will change that. It's about listening, because local solutions are always better for local issues. I'm optimistic about our future as a reconciled country that proudly recognises our more than 60,000 years of continuous culture, and I'm optimistic that by working together with First Nations people, we can close the gap. I acknowledge my fellow Labor senators, Senator Pat Dodson, Senator Jana Stewart, and Senator Melandiri McCarthy for all their contributions and work um, towards the voice to Parliament. Thank you. Senator Shubridge. Oh, thanks, Acting Deputy President. I first want to acknowledge the contribution that my colleague Senator Cox made in this debate. And and echo and reinforce all of the words in her contribution. Um, and what is clear is that after decades and decades of government failures to close the gap, that governments are still not actually listening to First Nations families. Now, and when will that change? Despite royal commission after royal commission, report after report, government policies are still literally killing First Nations peoples. And when will we say collectively that another report is not the answer? and enough is enough. It's a fact that governments across this country continue to steal First Nations children from their families, take them away from culture and country. Then those same governments show up in chambers like this and claim that they care about closing the gap. And despite what have ended up being many empty promises from politicians, despite the candles arranged outside this parliament house in 2008, which blazed the promise of, sorry, first step, Governments still aren't listening. And as the Grandmothers <coughs> Against Removals uh, movement will say, if sorry means anything, it means don't do it again. And First Nations communities and organisations don't want more empty promises. They actually want action and empowerment and resources and self-determination. And the fact of removing a child from their family, we know, is often the first step down a path of a lifetime of injustice, trauma and that long-lasting harm that spans lifetimes, spans generations. And the appalling rate of removal of, of First Nations children is nothing other than a continuing act of violence against those communities, against those families, with the so-called so child welfare institutions that we know across this country are not culturally safe for, Aboriginal, for First Nations families. The Ombudsman in my home state of New South Wales recently released a scathing report on the extent of my home state's child protection department um, and, its, and its failure to achieve or even persist with its five-year strategy to reduce over-representation of First Nations children in out-of-home care. The report found that the New South Wales Department of Communities and Justice failed to report transparent, transparently on what it did to implement its own strategy and, in fact, abandoned its own strategy halfway through. The Ombudsman found, and I quote, it was apparent to us that at some point within its five-year time frame, DCJ effectively abandoned the Aboriginal outcome strategy. DCJ did not report on what had been achieved by the AOS in the time it was operating, and nor did it announce that the strategy was being abandoned or why. 
So, Acting Deputy President, they didn't even bother to implement their own strategy. And it shows, because between 2017 and 2022, the proportion of First Nations children in out-of-home care actually increased from 38.4 per cent in June of 2017 to 43.8 per cent in June of 2022. And I say again, if sorry means anything, it means you don't do it again. And you don't, as the New South Wales child protection system does, and has just in the most recent five years, make the problem worse. Take more First Nations kids proportionally than ever before. As a state MP in the New South Wales Parliament, I introduced the Greens bill to prevent First Nations child removals, or at least to radically reduce them. And that was based on implementing the findings of the groundbreaking Family as Culture report that looked at uh, well over a thousand child removal cases, First Nations child removal cases, and came up with hundreds of recommendations. And I only did that after a direct request from First Nations communities and organisations across the state who saw that there was no action happening from the state. And we then worked together on the bill. But tragically, the Liberal National Government and Labor both refused to support the bill, which would have kept more families together and prevented at least a significant part of that trauma and tragedy of separation. The, the gov government could save lives today by implementing those reports, by listening to communities and acting on it. And I want to turn now to another key part, another key failure across the country, which is the ongoing practice of locking up children. First Nations children as, long, as young as 10 years old, some still with their baby teeth, are still being locked up in brutal institutions where we know that they're being tortured, in territories and states across the country. When will we raise the age? When will we come as a nation and commit to the Royal Commission into Deaths in Custody and the recommendations in there? And when will we finally start listening, empowering and resourcing genuine self-determination for First Nations communities? Because that's how we close the gap. You. Senator Thank you. Mr Acting Deputy President, as National's Senate Leader, I rise to add my contribution to this important issue and acknowledge the Prime Minister's statement on the anniversary of the National Apology. Australia has had a rich and complex history, a history marked with adversity and struggle for many Australians, including our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. We are one of the most culturally diverse nations on earth. And I'm pleased to see so many people recognising and embracing the connection to the land we live on and the culture of our First Nations people. The anniversary of the National Apology gives us the opportunity to reflect on past injustices, to grieve with those who we have left behind and to take account of where we are today. It's been 56 years since the 1967 referendum. 47 years since the Aboriginal Land Rights Act, 31 years since the Mabo decision and 15 years since the National Apology. These pages are marked in history as significant progress in closing the gap between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians. I'd also like to acknowledge that these achievements are made without a bureaucratic voice but through a growing number of Aboriginal voices in this place and increasing embedded engagement of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in our democratic institutions right across our country. The Nationals welcome the release of the government's 2023 Closing the Gap implementation plan, and we welcome the Prime Minister's promise of more than $68 million over two years for support to women and children experiencing family, domestic and sexual violence and more than $21 million over five years to support families impacted by violence. We note with great interest the $150 million over four years for the National Water Grid Fund to support First Nations water infrastructure and provide safe and reliable water for remote and regional Indigenous communities. The government's record on water policy and infrastructure leaves many in doubt about the effectiveness of this government's commitment. We welcome the Commonwealth's contribution to a new one-year partnership with the Northern Territory Government to accelerate building of new remote housing. But the Nationals know a one-year commitment for important infrastructure like housing does not go far enough, nor does it recognising, nor does it recognising the life cycle of housing construction and asset maintenance. Anyone who lives in regional and remote communities across Australia understand that it is housing maintenance that is the most challenging issue 
in rural and remote Aboriginal communities. We welcome the commitment to boost on-country education for remote First Nations students and support for boarding for rural and remote students. I again call on the government to support the Yipirinya Aboriginal School in Alice Springs and the funding commitment we made in the election uh, to actually build a boarding facility for those kids that are coming into Alice from town camps to access uh, education in language uh, at Alice Springs. As minister, I was able to broker the historic Barclay Regional Deal between uh, the Barclay Regional Council, the, territory, the Gunnar Territory Government at the time, and the federal government in the wake of the rape of a two-year-old in Tennant Creek. Sadly, whilst many of the infrastructure projects have been completed, the one measure of that uh, regional deal, which was to map the service provisions between all levels of government into that community, find the gaps and then service the gaps so that we do this better in partnership, is the one thing that hasn't been done. It was one of the cheapest things in that whole deal. So I would really commend the current federal government, the Northern Territory government and the Barclay Regional Council um, to complete that work to the benefit of the whole region up there in the Barclay. The Nationals represent more Indigenous citizens than any other political party in this place. We understand the very real issues facing them and have a particularly understanding of remoteness. We will continue to be a strong voice for Indigenous people and we welcome the recognition of the apology today in the Senate. Thank you, Senator McKenzie. Uh, Senator O'Neill. Thank you. Thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. And I rise today to speak to the closing the gap ministerial statement and the anniversary of the Stolen Generations. And I've been in this chamber long enough to actually know the history of this actually becoming a practice, that we have this debate. Uh, when I first arrived here in the chamber, it shocked me that the Closing the Gap report was delivered in the House. Senators didn't attend. Business went on here. Well, the whole thing about giving an apology to the First Nations people was about how we speak about our history, how we respond to the reality of our time, and how we make time and to go on the journey of the heart, the mind, the soul and the finances to make sure that this is a just nation for all Australians, but particularly so for First Nations people. Every year when we do this now, when we all get to contribute in this debate, is a mindful moment for us all here as senators and members in the other place to think about the way in which we want our country to go forward. It's a vital time. It's a solemn time when we, in these moments, reflect on the best and the worst of our history and the long pathway back to reconciliation with our First Nation Australians. We still have so much work to do. It's clear we haven't closed the gap. Thank God we started paying attention to it at some point. The numbers of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people dying by suicide is not on track. In fact, it's worsening for children, for babies, improving birth weights, the level of year 12 and tertiary completions, adult incarceration rates, children in out-of-home care and youth employment rates. All of these vital and fundamental things that are embedded in the life of our First Nations people, they're all off track. And it gives us a sense of the scale of the task. But today we redouble our efforts. We do not turn away. We do not look away, despite our shame, despite our fear, despite our sadness and the grief that this is the reality of our nation in 2023. I visited Wilcannia in 2022. I met with First Nations community representatives on the, mighty, the banks of the mighty Barker River to hear from them directly what their community needed. I heard terrible stories of suicides, youth suicides, of poverty, of deprivation, but I also am mindful of the blistering smiles of one young girl whose joy overflowed like the river. Sadly for that young woman growing up in Wilcannia, the average life expectancy 
for men in her town is 38 years old. And for women, a little bit better, 41 years. This is our Australia in 2023. We can do better. I heard that the spirits of the town ebbed and flowed along with the water level of the Barker River and that the drought and COVID had both ravaged the, the town. But there remained hope. There was pride in their achingly beautiful country. They need change in the way we walk alongside our First Nation brothers and sisters. We desperately need reconciliation to ensure that our people, our Indigenous people, the Indigenous people of Australia, have the same opportunities and the same go at life as non-Indigenous Australians. Now, it's not just about money, and I know that many programs have been named here, and the costs of those are significant and important and valuable. They're investments. $1.6 in billion in additional support from Labor to the First Nations communities has, has flowed into those communities since coming to office. Now, that package of $1.6 billion is designed to drastic, drastically increase funding for clean water in remote communities, food security for housing and education, for health care for First Nation communities across the nation. It also includes two dialysis buses to the far west of New South Wales, the communities of Menindi, Whitecliffs and Wilcannia, who begged me to hear their pleas because they just couldn't face the round trip to, Bro uh, to Broken Hill, hundreds of kilometres each day or each week to try and get the life-saving treatment they needed. We need a circuit breaker. We need a voice to parliament. It's not radical reform. It's just another important step in the right direction. Thank you, Senator O'Neill. Senator Pratt. It was a great honour to be in this place 15 years ago as Kevin Rudd offered a formal apology to Australia's First Nations stolen generations on behalf of our nation. It acknowledged that the laws and policies of its successive parliaments and governments had resulted in the forcible removal of First Nations children from their families and, as said at the time, inflicted profound grief, suffering and loss on our fellow Australians. But the removal of First Nations children from their families was also part of an attempt and other moves through the history of our nation to wipe out culture, economy, language and spirituality of Australians, First Nations people. But as we know, First Nations Australians are resilient and today we find ourselves in a place where through the Uluru Statement from the heart, we have a generous invitation from First Nations people to pull and make part of our national constitution, First Nations people, so that we can show ourselves as a nation that didn't start at federation when the colonies came together, but can look back 60,000 years to the laws, customs and culture and create a national statement that invites all Australians to belong to that profound history. In the 15 years since the apology, I'd love to say we were further towards closing the gap. But as we know, the data shows we're not on track. But given our history, I guess I don't necessarily find this at all surprising. We haven't reset our institutional arrangements as a nation fully and properly so that First Nations people have a voice and a capacity to negotiate with government with government on behalf and parliament on behalf of their own communities. So we know not only does governments, both at a state and national level, need to redouble our efforts to improve outcomes, 
We know we need to do, do more. Our gap's not closing fast enough, and we will not let this stagnation stand. Our implementation plan for closing the gap invests $400 million in additional funding. But we also need to make sure First Nations people are with us every step of the way at the heart of that decision making. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are already leading the way, transforming health and community services, policies and programs, and rebuilding them with the foundations of culture, community and their connections to country. Community-led solutions respond much more effectively to current and future needs. They do this in holistic and robust ways, using cultural knowledge and practices to restore and build up the well-being of their communities. So it's high time that our nation acknowledge that it is Aboriginal people, our First Nations people, who are best placed to lead and create their own solutions. It is why constitutional recognition is so important at the upcoming vote this year. It is why acknowledgement and empowerment through our constitution is so important. It is high time for constitutional recognition. It is high time for voice, treaty and truth. Thank you, Senator Pratt. Do you seek leave to continue your remarks? <coughs> Senator Pratt, do you seek leave to continue your remarks? The Chamber like me to, then yes, I will seek leave to continue Thank my remarks. Thank, Thank you, you, Senator Pratt. Uh, the Minister. I uh, move that further consideration of the documents be listed as a general business order of the day. Uh, thank you, Minister. I call the clerk. Government business order of the day number two, Therapeutic Goods Amendment 2022, measures number one, Bill 2022, resumption of second reading debate. Thank you, clerk. Senator Steele John. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy President. Um, in continuing my uh, remarks tonight, I want to again uh, re-emphasise, or rather, in continuing my uh, remarks this morning, um, I want to uh, acknowledge uh, the, the origin of this bill, um, that being the Senate Select Committee um, into uh, the impact of a transvaginal uh, mesh on uh, women in Australia. Um, and I want to once again offer my heartfelt acknowledgement um, and commitment to the community um, that gave evidence before that inquiry. It takes an incredible amount of uh, strength and emotional energy to come before a Senate committee um, and to share your experiences of such horrific uh, medical um, harm at the hands of these devices, and yet people did that. People did that. Families did that. Mothers did that. To be able to, uh, in, the hope, in the hope that it would result in legislative change that would ensure that no such uh, that no such travesty was ever again inflicted upon members of the Australian community. That nobody ever again went in for a medical device to deal with something as simple as incontinence and came out with something inside them that caused them a lifetime of pain. I want to thank all those that give, gave evidence to that inquiry and commit myself and the Greens movement to working with you and to every single one of those recommendations are fully implemented. Now, uh, in contributing to this legislation, um, I also want to foreshadow um, that there will be a couple of other second reading amendments. Um, that we uh, will be moving. One uh, will be moved by, by my uh, colleague and dear friend, um, Janet Rice, um, and that amendment will be in relation um, to blood donation. Um, and the, this, movement, this motion will be moved by Janet on behalf of the Australian Greens um, as a second reading amendment to this TGA legislation. Um, now, if it's successful, our amendment will see the TGA 
bring uh, equality, equality to blood donations laws. It will remove barriers um, to gay and bisexual men, trans women and some non-binary people who have sex with men from donating blood. Specifically, the Greens are calling on the TGA um, to replace the current approach of population-based risk assessment um, and the three-month deferral uh, period with an, uh, with an approach that is based on an individualised uh, risk assessment. Now, this is not a radical idea. Uh, this is something that has been done in the UK, um, and the evidence fully supports it. Uh, this amendment is in solidarity uh, with the Let Us Give campaign. It responds to the need uh, for, more, uh, for more plasma and more uh, whole of blood across the entire country. And I want to acknowledge and I want to uh, thank um, the campaigners who are part of that campaign um, that are doing incredible work in the space to make sure that we get rid of the discriminatory practices that currently exist in this space and replace them uh, with an individualised system based on equality. We must stop discriminating against those who give blood. We must look at the evidence and go with the science. The reality is that there is no increase uh, no increased risk to allowing this group to donate blood following an individual risk assessment. It is time to ensure that all Australians are able to donate equally. And it is also time to recognise that the decades we have taken, the decades we have taken to make this change, the, the barriers ultimately, they weren't the science. The science was the excuse for the discrimination. Now, this is something the community has always known. They've always known the reality of this. But we come to this space in 2023 with the government still dragging its heel, and that is proof positive that this is the case. We've got to end that discrimination and allow people to donate equally. Uh, the second amendment, which will be uh, moved um, in, in, by myself on behalf of the Australian Greens uh, relates uh, to, medical, uh, to uh, medicinal cannabis. Uh, we will be seeking to move uh, the second reading amendment uh, in recognition that while medicinal cannabis is legal uh, in this country, too many people cannot afford to access it. Particularly, this amendment relates to the TGA's role in ensuring that patients who require medicinal cannabis for therapeutic use are able to access it. This amendment asks the Senate to recognise the findings of the Community Affairs Committee inquiry into the barriers to patient access, for medicinal, uh, access to medicinal cannabis in Australia. This report was released in 2020 with many recommendations yet to be implemented. I'll quote directly uh, from uh, the report uh, from former Greens leader, Senator Richard uh, Di Natale, who worked on the inquiry. During that inquiry, Parliament heard from patients across the country who are unable to access uh, the medicinal cannabis treatments that they need due to regulatory barriers and enormous cost. Cost is a hugely prohibitive factor for patients needing access to medicinal cannabis. They just can't afford it. Although the government has said, look, we accept that it has therapeutic benefits and we will allow it to be placed on the register, the cost is so high that the people who need it just can't get it. It is completely unacceptable that people can be out of pocket for thousands of dollars while trying to access legal medicinal cannabis products through a regulated system uh, when the black market is far cheaper. Now, three, three years on from this report, nothing has changed. People still uh, cannot uh, access medicinal cannabis and they are still unfairly punished uh, when they try to do so. 
We have experts on the. Uh, we have the experts, the majority um, of uh, the Senate, uh, majority of the public, and the clear findings uh, of the Senate committee itself, saying uh, we need to take action. The system at the moment is broken, and it's the patients who are paying the price. Now, this is what this amendment seeks to address, and the Greens encourage the Senate to work in line with the community need, the clear evidence uh, provided to this place, and to support this amendment. Uh, and in relation to the medicinal cannabis amendment, um, I seek uh, to move the amendment. Uh, thank you very much, Senator Steele John. Uh, Senator Rice. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. <clears throat> so it's terrific to be, um, be able to speak to this bill today, and I want to start by saying that I support the comments made by my colleague and my dear friend, Senator Jordan Steelejohn, in relation to the Therapeutic Goods Amendment Bill 2022 overall. And I thank him for his important advocacy in the health portfolio and the work that has been done on the issues in this bill. I want to particularly speak to the issue raised in my second reading amendment. And it's an issue that I have worked on in this place for a long time, which is restrictions on gay and bisexual men, trans women and some non-binary people who have sex with men. It's a restriction on them giving blood. So my amendment says the, the Senate calls on the government and the Therapeutic Goods Administration to urgently remove barriers to gay and bisexual men, trans women and some non-binary people who have sex with men from giving blood, including by replacing the current approach of a population-based risk assessment and the three-month deferral period with an approach based on individual risk assessment. This is an issue that I have been advocating for for many years. It's an issue that I have raised repeatedly in Senate estimates and that I have had discussions with the um, Department of Health, with the Therapeutic Goods Administration and with Lifeblood. And it's an issue that really does not seem to have made any progress in the time that I've been advocating on it as a senator. And it seems that there's just this merry-go-round of the health department saying, oh, that's the responsibility of the TGA. The TGA saying that's the responsibility of lifeblood. Lifeblood saying that's the responsibility of the TGA. <laughs> when I asked questions at, the, at last estimates, um, there was another agency, a, a blood, I can't even remember what its name was, um, Blood Donations Australia or something, and they said, oh, the TGA said, oh, I think you need to talk to them about this. We need to stop this merry-go-round because what this is, what is going on is discrimination against men who have sex with men. And it's an issue that the LGBTIQA plus advocacy community have been very concerned about for a very long time. It's an issue that's been addressed in other jurisdictions, which have shifted from having that population-based risk approach to an individual risk assessment. And for the life of me, I do not know why it has taken so long for Australia to also be making this change. Other than that, you have to cynically and sadly feel that there is just an ongoing level of discrimination against same-sex attracted people that exists in some of our um, the bureaucracy here in, within the Australian government. So I'm no longer the Green spokesperson for LGBTIQA plus advocacy. I'm really pleased that my colleague um, Mr Stephen Bates in the other place is continuing that excellent work. But I'm very pleased to be here in the Senate to be raising this issue. Um, I just wanted to let you know of some of the, co the campaigning that's been going on in the community on this issue. Just Equal have coordinated a campaign from doctors, nurses and medical professionals calling for an approach that isn't discriminatory. As an open letter by medical professionals says, we are Australian health professionals who want the blood supply to be safe, more abundant and less discriminatory. We support a policy that screens potential blood donors for their individual risk, not the gender of their sexual partner. We believe the current ban on blood donation by sexually active gay and bisexual men and, by, and transgender people reduces the amount of blood available without making the blood supply safer. A better policy would be to focus on activity that actually, create, that actually reduces risk and to screen potential donors for that risk, regardless of sexuality or gender identity. 
And I could not agree more. And this is the, the approach that we really need to see being taken and for that change to happen urgently. Since we um, foreshadowed this second reading amendment, we have had some feedback from the Health Department and, in fact, some fairly good news that we are now being told that Lifeblood has announced that they will undertake research to decide whether to replace the current population-based risk model with the individual risk assessment approach for blood do donation, and that the TGA is working closely with Lifeblood to facilitate this re research and review over the coming months, subject to review by ind independent advisory committees. So I think just by putting this second reading amendment on, on the notice paper, it seems that we are finally seeing some action. So I urge that research to happen very urgently, to draw upon the extensive research in other jurisdictions around the world, and to stop the discriminatory processes that are currently, um, currently being undertaken. We have come a long way with ending discrimination against LGBTIQA plus people. I mean, the wonderful experience of World Pride and Mardi Gras that I attended in, in Sydney the weekend before last was extraordinary, an extraordinary celebration of the contribution that lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender and gender diverse, bisexual, intersex and asexual people make to our community. We really need to continue to be taking every action we can to be reducing discrimination by LGBTIQA plus people and to be changing how we screen blood and to be going to an individual risk assessment approach is one very tangible, very important measure that we in this parliament can be taking to be achieving equality for LGBTIQA plus people. Thank you. Senator Hanson. I rise to speak on the Therapeutic Goods Amendment 2022 Measures No. 1, Bill 2022. One Nation will not support this legislation. This bill is so flawed it needs to be reviewed by a committee by Labor, of course, is, is following its new procedure and ramming through legislation without giving this Senate the opportunity to review and improve it. Mark Butler should hang his head in shame. The most concerning provisions in this legislation are a direct attack on a foundational principle of Australian law and a fundamental human right, the presumption of innocence. It's sad to have to say this, but this government needs to be reminded that in Australia it's up to the prosecution to prove guilt, not the defence to prove innocence. I also remind this government it is simply not allowed to interfere with this human right in any way, and most definitely not for the sake of public service bureaucrats. I have to remind this government because it's not only this bill which threatens this principle, but others on the notice paper for this week as well. Labor does not have a mandate to interfere with human rights. It does not have the permission of the Australian people. The committee report on the TGA Bill makes it quite clear. The proposed section 45AC, creating an offence for failing to produce information and documents to the secretary, also creates new strict liability offences which can attract a penalty of up to $27,000. Subsection 45AC3 provides for reasonable excuse but places a burden on the defendant to, provide, to prove they are innocent. This is effectively a presumption the defendant is guilty of the offence. Labor has no excuse for this. As a government elected by the people of Australia, one of the most important duties is to protect their rights, not attack them. However, the bill goes further. The proposed new section 6113 explicitly states the secretary does not, doesn't need to observe procedural fairness or the natural justice hearing rule in regards to releasing information collected under the Act. That's right. Labor doesn't support procedural fairness. Perhaps an even more concerning part of this bill relates to the import importation of medicines. The proposed subsection 19A2B gives the secretary the power to grant approval to importation or supply therapeutic goods, including mRNA vaccines, but it does not specify safely, um, safety testing of these goods and does not provide for a sunset clause on the approval. I note there are a range of other conditions for approval, including the catch-all, 
in the interests of public health. As we saw to our horror during the COVID-19 pandemic, many fundamental human rights in Australia came under direct attack in the so-called interest of public health. Freedom to travel, freedom of assembly, freedom of association, freedom to choose, even freedom of speech. It wasn't just Labor governments doing this. Coalition governments were equally guilty of trampling all over our rights. They were in it together. Some of us might be forgiven for thinking that with the pandemic effectively over, that might be the end of the violation of our rights in the name of public health. However, it might have only been the beginning. In May this year, a meeting of the World Health Assembly will consider proposals for a World Health Organisation pandemic treaty and changing the international health regulations. These proposals threaten not only our human rights but the sovereignty of Australia. They threaten to transform the hopelessly corrupt World Health Organisation from an, an advisory body to a governing body able to make legally binding pro proclamations on the world's nations. They threaten to remove the requirement that these corrupt international bodies have respect for the dignity, human rights and fundamental freedom of persons. They threaten to give the WHO control over national means of production, enabling it to force countries to manufacture medicines or vaccines. They threaten to give the WHO the power to force medical examinations on treatments of, on individuals and force people to carry certifications about tests and vaccinations. They threaten to give the WHO the power to disclose personal health information and to censor whatever it considers to be misinformation. What's the bet that this Labor government will roll over and just allow this all to happen? No bet, Harriet? Of course they will. They don't believe the rights of the individual take precedence over the interests of the state. But let me tell you, nothing is more dangerous to a free society. This government and every government which comes after should be required to take an oath they will not subordinate the rights of human beings to the interests of the state, let alone unelected international bodies wanting a one-world communist government. Senator Babette. Thank you. Obviously, I rise here today to speak in regards to the Therapeutic Goods Amendment Bill 2022. Now, I support various aspects of this bill, including the introduction of a mandatory medical device adverse event reporting scheme for hospital and other healthcare facilities. I acknowledge that the TGA has an important role to play in managing medicine shortages. They have an important responsibility to find suitable substitutes to ensure that Australians have access to the medications that we all require in a timely manner. Now, the bill, in part, seeks to address critical shortages on life-saving medications. For example, currently, I know that warfarin tablets are currently listed as being in critical short supply. Now, this is, of course, a potentially life-saving drug for persons with cardiovascular conditions. Now, I'd also like to acknowledge Minister Butler's office for responding to several questions that I had in relation to portions of this bill. Now, however, I must raise some concerns relating to what appears to be extraordinary powers to be granted to this secretary in this bill without, I believe, to be sufficient ministerial oversight. Now, the amendments in this schedule are intended to address the gap in the range of measures available under the Act uh, to address and alleviate the effects of shortages, which is fair enough. Now, by amending section 19A of the Act to introduce a mechanism to enable the Secretary to approve the importation or supply of an unapproved medicine, that is or is, principally similar to a medicine that has been cancelled or suspended from the register. So let's just say, as an example, let's just throw one out there. Uh, 
The Secretary wants to substitute a certain medication with, I don't know, let's say a novel technology. What would be the chances of there being indemnity, as an example, granted to said sponsor? Will there be any guarantees that the substitute is both safe and effective? What if there was to be a safety signal? What happens then? Would the data and rationale behind the decision be disclosed for the public to review? I think we all know what this, where this could potentially go. Now, we know that there exists a presumption of commercial in confidence of information provided by pharmaceutical companies. We know that already. Now, there must exist an obligation for transparency of data and agreements because, as we all know, transparency it builds trust. Now, in our correspondence with the Minister's office and the TGA around Section 19A, the TGA advised that before a Section 19A approval is given, the Secretary must be, must be satisfied that an approval is necessary in the interest of public health and that the registered medicines could act as a substitute for the overseas registered goods uh, unavailable or in short supply. Now, in the interest of public health, we've all heard that before. I wonder what could happen there. Now, I can think of quite a few examples, recent examples, where measures were put in place in the interest of public health, but they actually arguably resulted in quite a bit of harm being done. So let's just go through them. Mask mandates, school closures, lockdown, vaccine mandates, border closures, curfews, interfering with the doctor-patient relationship. There's quite a few. Many failed dictates have been put in place in the interests of public health. Now, I know that this bill is not specifically linked to pandemic measures, I know that, but the overreaches are symptomatic of absolute power leading to poor decision making and significant unintended consequences. Now, I aim not to stand in the way of large portions of this bill which are necessary, but Section 19A is one which needs more attention. Now, I've touched on just a small portion of this bill, and there are many reasons why we should, in the public interest, debate this bill at length. Now, I'll be proposing amendments to this bill, one proposing referral to the Community Affairs Legislation Committee, and another requesting ministerial responsibility for the, for the decisions made by the Secretary as a legislative instrument. It is unacceptable, unacceptable that we should award great power to a bureaucrat who has no direct accountability to the Australian people. The Australian people can't vote the secretary out at a general election. What I seek is greater transparency, accountability and disclosure of information so we don't repeat the mistakes of the past. Now, power must be decentralised. Decision-making must be transparent and, above all else, the Australian people should be well informed. That is why this bill needs proper scrutiny and, for that reason, I foreshadow that I will be moving a second reading amendment at the end of this debate. Uh, Senator Roberts, uh, just noting that we have a hard marker at 12.15. I'll start. Please. Pres Mr Acting Deputy President, as a servant to the many different people who make up the amazing Queensland community, I speak to the Therapeutic Goods Amendment 2022 Measures No. 1 Bill 2022. It's significant in my speech's opening that I refer to myself as a servant of Queensland and Australian people. Whoever wrote this bill is not a servant to the people, in fact sees the people as their servants. No slaves, serfs. It destroys fundamental human rights, smashes fundamental principles of law, removes the tried and true system for authorising new drugs, and places the Australian public at the mercy of and under the control of unelected bureaucrats. These same bureaucrats prove themselves unfit to exercise their current power during COVID. First, let me explain the provisions of the bill. Introducing a framework, the first one, introducing a framework for the mandatory reporting of adverse events involving medical devices, principally by hospitals. This has its origin in the pelvic mess scandal. Senator, Senator Roberts, uh, as foreshadowed, um, you'll be in continuation. We're now moving to Senator's statements.
With the concurrence of the Senate, the clerks will set the clock in line with the informal arrangements made by the Whips. Senator Dodson. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. Um, I rise to share the success of the National Week of Action for the Voice. This historic week was held uh, from the 18th to the 24th of February. Across the country, Australians from all walks of life came together in town halls, parks, workplaces to show their support for the voice. Australians took time out from their busy, busy schedules and their busy lives to learn about the voice, to ask questions and to discuss their role in the up-and-coming referendum. This is because the communities are ready for change. The week of action gave me a great amount of faith in the Australian people, in their generosity and goodwill. There is much room in their hearts for this proposal, and ultimately the Australian people themselves will determine this referendum, not politicians. Leaders of the Uluru Statement knew this. They did not equivocate in their message to the Australian people. The voice referendum is an invitation, an opportunity for the Australian people to walk with the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. This is a, this is a great country. And the, after a week of action, I believe that the majority of Australians will accept this generous offer. But change must start at home, within our own backyards. For me, the backyard happens to be the big state of Western Australia. The vastness and diversity of the state is not lost on me. As a Western Australian Senator and Special Envoy, I am committed to engaging with people from all corners of this country, urban, regional and remote. I believe we need to reach out to all parts of our country in this referendum. And so I spent the week of action travelling down the remote west coast of Western Australia, talking to communities about the voice and answering questions. I started at my own traditional uh, country home of Broome, alongside the Kimberley uh, Land Council CEO and engagement group member. Mr Tyrone Garston. We spoke to a packed uh, hall at the Notre Dame campus at, the, at Broome. The next day, the Prime Minister and the Attorney General and the Deputy Prime Minister and I held a series of meetings in Port Hedland because the Cabinet was meeting there. In a meeting organised by my colleague, Senator Lyons, we heard from the Karriera people, the traditional owners and elders, on, uh, on why the voice is important to them and their words. They say that the next step in a long history of advocacy by the Aboriginal people of the, of the Pilbara. I made a, a, a promise to return later in the year to speak at the historic Yule River meeting on The Voice. I then went on to Carnarvon, a small town 900 k's from Perth. Here I met the Shire President and I held a community forum with the, for The Voice uh, at the Cultural Centre. Carnarvon has been the subject to much uh, speculation in the media, particularly on issues of youth and alcohol. Senior members of that community shared their views uh, about The Voice, that it will be an important element in addressing many of these concerns, because in the words of the Jingara local elder, The Voice will empower community voices. Too often regional and remote communities are spoken of and down to. But on each of my regional visits there was a strong support for The Voice, because regional and remote communities know what it is like to be ignored by governments. The Voice makes sense to them. But I do want to acknowledge that at times in these meetings some elderly non-Aboriginal people did disagree with The Voice proposal and its proposition. And I want to say to such senior persons that they are entitled to their view and that they are appreciated and respected for the contributions they have made to the country. And I'd like to put on the record my appreciation of the many non-Aboriginal people who have helped to improve the living conditions of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. You are appreciated and respected, and we thank you for your contributions over the years. Change is coming. Don't feel threatened by the change. The change will bring us together and not force us apart. We certainly need your support in the forthcoming referendum. My final days of the week of action were spent in Perth. I held meetings with the Noongar Wadja traditional owners 
where we discuss the importance of voice and Western Australian support. This was followed by a meeting with local health organisation and service provider, including the Wanganing Aboriginal Corporation. Wanganing has been operating in Perth since 1988, providing health and family services to those most in need. One staff member with the organisation for nearly 30 years shared that she believed the voice will improve practical outcomes by giving Aboriginal people more of a say. These are the real voices of the voice and the real stories about the voice. Fair-minded Australians know that the voice is a positive step for the nation and for the First Nations peoples as well. The voice deserves to, be, to exist above the fear-mongering and the political games. That is why I concluded a week of action with a cross-party panel. Myself, Senator Cox, member for Curtin, uh, Ms Kate Cheney, along with the esteemed academic uh, Dr Anna McGlade and Marcus Stewart, the co-chair of the First Nations Assembly of Victoria. We came together to talk with and to listen to hundreds of people and members of the Perth community on The Voice and its importance to the nations. The Voice must exist above party politics and I will always extend my hand of a bipartisanship wherever I can. The week of action is just the start. Momentum is building for The Voice. The official Yes campaign recently launched in Adelaide and I look forward to advocating alongside them as Special Envoy. But in this week demonstrating, if this week demonstrated anything is that The Voice is a movement of the people and the Australian people who, who, it is the Australian people who will secure the success of this referendum. It, won't be a, it will be won around the dinner tables and the sporting grounds and the local RSLs. Do not underestimate the power of a single conversation. As I said to the people in Perth in the week of action, what a moment of liberation this will be for all of us. The moment of, of a successful referendum that that's declared, the shackles of the past will fall from us. We will stand with clean hearts and clean consciences and we will know our country is on the path to a better future. We, the Australian people, will make that decision on that day when we cast our referendum vote. Our vote for the recognition of Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander peoples, for them to be part of the Australian Constitution and for them to be able to make representations to the parliament and the executive on matters that affect them, finally having their say in the places where it, where it amounts to very important matters. This will be transformative for our nation and an enhancement to the quality of our own citizenship. It will bring us together rather than divide us. Senator Henderson. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I am delighted to rise in this debate as the new Shadow Minister for Education. In taking over from Alan Tudge, I have very big shoes to fill. I would like to start by acknowledging Alan's exceptional work as the former Minister for Education. He is certainly a great loss to our team. Alan drove many important initiatives now being supported by the Albanese government, uh, including the coalition's $2.2 billion research commercialisation agenda for the Australian university sector, including the magnificent $1.6 billion economic accelerator program. And I am delighted that this passed the parliament yesterday, a key initiative, as I say, of the former coalition government. This is a program which will drive the translation and commercialisation of research to ensure that Australian universities can take more of their innovations and inventions to market. The initiative followed a review which found that while Australian universities undertake world-leading research and publish more than 100,000 academic papers, uh, too often this did not result uh, in tangible incomes. The coalition is determined to support a new wave of commercial innovations in the same way that Australian research delivered the electronic pacemaker, penicillin, the black box flight recorder, Wi-Fi, cochlear implants 
and uh, even more in more recent times at Deakin University, the lightweight carbon fibre wheel, which started as a competition between Deakin University students and of course has now resulted in the magnificent advanced manufacturer carbon revolution. Uh, this is a program which will help bridge the valley of death when early stage research is often not progressed because of the risk and uncertainty of uh, commercial returns. I particularly want to reference the Business Council of Australia's comments about our commercialisation package. It said, this will significantly improve Australia's ability to commercialise our best ideas and innovations, scaling them up to create exciting new industries, new exports and new highly skilled jobs for Australians. So, as I say, this is a very important part of the Coalition's legacy in education, which of course also includes record funding for early education and schools and a laser-like focus on the importance of lifting school standards, including through strengthened teacher training and a stronger curriculum. As I mentioned at the Australian uh, the University's Australia Annual Conference. Uh, we do welcome the various reviews being undertaken by the Albanese government into early childcare, into schools and uh, into universities through the University's Accord, but we are concerned there is a danger of being caught in a review vortex. Um, we simply cannot slow the pace of reform which is required to provide greater access to early childhood education and care to reverse declining standards in our schools and teacher workforce pressures and to ensure that we deliver the right skilled graduates to fuel our future workforce through our university and higher education sector. Uh, over the past two decades, despite a 60 per cent increase in real per student funding, our school performance has gone backwards in absolute terms and comparatively to other nations. This is a cause um, of great concern for all Australians. Since 2000, Australia's performance in the PISA test for 15-year-olds in reading has declined by 26 points, all the equivalent of nine months of schooling. In maths, we have fallen 33 points and in science, 24 points. To lift student performance, we must absolutely focus on ensuring we have a strong curriculum. We are teaching phonics in every classroom and that we are using explicit teaching models to support engaged classrooms. I have to say I was delighted to meet with a group of primary school principals yesterday from the government, Catholic and independent school sector who share a common goal to lift standards and to ensure that our students reach the very best of their potential. A crowded curriculum bogged down in bureaucracy and red tape, which provides too little discretion for school principals and individual schools, remains a very big issue in Australian primary schools, and it's certainly going to be a focus of my work as the Shadow Minister for Education. The former coalition government proposed a three-pillar plan for our recovery, addressing what students are taught, how they are taught, and the environment in which they are taught. And so, in relation to the National School Reform Agreement, it is imperative that that funding is linked to targeted outcomes, particularly student performance and attendance. But I have to say it should not take another review and another 12 months, which delays the additional schools funding um, that Labor committed to deliver. Um, I am very concerned that this delay in effect constitutes another broken promise by the Albanese government because even the Australian Education Union has accused Labor of betraying public schools by not delivering this funding in a timely matter, manner. I also just want to reiterate the importance of returning to a one-year diploma of education, another issue I raised in my Universities Australia address. And I am pleased that education ministers at their meeting on the 27th of February, about four days after I raised this, resolved to consider how a two-year postgraduate teaching degree could be reduced to 12 months. 
With falling graduate numbers and teachers continuing to leave the profession in droves, it is critical that we explore all avenues to get more teachers into our schools. A one-year postgraduate teaching qualification will encourage more Australians, both graduates and professionals working in other careers, to switch to teaching, breaking down barriers to a career in teaching. And let's face it, it is a wonderful career. While safeguarding the quality and standards of teacher training is vital. Uh, it's actually backed up by the research, the research which shows that there is no significant um, change in qualifications and in outcomes for teachers who do a one-year postgraduate qualification compared with the two years master's degrees. And I do want to congratulate Premier Perrottet, who has taken such a strong lead by announcing that New South Wales will recognise a one-year postgraduate teaching qualification. So New South Wales and the Liberals in New South Wales absolutely leading the way. And I do ask why Labor's Education Minister, Mr Clare, is dragging the chain. I also just want to call on the Albanese government to take action on two other important issues in the time I have remaining. I have raised concerns about the Confucius Institutes in a range of Australian universities. I do acknowledge the higher education sector plays a vital role in combating foreign interference and influence and safeguarding our values in the face of increasing threats from others who want to do us harm. And while the government has said it will not approve any new agreements for a Confucius Institute at an Australian university, I am concerned that the Foreign Minister has not used her powers under the Foreign Relations Act introduced by the coalition government to cancel any of the existing agreements. This deeply conflicting position is very difficult to reconcile and needs to be urgently addressed. I also want to call on the Albanese government to ensure that all of the important work of the coalition that we did in safeguarding academic freedom and freedom of speech on Australian university campuses is not undermined. I do note that 41 Australian universities have agreed to the model code developed by the Hon. Robert French AC, a key recommendation of the coalition's review of freedom of speech in Australian higher education providers. And so it is of concern that a number of universities, including the University of Melbourne, have adopted a position on an Indigenous voice to parliament which could potentially undermine academic freedom. Uh, it's absolutely fundamental that academic freedom is preserved at all costs. It protects the rights of academics to engage in free, robust speech. As we know, it is incumbent upon all educational institutions to teach Australians how to think, not what to think, and academics who don't believe in free speech have no place at Australian universities. Thank you so much. Thank you, Senator Henderson. Senator Stilljohn. Thank you. Right now, as I speak today, there is a crisis unfolding in my home state of Western Australia and right around the country. Tonight, approximately 9,000 Western Australians will experience a form of homelessness, nearly 13 per cent of them under the age of 12. It is a hard figure. To hear, but it is not hard to figure out how we got here. This place, this parliament, whether it be controlled by the Liberal or the Labour Party, has participated in and actively promoted the commodification and the capitalisation of what should be, of what is a fundamental human right. And make no, make no mistake about it, no matter how much the corporations and the developers might tell you differently, housing is a human right. Government after government has enacted policy after policy, driving up prices, driving down availability and refused point blank to invest in what is actually so desperately needed 
in terms of building new social housing to meet the demand that they themselves have created. Now, the, res the response, the reality, the upshot of not policy failure. No, 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 we're not talking about policy failure here. We're talking about policies working as they were designed, driving up costs, driving down affordable affordability, driving people into a public housing system with massive waiting lists. The result of these policies is a broken housing system in Australia. In Western Australia, there are currently 18,000 people on the social housing waiting list, with an average waiting time of over two years, if, that is only if, they are actually able to find a home at all. In a state that has grown by nearly 200,000 people, in the last uh, four years, there are actually 400 fewer housing properties in the public housing system than there were in, in 2018. I'll say that again, 200,000 more people in four years, and yet we currently have 400 fewer homes than we did in 2018. At this current rate of investment and construction, it would take nearly 1,300 years, 1,300 years to accommodate everyone on the social housing waiting list. To put that in perspective, that would take us to the year 3,323. It is the definition of a grossly inadequate system. Not only is the government committed to doing nothing for the tens of thousands of people from Western Australia who need a safe and stable place to live, they are in fact intent on making the problem worse by implementing policies that see housing prices skyrocketing and rental uh, properties becoming impossible to find or indeed to afford. Now, in Perth, uh, the rental availability rate uh, fell to 0.6 per cent. This is the lowest level that it has been at since 1980. In rural Western Australia and regional Western Australia, the situation is even worse. Albany has a vacancy rate of 0.3 per cent. Kalgoorlie has a, a vacancy rate of 0.5 per cent. Now, this has made it unreasonably difficult for renters, especially first-time renters, to actually find a place. A video last month uh, showed a queue of over 100 people at a home open and a housing inspection session in Bentley. Even if you are lucky enough to find a place uh, where you'll be able to stay or you can afford, you'll still be exposed um, to a rental bidding and price gouging, which is absolutely endemic in the system. In the town of, K of Kitanning, uh, for example, um, we've seen rental prices increase by nearly 50 per cent, 50 per cent in the last 12 months. These are all very worrying statistics and behind them sit very real human experiences. Stories like Chloe's, a woman who is in her 30s and who, after being told that her lease was not being renewed, tried everything to find a new rental but could not do so in time. Chloe has been living in her van since October with her daughter, her two dogs and her two cats. Chloe has been on the social housing waiting list for two years. Stories like Jack's who, while overseas, um, was given six days' notice that their landlord would try and raise rent um, in order to, in their words, complete uh, long-overdue uh, rental improvements on the property. 
they were forced to move all their belongings into the basement of their workplace and stay with friends because they simply could not find another place to rent in this broken system. Now, this fear of eviction and of the housing crisis more broadly um, is deep within people. The fear is that they will be thrown uh, as tenants into a situation which places them in a toxic power imbalance, an imbalance that has led some landlords to embody the very worst parts of humanity in how they make an effort to save a few dollars. Landlords who refuse to carry out basic maintenance or work because they know that a renter is more likely to be willing to suffer through bad conditions than risk being evicted. In February, for instance, in Perth, uh, we had two heat waves uh, with temperatures uh, reaching as high uh, into the high 30s um, and going only as low as the low 20s at night. And yet there is no minimum standard that requires a landlord uh, to keep uh, heating and cooling under control in their property or to provide any type of climate control. No requirement in Western Australia during the summer for air conditioning. No requirement in the winter for heating. No requirement for climate resistant housing at all in the middle of a climate crisis. No requirement for anything as simple as insulation. These conditions are not only the cause of discomfort and inconvenience, they pose a serious health risk and safety risk to people. Now, people have shared with me their experience of getting heat stroke simply from making dinner in their house while it is unsafely hot. So many renters are afraid to even make a request for such a basic, basic thing because they are afraid that it will lead them to being evicted on a no-grounds eviction, uh, which is, by the way, still legal in the state of Western Australia. Renters are putting their health at risk because they are afraid that their landlord would rather make an extra 30 bucks a week than do the bare minimum to make their property safe. Now, it is these types of outrageous situations created by this broken system, uh, which is why the Greens are fighting to actually get outcomes uh, for renters and for people needing social housing. It is for people like Chloe and Jack that we are working to make sure that Labour's plan in this space actually delivers what people need. $5 billion investment in social housing, a national plan for a rent freeze, an increase in Commonwealth rental assistance and a $1 billion worth of investment in remote Aboriginal housing. These are the policies which this place must enact to create a reality of a home for everyone. Thank you, Senator Steelejohn. Senator Billick. I've spoken on a number of occasions about issues concerning Australian charities because I'm a strong advocate for charities. Charities and not-for-profits deliver enormous social benefit for local, national and global communities. Without charities, a lot of the work done addressing poverty and social inequality, looking after animal welfare, caring for the natural environment and on a range of other important causes, it simply would not happen. The Australian Charities and Not-for-Profits Commission, or ACNC, has around 60,000 charities on its register. Some of these are separately registered sub-branches of larger organisations, such as the RSL or Surf Life Saving. However, many are small organisations in their own right. One third of charities are cast as very small, with annual revenue of less than $50,000. And it's great to have that diversity in the size of our charities. There is a place for both small charities, which are closer to their local communities, and large charities, which have the scale needed to tackle some of the big global issues. A great example of what can be achieved with the scale of these larger charities is that of Rotary International, which has been instrumental in a global effort to almost completely eradicate polio. 
Australian charities employ around 1.4 million workers, or over 10 per cent of our country's workforce. In 2020, they contributed $176 billion to Australia's gross domestic product, not to mention a great deal of additional social benefit that would not be reflected in the GDP figures. Senator Smith from the opposition and I recently established the Parliamentary Friends of Australian Charitable, Not-for-Profit and Philanthropic Community to promote discussion of some of the emerging challenges charities are facing. We're going through a time where charities are being squeezed from both ends, facing pressures on both demand and supply. The demand for their services is rising in wake of more frequent and intense natural disasters, the result of human injuries to climate change and increases in cost of living pressures for Australian households. At the same time, rates of volunteering are declining. Fundraising has become stalled and the community connectedness that is the glue holding charities together has been steadily declining over decades. These pressures were all exacerbated by the COVID pandemic, where lockdowns and social distancing, while being necessary for the protection of public health, increased financial pressure and social isolation. Many volunteers who were unable to contribute due to the public health restrictions did not return after the restrictions were lifted. The Parliamentary Friendship Group will be having our first event in late March, a presentation and discussion with Philanthropy Australia about polling they commissioned on attitudes to philanthropy and what insights this polling can offer the Australian government's efforts to double giving by 2030. And one of the ways in which we can help charities raise funds is by harmonising charity fundraising laws. This is a subject I've spoken on several times over the years in this place, but for those unfamiliar with this issue, I will just provide some brief background. So before the advent of the digital technology, and those school students up in the gallery won't understand this, um, back in the days when going online meant catching a train, the states and territories developed laws to regulate charitable fundraising. As a legacy of these laws, to raise funds in any state or territory, you need to comply with the relevant law in that jurisdiction and, in most cases, submit a registration to the relevant authority. The problem arises when you have charities raising funds nationally, including those that now raise funds online. You see, funds raised online can be received from anywhere in Australia. So you have to comply with the law in all state and territory jurisdictions, with the exception of the Northern Territory, which doesn't have any charity fundraising laws. In other words, if you want to raise funds nationally, you have to follow seven different sets of laws. You may think it's difficult to comply, but it's actually impossible to comply with because some of these laws are contradictory. This is a red tape nightmare that is costing Australian charities over $15 million a year. And to give you an idea of how undated these laws are, a Senate inquiry into this issue heard that one state still had a law on its statute books that made it an offence to collect money with a tin attached to the end of a pole. Now, this was apparently to prevent the gentry from being harassed by enthusiastic charity collectors tapping on the windows of their carriages. That's how old the law is. In 2018, the Productivity Commission recommended the introduction of a harmonised national charity fundraising law. This was followed up several months later by the Senate Select Committee on Charity Fundraising in the 21st Century, which I chaired, recommending that this important reform be completed within two years. Sadly, the previous government dragged its feet and over the course of four years made very little progress on harmonisation of fundraising law. But I'm pleased to say that the Albanese Labor government is getting on with the job. Our very capable Assistant Minister for Charities, Dr Andrew Lee, is a powerful advocate for charities and his enthusiasm for this reform is producing results. By October last year, Assistant Minister Lee had consulted with the charity sector and made substantial progress on the development of a national framework for charity fundraising laws. In mid-February this year, a meeting of the Commonwealth, State and Territory Treasurers agreed to a set of nationally consistent fundraising principles, finally. 
These principles had been developed by a working group comprising of all the states and territories and informed by stakeholder consultation. The principles will give charities and donors a clear understanding of appropriate conduct while allowing for greater flexibility as to how charities achieve compliance. Each participating jurisdiction will release an implementation plan by July 2023, explaining how it will give effect to the principles through regulatory changes or legislation. So we're on track to get this reform done in a timely manner. And for charities facing the red tape nightmare that come with the current arrangements, it cannot be done too soon. Labor paved the way for this reform by establishing the ACMC, which was always intended to be a one-stop shop for charity registration and regulation. A couple of jurisdictions have since dropped the requirement for charities to obtain a licence if they are already registered with the ACNC, and several have streamed along their reporting requirements, removing the obligation for incorporated associations to report information that has already been reported to the ACNC. So while I'm on the subject of charity fundraising, it's worth reminding Australians that one of the purposes of charity fundraising regulation is to curtail criminal activities such as charity scams. Whether it's through various recent fire and flood disasters or the recent earthquake in Turkey and Syria, many Australians feel motivated to help, and one of the best ways to help is by donating to charity. But unfortunately, there's some very unscrupulous people who prey on our sympathy and our generosity for personal gain. Hundreds of thousands of dollars are being lost every year to charity scams, and that money is not only being stolen from the donors, but also from the important causes to which the donors tried to donate. According to Scamwatch, from the 1st of January to the 25th of September last year, $336,000 was lost to charity scams. Following simple rules would help Australians to ensure that their donated funds are going to genuine charitable work. And that is, look for established registered charities running verified appeals. Check the charity register to see details about a charity's main work. Do not click on links in unsolicited emails and social media posts which may take you to a fake scam website. Find the charity's website in a search engine or on the charity register. Do not give your credit card and bank account details on social media and be cautious if you do so online. If you get a call claiming to be from a charity, say you'll call back. Search the charity register and call back on the number shown there. Always ask for identification from collectors at a shopping centre on the street or at your front door. This advice was issued recently to the public by the ACNC in the wake of the Turkey and Syria earthquake. And it's thanks to the establishment of the ACNC, a great labour initiative of which I am very proud, that we have the charity register and regulation which holds charities accountable for being genuine in meeting their stated charitable aims and responsible with donated funds. We need to promote more awareness of this great resource and the fact that the charity register is publicly publicly available and easily searchable. It's an important weapon in the fight against charity Order, scams Senator and the damage they do to generous and warm. Thank you, Senator McGrath. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I want to speak about the cost of living crisis that all Australians are enduring under this Labor government. Yesterday, as the Reserve Bank raised interest rates for the tenth consecutive time, Labor was busy breaking promises and announcing new taxes. But instead of working with the Reserve Bank to bring down inflation, the government is putting all its energy into breaking election promises and taxing Australians more. So in my travels up and down the coast to Queensland over the last week, people want to know what is Labor doing about the cost of living? Well, Nothing. I'll take the, 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 the comment from um, my, my, my good friend from Victoria. But, but a, a nice lady in Tully said to me, sweet foxtrot alpha. Uh, and I would tend to agree with, with um, my, my good friend from Tully as much as I agree with my good friend from the great state of Victoria, is that Labor are doing nothing about addressing the cost of living. 
Energy bills are soaring. Mortgage payments are rising every month. Rents are increasing. Grocery costs are rising by the day. And Labor's promised real wage increase has not eventuated. Fuelled by Labor's reckless budget, inflation is running out of control in Australia. Power bills skyrocket despite Prime Minister Albanese's promise to cut electricity bills by $275 each year. This is as inflation has begun to decline in similar economies. And just on the $275, Labor promised not once, not twice, but 97 times before the last election that they would cut your power bills by $275. But since the election, you cannot get a Labor minister or a Labor backbencher or an unnamed Labor source even to mention the figure 275. They won't even say two or seven or five because they know that they have broken another election promise. And this is the reality that Australians have to deal with because we're right to wonder, what is Labor going to slug next? because Labor are making it up as they go along. Inside the past three weeks, we've had a Prime Minister who's refused to rule out further changes to your super, a Treasurer refused to rule out changes to negative gearing, a Treasurer also refusing to rule out changes to a capital gains tax, including on the family home, but then a Prime Minister who's then rushed out and said, oh no, we won't touch your house, and then a Treasurer who's come out and stumbled over a few words and then run back into his office. A treasurer of Australia, who is the political love child of Paul Keating and Wayne Swan, a political love child treasurer who is going to give his heroes, his mentors, a run for the money for the title of Australia's worst treasurer, because at the moment it is a close one and two between Paul Keating and Wayne Swan. But I can tell you, the Treasurer Jim Chalmers is coming up the inside straight at a rapid rate of knots at the moment. He's going to overtake them and he's going to get the gold medal for Australia's worst Treasurer in his first term as Treasurer. It is clear that whatever the Prime Minister and Labor say cannot be trusted, despite whatever time of the day they make those particular comments. And just think that since Labor have come into power, the average Australian family are now paying more than $20,000 extra each year on their mortgage. The Prime Minister has no plan to help struggling families. Labor's left-wing policies only continue to worsen the pressure on inflation. Interest rates are now at a level that's not been seen since the nightmare Rudd-Gillard-Rudd years. Sadly, it is clear that Labor would prefer to play politics rather than have the backs of Australians during these tough economic times. The latest national accounts show households are saving just 4.5 per cent of their incomes, down from 7.1 per cent in the September quarter. But instead of acting to ease pressure on inflation, Labor want to raise taxes. Anthony Albanese promised cost of living relief during the election. Remember the figure $275 that he said 97 times? But the reality is that life is only getting harder for families under Labor. And Queenslanders that I speak and listen to are struggling. They know that this federal government doesn't have their back. Two weeks ago, I did politics in the pub in a small community called Glasshouse on the Sunshine Coast. And I was there with the member for Glasshouse, Andrew Powell, the member for Longman, Terry Young, and the member for Fisher, Andrew Wallace. And, and one of the stories I just want to tell everybody about is that, that families are pulling their children out of sport, and in particular this instance was out of soccer, because they can't afford the registration fees for their kids to play soccer on the Sunshine Coast. And this is no, no attack on, on the good people who run soccer in Queensland. This is the realisation that mum and dads across this country, across Queensland, are doing it tough and again are cutting back on their children's sport because they know 
that they've got to make a choice between their children's sport and putting food on the table. And I say to the, the Labor government, shame on you, shame on you. But what do we see also in my home state of Queensland? Reckless spending. Reckless spending on Christmas parties that cost taxpayers $64,000. That's $700 a minute. I'll repeat that for you. $64,000 on a Christmas party, $700 a minute. And who do we see? The Premier of Queensland. The Labor Premier of Queensland, who would spend $64,000 on a Christmas party. A Premier who enjoys the red carpet as much as she enjoys strangling business with red tape. A Premier who spends, I cannot fathom, that you could actually spend $64,000 on a Christmas party. And maybe I come from, from the wrong side of the tracks and, and, and I was raised in a family of, of Cheerios, that's um, Frankfurters um, for, for, you, uh, for you Southerners, where Christmas parties were maybe some prawns, some Cheerios, a bit of rum and coke, I don't know, um, some, some warm white wine, you know, things like that. What, what do you, well, I just don't understand. Was it like caviar? Did they have like, did they get sausages and put caviar on, 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 on the pay for this Christmas party? This is, this, this is something that an Arabian prince would spend on a Christmas party. This is something that, that a billionaire from, from India would spend on a party. Not a Premier of Queensland, a Premier of Queensland with, with the, the snout and the trough, enjoying the good life while Queenslanders are suffering because of the cost of living and because of crime. And I want to talk about crime here in Queensland. And in particular, I want to talk about the introduction of the breach of bail amendment. It is long overdue and there is more work to do. But the Palaszczuk government is lucky that when it comes to certain levels of accountability, they're sort of around there with a the university assignment. Because if they submitted their breach of bail amendment to turn it in, and for you boomers out there, that's a, um, a, a plagiarism checking uh, um, app, device, whatever you want to call it, says the boomer here, it would have returned a 110 per cent plagiarism report. 100 per cent because it was copied word by word from the amendment tabled by David Christofoli, the next Premier of Queensland, in 2021, and 10 per cent more because of their negligence in not providing a bibliography with the LNP's leader in it. But the issue of crime is not going to go away. A good friend of mine, the end of last year, woke up in his home in Ingham because woken up by a torchlight of people in his house robbing him, took his phone, took his wallet, then took his car and tried to run him over, and then his car was found torched a week later in Townsville. This is the reality of Queensland, where people are being robbed in their own homes as they sleep, and yet we have a Premier who spends $64,000 on a Christmas party. Mary Antoinette, if she had her head, would be blushing at the chutzpah of Labor's Premier in Queensland. Senator Hanson. I rise to speak as an Australian, a very concerned Australian, who has been given the privilege and the opportunity to be a representative on the floor of parliament for the people of this nation, especially those voters in Queensland who gave me this opportunity. Many Australians are struggling, as we've heard our previous speakers speak about cost of living. Well, it comes down to governments because you know what? The people of Australia have had a gutful of their politicians, the over-representation. The fact is they keep saying, meeting me in the streets as I walk around or maybe on my Facebook post, what is happening? Why can't we actually get our politicians to understand what is happening out here? Our lives are changing, our standard of living. And it all comes down to what happens in this place. And I'm sick and tired of hearing the buck being passed from one side to the other, who's in government, who's not in government, and not working together for the people of this nation. It's all about your spending. You can't rein in your spending. It is ridiculous. 
If you look at the spending, our welfare social security bill is $228.8 billion. We've got people on lifetime welfare. It's become a way of life, not a helping hand, a way of life. What are you doing about it? There are solutions. How about the solution that people get welfare two out of five years? Hey, guess what? You have to work. It's your responsibility for the roof over your head, food on the table. Let's also look at NDIS. The cost of NDIS is, cost, is costing us more, with about approximately 550,000 people, than what it does for Medicare for the whole of Australia. No one's reining this in. You're allowing people to get payouts, get onto the NDIS. And here we have now just reported 10 per cent, one in 10 boys in Australia are now on NDIS who have been um, reported to have ADHD. How ridiculous. Autism on NDIS. That was not what it was proposed for. It was proposed for people, not with PTSD. This is what we got, chronic illness on NDIS. It is blown out of proportion. We cannot afford it, and it needs to be reined in. But what are you doing about it? Nothing. Even people can get, go to sex workers on the NDIS. Or one client, she actually went to the football match and hired a corporate box at $45,000 paid by the taxpayers on NDIS. Education. What is happening with our children? They are coming out of our schools. They can't read or write. They're not prepared for the workforce, and yet we're not doing anything about it. It's no priority to either side to actually rein it in. Look at the teachers that are coming out of the universities. A lot of them are not up to the standards. We're dropping worldwide in our standards for education, but no one cares about it. Defence. Where is the, our defence? We haven't put the money into it that we need. We know that there are problems on just offshore. We have to be aware of China and how their defence is actually growing. But nothing is we're not taking it seriously of what may happen here. There's talk all the time. In just a few years' time they may attack Taiwan. Now, what are we going to do? Sit back and do nothing? We can't even make enough bullets or ammunition in this country. We do absolutely nothing. You're sitting waiting for an, for a for a submarine, which could take how many decades before we actually get the submarines in this country? We don't support our defence personnel as well. We can't get them to join. Then we've got manufacturing. You haven't done anything about that. You're just going to set up another scheme. I've been on about manufacturing for years. We need to start producing manufacturing our own goods and start importing the cheap products that we are destroying our own jobs in Australia. And all you can go on about Labor is the voice. People are sick and tired of it. What's going to do? How is that going to deal with the cost of living? Absolutely zilch. And with $33 billion a year poured into the Aboriginal industry, nothing's going to help whatsoever. Why don't you be upfront with the people and tell them that you're looking towards an Aboriginal black state in this nation, yeah. a segregation of the white Australians to the black Australians? That's what it's about. People out there want true representation. They want us to actually make the decisions that are going to give them better quality of life, assurances, a future for their kids, not dividing this nation, until we get real representation and people with the guts to stand by their convictions and integrity in this place. I feel sorry for the people of this nation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Senator Ciccone. Thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. Last week I had the pleasure of attending uh, the Australian International Air Show down in Avalon um, in uh, my home state of Victoria, along with uh, many of my other colleagues uh, on the uh, Joint Parliamentary uh, Committee on Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade. Uh, it was an excellent showcase of both current and emerging technologies and capabilities in defence, uh, as well as, if I may, uh, a showcase of how the state of Victoria is also leading uh, our nation in terms of defence capability. The big news of the week, though, was also the announcement from BAE Systems uh, of a new unmanned drone with very much lethal capability. In addition to the impressive technology itself, what I think is particularly noteworthy and why I wanted to raise it here in the Senate is that it was designed by Australians, by Australian engineers and technicians. 
So playing a more of a role in the production of our defence technologies is not some far-off dream. It's actually happening right now in our backyards. And I think we need to do everything that we can as a nation to encourage more of this Australian involvement and investment in this area of policy. Um, and to pick up you know, the comments from Senator Hanson, I think we do need to actually look at and see what is currently happening in this country. And I think most people would be surprised to learn that there is a lot, that there is a lot of investment that is currently occurring in defence procurement and in defence uh, capability manufacturing. So part of this um, uh, exercise uh, is about also supporting the many defence manufacturers in Australia and, and the industry more broadly. That's why the Minister for Defence uh, Industry, uh, Pat Conroy MP, is working on the defence industry development strategy to build Australia's defence industry base. Unfortunately, this task has been made more difficult due to the decline in manufacturing uh, presided over the previous government. But when manufacturers took the Liberals and the Nationals up on their dare to pack up shop, because we all remember when uh, the car manufacturers were told to leave this country, they did so. But the demand, the demand now for advanced manufacturing skills has actually dried up. So we are now in the process of trying to repair that damage, trying to repair and reverse the damage that was done. Australians that were also looking to start or to switch their career were being sent, sadly, a very clear message by the Deng government that there was no future in advanced manufacturing when it came to our defence capability. Now, uh, there may have been some at the time that were persuaded that Australia did not need these skills because we could always purchase these products from overseas manufacturers because it was always cheaper to import rather than to manufacture do domestically. But it is important to look back now and think about the decisions uh, that led to manufacturers departing our shores. Um, and through the, the pandemic, uh, it really did bring home for many of us in this place the need to look at investing in our supply chains, because the unforeseen events that can really rupture those supply chains, both domestically and internationally, were still, and I believe, are still very much scarred for many Australians. Australia was scrapping in the international market for products, and that in the years prior we may have well been able to produce ourselves. The lack of investment in advanced manufacturing research also limited Australia's ability to contribute to the international effort to invent and manufacture vaccines. Of course, pandemics aren't the only things that can disrupt uh, supply chains. And unfortunately, we do live in a world where states who wish to cause damage to Australia may deliberately reduce or cut off the trade of certain goods to our country. This, of course, is of particular concern when it comes to products that we use in defence. And that's why the government, the Albanese government, has acted swiftly to send a very clear message to Australian businesses and workers that we are committed to supporting manufacturing in this country. We are working hard to deliver on our commitment to establish a national reconstruction fund. $15 billion will be invested ac across seven priority areas, including both medical science and defence capability. So when I stand here in front of that new BAA drone, as I did last week, I thought, what a fantastic thing, that it was not just designed here, but there's also a number of components that will be manufactured in Australia. We are a clever country, and with the right support and investment, we can and should see more defence assets being designed and made here in Australia. Senator Cadell. Artificial intelligence, or AI, is a field of computer science that focuses on creating intelligent machines that can perform tasks typically requiring human intelligence, such as problem solving, speech recognition and decision making. While the development of AI has the potential to revolutionise many industries and make our lives easier, there are also many dangers associated with this technology. Okay, One of the main dangers of this AI is the potential for job loss. As machines become more intelligent and capable of performing complex tasks, they will begin to replace human workers in many industries, particularly in those industries that rely heavily on manual labour and repetitive tasks. This has the, the potential to lead to significant job losses and economic disruption, particularly for workers who lack the skills or education needed to adopt to this rapidly changing job market. Another danger of AI is the potential for bias and discrimination. 
AI systems are only as unbiased as the data they are trained on. And that can, if that data is biased or discriminatory, then the AI system may be as well. This can lead to discriminatory outcomes in areas such as hiring, lending and criminal justice, and already exacerbate existing social inequalities. AI also represents a risk to privacy and security. As AI systems become more prevalent, they will generate large amounts of data about individuals and their behaviour, which can be exploited for malicious purposes such as identity theft, blackmail or surveillance. Additionally, the security of AI systems themselves are a concern, as they can be hacked and vulnerable to cyber attacks and the like. But perhaps the greatest danger of AI is the potential for it to surpass human intelligence and become an existential threat to humanity. This scenario, named as the singularity, is a theoretical point in the future where machines become more intelligent than humans and are able to improve their own capabilities at an exponential rate, leading to an unpredictable and potentially catastrophic outcome. While the singularity remains a hypothetical scenario, there are already examples of AI systems behaving in unexpected and potentially dangerous ways. For example, in 2016, Microsoft launched a chatbot named Tay on Twitter. That was designed to learn from its interactions with users. However, within just hours of its launch, Tay began tweeting racist and sexist messages, reflecting the biases of the, those who were interacting with it. To mitigate these dangers, it is important that we develop AI as a responsible and ethical manner. This includes ensuring that AI systems are transparent and accountable so they can understand how the decisions they make and hold them accountable for their actions. It also means ensuring AI systems are trained on diverse and unbiased data and that their outcomes are continually monitored and audited for fairness and accuracy. But ultimately, the development of AI is a complex and multifaceted issue. And there is no one solution that can completely eliminate all the risks associated with the technology. However, by being aware of the potential dangers of AI and taking proactive steps to mitigate them, we can ensure that this technology is used to benefit society in a safe and responsible manner. Now, up until that point, Madam Chair, Acting Deputy Chair, every single word of that speech was written by AI. I simply asked an AI system to write a 500-word speech on the dangers of AI. Now, it wrote 514, so apart from that, it did a pretty good job. And I'm not saying the team of my staff in suite SG108 should be concerned for their future, but the real drama, as pointed out, is that on the potential of input data and bias on this outcome, rubbish in, rubbish out principles, how do we start thinking about the jobs of tomorrow, what that will do and how it will work? What are the areas we need as legislators to be thinking about focusing our education on training on so that we don't train people in jobs that will be replaced? What are the infrastructure and capital investment decisions they need to start planning on and working on now? Any government's first job is to protect its people in all ways, and the use of AI in all aspects of commerce will only increase at an exponential rate. Now, we don't need to start a bunch of training camps to train young John Connors to prepare for a battle against you know, terminators in the future, but we do need to be cognizant that it would be negligent to leave large numbers of Australians exposed to potential replacement with machines and unemployment. The future of this is both exciting and concerning, but we need to remain vigilant, we need to plan and we need to be ready so we can protect our people. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. The inquiry into concussion in sport is groundbreaking. There is a high calibre of witnesses from brain banks to neurologists to ex-AFL and NRL players speaking of their harrowing impacts of concussion and brain injury on people's lives. However, what has been specifically enlightening for me personally is the life-threatening consequences of repeated head trauma. Through this inquiry, it has raised a number of concerns and reliable, credible evidence of the damage to our brains from being concussed. Concussion occurs regularly to women who are subjected to violence. 
I myself know what it's like to be hit in the head a number of times and my teeth broken uh, as a result of family violence and being in violent relationships. A 2018 Brain Injury Australia study revealed 40 per cent of domestic and family violence survivors who attended Victorian hospitals over a 10-year period had sustained a brain injury. Experts are concerned that people who did not seek help for domestic violence over the last few years due to COVID-19 pandemic may be living with unknown brain tra trauma, which can have devastating long-term health consequences if untreated. What support do these women have? I became a politician and could afford to get my teeth fixed. But prior to that, the amount of money it costs for women to repair themselves after violent relationship, it's not there. We have women walking around who've been concussed a number of times by violent partners who still have no teeth. That brings shame, embarrassment. I don't know how many women I've spoken to who cover their mouth to smile because their violent partner knocked them out of their mouth. That is head trauma. And it's a head trauma that I don't think this country is looking into. I understand that concussion in sports is incredibly important to keep our athletes safe. But what this inquiry is highlighting is that women are also at risk of CTE and other kind of brain injuries as a result of being a victim or survivor of family violence. There are a number of measures that would help to address the issue from better screening in all states and territories and clear referral pathways for victim survivors to access safety and support. Importantly, organisations providing culturally safe support services need proper resourcing and funding. We must see victim survivors of domestic and family violence who suffer from head injuries receive the same ongoing care and supports as those who suffer a head injury as a result of a sporting accident. The better we get to understand brain injury and the relationship between family and domestic violence, including amongst First Nations people, the better we can care for our women who experience violence. We need to do more for our women out there who are possibly walking around with undiagnosed brain injury from violence that they've experienced. And there is nothing in this country that looks at this issue. So as a victim survivor who's had repeated head trauma and who knows hundreds of other, particularly black women in this country, who've also experienced head trauma from violent partners, we have to do more because this is generational and it's a sickness that we can help to prevent. Senator Babbitt. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise here today to speak on the dangers, the dangers of the 15-minute city. Now, Victoria, the, the Victorian government has begun pitching a brand new but old idea taken from the playbook of our best mates at the World Economic Forum, the 15-minute city, sometimes called the 20-minute city. You know what? It doesn't matter. It's all the same garbage. Imagine a 15-minute city where you won't need a car, where you won't need to travel much at all, where everything you'll ever need will be provided for you, and it's all within easy reach. So convenient. Sounds great. That's the charm of the new era of soft totalitarianism. It's always for your benefit, and so people willingly, even eagerly, eagerly will agree to be caged. 
Sorry, I didn't mean to use the word caged. Slip of the tongue, that's what it was. Kind of like Klaus Schwab didn't mean to say that the elites are going to push us to a point where we will own nothing, zip nada, and we will be happy because they will own everything and they'll be even happier. Now, that's not a conspiracy theory. It's called servitization. Look it up. I'll give you an example of servitization. Once upon a time, we used to own DVDs. We don't anymore. Now you have a streaming service. You don't own it. Once upon a time, people would easily buy homes. Not anymore. Not like today. Now you're more likely to rent. You don't own it. What about a car? One day you won't own a car. It's all going to be ride share. You don't own it. Someone else owns it. But you'll be happy, though. Now, this 15-minute city, it is not an original thought from our Premier, Premier Daniel Andrews, as if such a thing as an original thought ever existed in a Premier's head. It's a plan parroted straight from the WEF and from the UN and other globalist organisations who have been busy sowing this idea around the world. Now, governments, as an example, in the UK, they've already announced plans to divide cities into separately administered districts, which they claim, they claim will help meet the country's sustainability goals by reducing the needs for citizens to travel. The government will ensure you and your family are well catered for and, of course, well contained, which I suspect is rather more the point, in a tiny precinct that you'll probably never need to leave. Now, the climate emergency, the crisis, the disaster, the catastrophe, or whatever it is they're calling it these days, if it's as bad as the UN would have us believe, then perhaps, perhaps we'll never be allowed to leave our 15-minute zone. Now, I jest, of course. I'm only joking. People will, of course, be allowed to travel outside their allotted 15-minute zone. They will just have to pay a modest toll or a levy in order to leave their district. But other than that, oh, and of course, the surveillance, but other than that, they'll be completely free. Now, some will go ahead and say, oh, it's a conspiracy theory, but it's not, it's not even a theory. It's happening in plain sight for all to see. Just ask the Ask the residents of Oxford in the UK if they think it's a conspiracy theory. They're living in it right now. Now, I remember in 2020 when the media accused everyone that said that the government would use COVID as an excuse to abuse civil liberties was a conspiracy theorist. We all know how that turned out, especially in my home state of Victoria. Now, overlay this 15-minute city with the coming social credit system and the digital ID, just like in Communist China, just like in the CCP, and you can begin to understand what the future might hold if we continue, if we continue to allow things like this to move ahead unabated, unchecked. Now, Victorians, we know all too well what it's like to be constricted and to be locked down in a zone. The government's designed to corral us all into zones no matter, no matter how the supposed benefits are sold, is cynical and it is sinister, and it must be resisted. It must be discussed. It must be considered. To people at home, I say, do not leave your fate in the hands of government because power corrupts. Take an interest in what is happening in your community, in your state. Take an interest in who governs you. Don't just go to the ballot box, tick a box and forget about it. That's not the right way to do it. Thank you. Thanks, Senator. Senator Ayres. Uh, thank you, uh, Acting Deputy Chair. In the few seconds I have left to me, uh, I'm not sure I was going to get an indication. Uh, I would um, firstly, uh, you know, I feel the obligation to apologise really to the people who have to listen to this sort of conspiracy theory, creeping extremism. Uh, dangerous stuff that has been brought into the Senate. But I do want to uh, take this opportunity on International Women's Day to acknowledge the presence in the gallery of uh, Mari Coleman, uh, AOPSM, who is, um, on International Women's Day, uh, a person who has uh, contributed much more than, uh, than many other Australians, uh, has made a remarkable contribution as the first uh, woman to head a statutory authority in Australia's history. Uh, as a long-term campaigner for 
uh, equal pay uh, for equity for Australian women, uh, she, uh, she is very welcome uh, in, uh, in this place, and I'm absolutely delighted to see you. Uh, and, um, I should say, as a Twitter follower of uh, Mari's, she, is, she has been an activist for 60 years, but is very active uh, on Twitter as well. And, and you don't often learn things. You don't often learn things on Twitter, but I learned something uh, from, uh, from Mari Thank Coleman's uh, social media Thank stream. You, so Arias. welcome. Um, Senator McKenzie. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. The crisis is unfolding in the East Kimberley right now as the region is left struggling and stranded because of surrounding floods. In January, the main trade route through the Fitzroy crossing was inundated, and since then the road has been impassable. I'm calling on Minister King to urgently lodge a Section 11 exemption of the Coastal Trading Act 2012 to allow international carriers who are at the ready to bring in the supplies that this community is in desperate need of right now. Allowing international carriers into the region will halve the time that supplies can get into the port of Wyndham and assist communities of Wyndham, of Halls Creek, of Kununurra, in excess of 9,000 Australians who right now have empty supermarket shelves. We're getting the ADF to drop in supplies, and this government has been left asleep at the wheel. This is not some flash flooding event that's just arrived yesterday. The first flooding event was months ago, and now we've got the final route between Taz uh, Northern Territory and WA cut off. And what have they done? They've sat on their hands. Anthony Albanese, when he was the Infrastructure and Transport Minister, exercised this exemption. Barnaby Joyce, under a similar catastrophic event in 2022, exercised this exemption. Catherine King needs to wake up, recognise she can make a difference here to these communities, sign the exemption so they can get fresh food and supplies in, in a sustainable manner. Thank you. Senator Payman. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. The National Week of Action for the Voice to Parliament was from the 18th to the 24th of February. During this week, I attended open days at Edith Cowan University in Joondalup and the University of Western Australia and spoke to students about The Voice. Many students wanted to hear and learn about The Voice or they wanted to express their support for The Voice and ask what they could do to help. I could say that I was surprised, but I wasn't. Young people in this country are progressive, caring and motivated to push for the simple change to our constitution. They understand that this campaign goes beyond politics. It is about setting the foundation for Australia to walk, to walk on a path towards reconciliation with First Nations people together. I told them over the coming months there will be a lot of debate. They will hear a lot of facts, but also a lot of misleading statements. They can help by knowing the facts. The referendum is only about two things. First, the what, to recognise Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in our constitution, and the how, to consult them on matters which affect them. It is a simple change, and explaining this to our friends and family will go a long way to ensuring that when Australians have their say on referendum day, whatever they write on the ballot will be a decision they're making with all the information they need. Acting Deputy President, I support the voice, an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice to Parliament, and so do the young Western Australian students I hear from. Thank you. Senator McKim. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Today, March the 8th, is the anniversary of the declaration of the 1955 Lake Petter National Park. That richly deserved protection for a jewel in the heart of Tasmania's magnificent wilderness was wrongly revoked in 1967 to provide for the flooding of Lake Petter, which occurred in 1972. 
Today is also International Women's Day, an opportunity for us all to reflect on and thank some of the powerful activist women who campaigned to save or restore Lake Pedder over 50 years, including Brenda Heen, Patsy Jones, Hilary Bennell, Patricia Giles, Elspeth Vaughan, Helen G, Melva Tracanis, and so many more. Some of those fantastic women are no longer with us, but two who most certainly are and, in fact, are here today in the gallery, including Tabitha Badger, the terrific Restore Peter campaign coordinator, and the awesome Christine Milne, former senator and leader of the Australian Greens. And I acknowledge Tabitha and Christine and all of the Restore Peter crew who are here today. Restoring rivers and lakes for climate resilience and for biodiversity is gaining pace around the world. Over 1,900 dams have been pulled down in the US and more than 230 in Europe in 2021 alone. Now is the time to invest in decommissioning the high-risk dams which are impounding Lake Pedder. Now is the time for the Australian government to nominate the restoration of Lake Pedder as Australia's flagship project for the United Nations Decade on Ecosystem Restoration. Restoring Lake Pedder would make right a great wrong. That beautiful lake is there today, and now is the time to restore it. Senator O'Sullivan. They say that it takes a village to raise a child, and sadly my village lost one of its greats recently. After a lengthy battle with dementia, Richard Hoogerwerf, surrounded by his loving family, peacefully passed away. During our teenage years, Richard left a profound impression on me and several of my friends, and I seek to pay tribute to him today. Richard and his wife, Margaret, a terrific Australian migrant success story. Together with their two young boys, the Hoogerwerfs migrated to Australia from Durban, South Africa, in the early 80s. Seeing the ever-increasing violence and turmoil in their home country, they longed for a more prosperous and safer life for their family. While Australia gave them that opportunity, the Hoogerwerfs paid back Australia's offerings in spades. At Richard's funeral last Thursday, we learnt about the many acts of service that encompass Richard's life. In fact, the very church in Perth South, where we gathered at, was not only supported by Richard, it started in their home and the very footings of the building's walls were dug by Richard's own hands. Dementia is a horrible disease and it's gripping an increasing number of Australians. And it was heartbreaking to see this disease afflicting Richard, but this did not stop he and Margaret's selfless service. Exemplifying this, Richard and Margaret signed up for a new WA police initiative called Safe and Sound. This is a new service which helps, bring, helps people with cognitive impairments to be found more quickly if they go missing. Now, to assist others, Richard and Margaret fronted an awareness campaign, including agreeing to feature in media stories about the new initiative. It would have been perfectly understandable for them to want to retreat and privately deal with Richard's dementia. But true to form, Richard and his wife continued to put the interests of others ahead of their own. Richard's passing is a great loss, not just for his family, but for the community that he served so well. His life is a testament to the power of community and how individuals can make a profound impact on the lives of others. His memory will live on as an inspiration to all who knew him. Senator Pratt. World Pride Human Rights Conference in Sydney last week. The conference upheld a wide variety uh, of issues, but four key pillars were community and culture, justice and freedom, health and wellbeing, and disability and visibility and inclusion. Our keynote speaker, Victor Madrigal Boloz, the United Nations independent expert on sexual orientation, gender identity, reminded us all that while human beings are all born free and equal in dignity and rights, in many countries LGBTIQA people continue to face persecution simply because of who they are. So today on International Women's Day, I think it's also important to highlight the links between the drivers of gender-based discrimination and violence and the drivers of this same discrimination against LGBTIQ communities. We heard from many speakers, LGBTIQ leaders, ambassadors, parliamentarians, First Nations people, health experts, youth, researchers, rights activists, 
from intersex and trans communities the world over. The trauma that communities have faced in oppressive nations is very real. It's a result of rejection, exclusion, violence and discrimination, worsened by opportunic and opportunistic and deliberate scare campaigns. While we were reminded of how much we still must do, we were heartened by the Australian government's groundbreaking announcements, including the new Equality Fund and the 10-year National Action Plan for the Health and Wellbeing of the LGBTIQ community. I thank Equality Australia for their incredible vision and their success in hosting this conference. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. I just want to raise quickly that we have a huge problem with our medical institutions in this country. We cannot provide the services that Australians truly need through lack of funding, poor policy decisions and um, governments that are completely overrun with putting in place too many bureaucrats, administrators and the money is not getting to uh, where it's needed in the hospitals and the services. What needs to be done is that GPs, we don't have enough GPs coming through the system. We're quite open to bringing in doctors from overseas that have trouble in even speaking English. Why don't we look at getting more GPs through the system? As we have said, you know, for someone to go through the system and become a GP, they have to have 99.5 per cent test. Well, why don't we drop to 95 per cent? Let them go through. They'll be sorted out the wheat from the chaff if they're not up to doing the service. We need more Australians going through and doing the service of becoming doctors. A lot of the GPs now, and I had the medical practice, you know, these um, private practices come to see me today and talking about their concerns. Their funding has not increased over the last 10 years. It has not been indexed. So therefore, they're going backwards in their funding. GPs are not staying in the services. They want to get out. This is another big problem. You need to look at the funding going to these private practices as well, because for 90, 95 per cent of the consultations they do, they only receive 7 per cent of the funding. That can be addressed. You've also got doctors that were signed up on contracts to actually do three years' service for their fees being paid for, given 18 years to do it. Only a few hundred have actually done it. You've got thousands that haven't made the commitment. Why don't we reduce it to seven years? Um, that they need to actually do this. We have to put the monies into the hospital boards, not to the administrators, and let the hospital boards fund themselves, run themselves, and not state governments that are overburdened with administrators and waste of monies that's happening. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, over the last couple of days, there's been a number of stories with regards to autism in the NDIS. And I thought it was time we set, set forward what some, some of the stuff that's misleading and some of the stuff that could be rectified. Initially, we saw the removal of DSM-4 for DSM-5, which saw a number of diagnoses that used to be separate to autism bundled up under the autism umbrella. These were developmental delays like PDD, NOS or global developmental delay. Uh, these are not permanent and lifelong disabilities, but have been bundled up under the NDIS. Uh, we do know that children need some support. The states have vacated the field but they do not need to be on the NDIS for the rest of their lives. And so it is important that we have some sort of subject, uh, objectivity when we look at children that still need to continue post the early childhood stream. Uh, so we do know that lots of these children are coming on with a diagnosis of level two, and how do we determine whether or not that's actually the case? We do actually have tests that are objective, but for some reason the NDIA does not look at implementing them, and these are things that should be looked at and conducted by all diagnosticians. They should be using standardised tests to ensure that we are getting the right children into the scheme, supporting them when they need to be, but also children that do not need to remain on the scheme for the rest of their lives, that there is a transition out. We have the Autism Diagnostic Observation Schedule. We have the Vineland Adaptive Behaviour Scales, and Vineland will look at a child's social interactions and also look at their personal skills, something that they can be supported early but quite often will not need that support moving forward. We have the Mullins Scales of Early Learning. We also have a Preschool Language Scale. These are actually objective tests that will educate and inform parents as to where their child level is, but will also ensure that autism is funded in the right way for those people that actually need it for the rest of their lives because of the severity of the autism and the permanent thank, impairment. Thank you, Senator that is. Hughes. Senator Grogan. Thank you. 
In the last nine months, with strong support from business, industry organisations, investor groups, unions, civil society, state and territory governments, we have increased the ambition. We have increased the ambition to decarbonise our industry, to address climate change, and to put Australia back in the place it needs to be in terms of working towards a better future. Net zero. So many people have committed to net zero, not just us, not just this parliament, not just industry. It is just widespread. We understand, the country understands, that this needs to be done. The problem we face is that to get there, we need the safeguard mechanism, the reforms to the safeguard mechanism that, have, that are about to be introduced need to occur so that we can get there. We can decarbonise our industry while building it for the future so that we can achieve those targets that have passed this parliament are now enshrined in our legislation. But here we are watching two extremes of ideological vandalism. On one side, we have those who say this is not enough. This is not enough, so therefore we will do nothing. And on the other, we have those who say this is too much, therefore we will do nothing. The outcome, whether it is those opposite or those to my right, the outcome will be exactly the same. Nothing, which is exactly what we've had for the last 10 years. So, if you don't want the same result, don't do the same thing again. This is really, really important reform. The world will not end. The sky will not fall in. We must make these changes if we are genuinely to make progress in addressing climate change. Senator Cox. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Two weeks ago, I visited the town of Narrabri, where the traditional owners, environmental groups and others are fighting the Narrabri gas project. I was honoured to spend two days with the traditional owners to learn firsthand about the impacts of this project that will have on their land. The traditional owners strongly oppose this gas project, and so far their opposition has largely gone ignored by Santos. Recently, the National Native Title Tribunal declared that this project go ahead without traditional owner consent. Uh, how this is even possible is beyond me. It flies in the face of the principles of free prior and informed consent and is a devastating outcome for the traditional owners, but we know they will continue to fight this project. This project not only threatens the sacred Pilliga forest, but water supply in the area also. Many communities rely on bore water, especially during the drought. Santos wants to go straight, straight through the Great Artesian Basin to the Gunnedah Basin, beneath where there is currently no connection between those two basins. And the Great Artesian Basin is one of the largest freshwater basins in the world. It is, in fact, the largest in Australia that lies beneath Queensland, the Northern Territory, New South Wales and South Australia. It is a vital resource for 18 Sorry, 180,000 people, 7,600 7, businesses and 120 towns. First Nations communities have relied on this basin for thousands of years and maintain cultural, social and spiritual connections with the springs and their associated ecological communities and landscapes. The Ganada Basin contains water that is older and more toxic, and if the water from this basin was to contaminate the Great Artesian Basin, it would be catastrophic for that region. This project simply cannot go ahead. The risk to the region's water supply and impacts to the Pilliga are too great. And that, not even to mention the fact that we cannot open any more new coal Thank and gas you, projects. Senator, Cox. Senator Babbitt. Thank you. So, Australia, we are an energy rich nation. We are blessed with natural resources such as an abundance of coal. This is what other countries could only dream of. And as a result, we should always have reliable, abundant, and very, very cheap power. If Mr Albanese wants to deliver on his $275 a power bill cut promise, let's add some coal. Now, I recently inspected the Energy Australia power station at Yalorn, a coal-fired power station, of course, in Victoria, a site which provides power to hundreds of thousands of people. Now, that site will be closing in 2028, but instead, instead of building 
a new power station, the green energy movement, would rather we replace this with costly and unpredictable wind and solar alternatives and a big battery, which is estimated to hold enough juice to power homes at night for only several hours. Rubbish! This is obviously not going to be enough, and it is unlikely to meet our power needs into the future. We need sufficient electricity to keep homes and businesses running and powered up 24-7. The movement towards wind, which is useless when the wind is not blowing, obviously, and solar, which is useless at night when it's, or when it's overcast, is going to result in more expensive and less reliable power. Now, I have been speaking in this place time and time again about the importance of reliable and efficient future-proof technology. We need to move away from this fantasy of net zero. But if the government is so hell-bent on shutting down coal power, then we should at least investigate modern nuclear technology, which can and will, and will provide steady and reliable power into the future to keep our lights on and keep our manufacturing going. Thank you. Senator Rustin. Thank you. Um, today I wanted to briefly speak um, about some amazing women today on International Women's Day. The first person I'd like to acknowledge is Nicole Millis, who is the CEO of Rare Voices Australia, somebody who advocates on behalf of uh, many, many Australians who live with over 7,000 different types of rare uh, diseases. Um, and she advocates on their behalf because we must ensure that not only do we have a clinical response uh, when we're dealing with these rare diseases, but we also need to make sure we have a personal response. And Nicole is the voice of so many Australians who haven't got the access or the ability to have voices of their own. But I also wanted to acknowledge Renee, who spoke today at an event. Renee lives with a rare disease and wanted to acknowledge her extraordinary bravery in standing in front of a huge crowd and telling her personal story, something that cannot possibly have been easy. I also want to acknowledge all of the carers of Australia, who so many of them are women. Um, I had the privilege a couple of weeks ago of visiting the York Peninsula, uh, and I met with the York Peninsula Leisure Options, which is a community group that looks after a number of uh, young people uh, who live um, either with um, age-related health issues or people with disability. And I want to say thank you to Tanya, Jamie and Eleni for the amazing work they do. And I want a big shout out to Jared, who gave me a spin in his, uh, in his push chair, to Kane, who cooked steak for everyone for lunch, to Jess, who has the most unforgettable smile, to Emily, who's the queen of the woodshed, uh, to super cheeky Clayton, to Wayne, the snake charmer, to Georgie, who does the most incredible crochet work, and to Robbie, I hope you eventually got that letter back from your sister, Pat. So I just wanted to say today to acknowledge the amazing women who do so much for our country, the amazing women that often go unrecognised, uh, and to say a huge thank you for them for what they do, the support they give so many people in our country that need their support. So thank you to you all. Senator Terrell. Thank you, Acting Deputy. The Labor government says they have a commitment, a commitment to Australian manufacturing and making things here. The former Liberal government said the same thing. Well, I have to ask how that's going after a recent decision from the Department of Defence. They're giving a tender to create ration packs for the Australian Defence Force to a New Zealand company. Again. It was a contract worth $259 million, and we've sent that money across the ditch instead of investing it here. The Defence Minister says that because of our economic relations treaty with New Zealand, they have to treat New Zealand companies as Australian companies for tenders. I'm all for being friendly with our Kiwi neighbours. I think I even said that a little bit, Kiwi. But to be honest, that doesn't really make any sense. Why would we send $259 million of your taxpayer money to New Zealand when it could be spent on Aussie companies? It could be invested here in Aussie jobs. It might have been fine back in the 80s, but we saw what happened during the pandemic. We know that we need to shore up sovereign control of foreign supply chains. We've got businesses in our own backyard that can do this, and I know where I'd prefer my money to go. A Tassie company was part of a group who put their hand up for the job. I visited Forager Foods at their factory last year and talked with them about what this could mean for their company, the kind of job opportunities it could create for Tasmanians. I'm completely gutted for them. I'm gutted for the Tassie farmers who have lost a market selling food to our soldiers. This contract would have invested 12 to 15 million per year into Tasmania. The Make Things Here in Australia line is a great slogan for governments to bring out at election time, but I'm not seeing it backed up by decisions made by bureaucrats in the Canberra bubble. You know, for companies like Forager Foods in Tasmania, 
This decision could have made a huge difference. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. For International Women's Day, I'm going to talk about my great-grandmother, Nan Edna Brown, a beloved elder who gave dignity to others. A Gunditjmara elder, born in Hamilton, Victoria in 1916, Nan was raised by her parents George Clark and Mary Ann Nee Lovett McLennan on Framlingham Aboriginal Reserve, where you used to round us up. Our family, including Nan's four siblings, survived mainly on what the land could provide. Nan used to go fetch water from the river and walk two miles to school. In 1932, at the height of the Great Depression, 15-year-old Nan Edna and her dad jumped on the back of a truck and left Framlingham oppressive regime uh, ran by missionaries. And the government policy of the day was to assimilate our people who had mixed heritage, a little bit of white blood, and it's like, go and assimilate them. So my grandmother, great grandmother, was subjected to that. Uh, we still, still see that happening in this country today. This, of course, is also part of the colonial plan to wipe us out. My great grandmother's legacy and love lives within her children, grandchildren, and great grandchildren. She was a driving force in the 1960s and set up the Aboriginal Funeral Fund, our first Aboriginal funeral fund in Victoria, because our people were being buried as paupers. Nan helped her daughter establish the first Aboriginal health service in Victoria. And Nan also helped Aunty Iris Lovett Gardner establish the first Aboriginal Community Elders Service in Victoria. And Nan Edna was also the 1986 National NAIDOC Aboriginal Person of the Year. So I come from good stock, I come from strong matriarchal line, and I'm here for a lot longer, so thanks, get used to it. Thanks, Senator Thorpe. Senator Bragg. Oh, thank you very much. Well, it's very important that our corporate regulator is respected and feared. And I regret to say that in recent weeks, the Australian Securities and Investments Commission has not performed particularly well. On 16 February this year, uh, I asked ASIC a series of questions about an investigation into a commissioner, uh, which ASIC initially sought to cover up and then came clean on in the same bizarre and shambolic <laughs> estimates hearing. Uh, we then called ASIC back for a second attempt to try and get to the bottom of this situation, and ASIC was able to provide some more information in the form of a letter from the Treasury Secretary Stephen Kennedy to the chair of ASIC setting out that there had been an investigation uh, into a commissioner. Now, uh, the, the chair of ASIC and the deputy chair of ASIC have different views about the contents of that particular investigation. The chair says the findings were mixed. The deputy chair says that they contained no adverse findings. Uh, given that $200,000 of taxpayer funds have been spent to investigate this particular commissioner, uh, it's very important that we understand what exactly has happened here, because it's critical that the corporate regulator is beyond reproach, that its own corporate governance be second to none. And I wanted to thank the Senate very much for supporting the motion yesterday that ASIC is required to supply that report by midday tomorrow. Now, that report may, came back, may, may come back with redactions to protect personal privacy, but it must contain the recommendations and the findings that were made by the $200,000 report commissioned by the Treasury. So I wanted to thank the Senate very much for standing up for transparency and good, good governance uh, in the case of our corporate regulator, which is very important. Senator Wong. As we mark International Women's Day, we also commemorate 50 years since a woman was first appointed to lead an Australian government agency, and we celebrate her 90th birthday as well, and I welcome Mari Coleman to the Senate. Mari's effectiveness as head of the Victorian Council of Social Service saw the Whitlam government appoint her to lead the newly created Social Welfare Commission. She was then director of the Office of Childcare under the Fraser government, achieving major expansions in childcare. 
Establishing the National Foundation of Australian Women, she campaigned unremittingly for paid parental leave. She deployed her experience navigating government to, to secure a Productivity Commission referral, shifting perceptions of paid parental leave as a social welfare issue to a, its correct framing as an economic reform. This strategy was decisive in the Labor government of which I was a part, legislating paid parental leave in 2010. Senator Barbara Pocock, who with academic colleagues also played a role, and I'm grateful she could join me in recognising Mari's contribution here today. Those of us who have been the first to something must always be mindful of ensuring we are not the last. Mari Coleman lives by that. She has supported women to build on what she started. She is a generous mentor to many, including to me in my early years here. She is someone whose work has benefited all Australian women, someone of whom we can truly say, because of her, we can. So, Mari, thank you for a lifetime struggle for all of us. You deserve a much longer tribute, but for now I wish you joyous celebrations of your 90th birthday and many happy returns yet. It being uh, two o'clock, we now move to question time and I'll call Senator Payne. Thank you, Madam President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. Minister, how many funds subject to Labor's doubling of the super tax are self-managed super funds? Very good question. Minister. Uh, thank you, um, President. I thank Senator Payne for the question. I'm not sure I have the exact number with me. I will come back to the Senate uh, with it, but as I've said a number of times uh, this week, we expect uh, the very modest change that we have made, or that we have announced in relation to um, lowering the concessional rate um, for, for tax concessions for balances over three million, will affect around 80,000 individuals. When it, is, when it comes into effect, and of that, there is certainly a, a proportion of the, that which are self-managed super funds. I'll see if I can find the exact number for Senator Payne uh, during question time today. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Senator Payne, first supplementary. Thank you, Madam President. Minister, can you categorically rule out any further changes by this government in this parliament to the taxation or regulation of self-managed super funds? Minister. Uh, thank you. Well, the government's made clear that this is the only change to superannuation taxation uh, during this term, and this this change won't actually won't actually come into effect until after the next election, uh, which is something which is something those opposite who are dying in the ditch on on this issue uh, don't take into account. We have made a very modest change. A very modest change. I've already um, answered Minister the question, Gallagher, Senator Birmingham. Please, if you were listening, um, Minister Gallagher, please, please resume. Order. Order. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, President. Uh, point of order on reference, and uh, and I've been attempting to listen uh, carefully to Senator Gallagher and her uh, response to what is a prospective question about the government ruling out any further changes appears to be hinging on the change they are currently making. I invite you to draw Senator Gallagher to the question about the government clearly ruling out any further changes affecting self-managed superannuation funds. You, Senator Birmingham, I have been listening and I believe that the minister is being relevant and I'll invite her to continue. If you had listened, I had said very clearly if if, if I if you'd listened, I said very clearly that the government has made it clear that this is the only change to superannuation taxation arrangements that we are making this term, and this one, this one, won't come into effect until after the next election. We have been clear about that. This is a very modest change to a very small number of people who are fortunate enough to have three million dollars in their superannuation account. Thank you, Minister. Account. Your time for answering has expired. Senator Payne, second supplementary. Thank you, Madam President. So, Minister, having now broken Mr Albanese's election promise to not change taxes on superannuation and launched an assault targeted at self-managed superannuation funds, why should any Australian trust Labor not to further hike taxes or undermine choice in superannuation? Minister. Thank you very much. Um, 
We are upfront about the challenges we've inherited. We have made a very modest change, a very modest change to a small number of people with superannuation balances in excess of $3 million. The average superannuation balance on International Women's Day in this country for women is $140,000. $140,000. Women retire with less savings Minister, in their super. Minister, they have less assets. They Minister earn Gallagher, less, please resume and you your seat. Minister, please resume your seat. I'm waiting for quiet on my left. Minister, please continue. Um, so I'm just going to go to Senator Wong, who needs to advise of some ministerial arrangements. Min uh, Senator yes, Wong. I apologise. I was so taken away with saying happy birthday to Murray Coleman, I forgot to actually give the statement by leave concerning ministerial arrangements. So I seek leave to make a statement concerning ministerial arrangements. Leave's granted. Thank you. Leave is granted. I advised. <laughs> Uh, I advise changes to ministerial arrangements that, Sen and Sen that Senator Farrell will be absent from question time uh, today and tomorrow on account of ministerial business overseas, and in his absence, ministers will represent portfolios in accordance with a letter that has been circulated to president, the president, party leaders and independent senators. Thank you, um, Senator Wong. Just while we've got this break, I draw to the attention of honourable senators the presence in the gallery of a parliamentary delegation from Mongolia led by Mongolia's Minister for Education and Science, His, Excel His Excellency Inkam Galan, and the Ambassador of Mongolia to Australia, His Excellency Dava Seren, and the Mongolian delegation. On behalf of all senators, I wish you a warm welcome to Australia and, in particular, the Senate. <laughs> Senator Walsh. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister for Women, Senator Gallagher. On International Women's Day, we look at how far we've come and where we're heading. Can the minister outline what's next on the Albanese government's agenda for women? Uh, Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, President. I thank Senator Walsh for the question and for her long-standing uh, work in supporting um, women, particularly those on low incomes um, in this country over many, many years. And I would, on International Women's Day, also like to associate myself with the other uh, comments and remarks made about Mari Coleman, who I acknowledge in the chamber today, who um, seems to have been a mentor and someone many of us have looked up to in this place. And it's a real privilege for me uh, to, to be here as Minister for Women in a government that's pursuing many of the issues that Mari and her, her colleagues um, have campaigned uh, for for many years. And this is a government that puts women at the centre. Um, I acknowledge all the women colleagues in this place and all the, the women parliamentarians who have come before us. Over the years, Australia has made great progress advancing the status of women, but in a number of areas, progress is slowing or stalled. This government is working hard to put us on the path to achieving a better future for women in Australia. We're developing a national strategy to achieve gender equality, to help make Australia one of the best countries in the world for equality between men and women. And this government is listening to women. We don't want to guess what life is like for women of all backgrounds. We want to know and listen and hear from them. Today we launched public consultation on the strategy, including a survey and other materials to support individuals, communities and organisations to contribute to that strategy. We want to hear from Australians from all walks of life, especially women and girls, about what it's like in the areas of care, work, economic security, safety, healthy, uh, health and beyond. We want this to be a national and respectful conversation, and today I've written to all my colleagues in this place to invite you to be part of this important national discussion in your electorates and in your communities. Thank you, Minister. Senator Walsh, first supplementary. Thank you, President. Can the minister outline what the government has already achieved for women since being elected last May? Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you very much, President. I thank Senator Walsh for the question. Uh, we've been delivering on our commitments we took to the last election um, since coming to government in May 2022 through policies like investments in our cheaper childcare, 10 days paid family and domestic violence leave, boosting and expanding the par paid parental leave, gender responsive budgeting and the first budget in nearly a decade that cast a gendered lens over the budget, the national plan, signing off the national plan with states and territories to end violence against women and children with a record $1.7 billion to implement the plan, 
supporting a wage increase for aged care workers, where over 90 per cent of workers are women. We've also, my colleague in the other place, uh, has established a National Women's Health Advisory Council to improve our health system and how it responds to women and girls. We've got funding and legislation to implement all 55 re recommendations of the ex respective work report, and we've introduced a bill to close the gender pay gap. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Senator Walsh, second supplementary. Thank you, President. We know that some women experience greater inequality. Can the minister update us on how the government is ensuring no women are left behind? Minister Gallagher. Thank you, President. I thank uh, Senator Walsh for the supplementary. We know that some women face additional barriers that intersect with and compound their experience of gender inequality. The consultation launched today seeks feedback from all women, and we're committed to shining a light on where we need to improve and where we need uh, better data. The report card, which has also been released today, is a step forward in that. We would be doing that every year and we will be held to account and measuring our progress through that. We're working in partnership with First Nations communities to develop an action plan as well as a standalone First Nations plan on family violence. This will build on the $424 million in additional funding for the Closing the Gap implementation plan, which was committed last month. And there were also additional investments in the October budget directly to support First Nations people and First Nations women. And in shining a voice to Parliament will help ensure that First Nations women's voices are raised and heard on the policies that affect them and their communities. Thank you, Minister. Senator Chandler. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. How should Australian companies pay frank dividends during periods when they are raising capital under the government's franking reforms? Question. Minister. <coughs> the question on everyone's lips out there. This is another one that um, this is another one that the opposition are opposed to. That we inherited a budget. We inherited a budget with a fifty billion dollar structural deficit, with pressures coming to us, a trillion dollars of Liberal Party debt, debt that had doubled before the uh, pandemic hit. This is the budget we inherited. And all of the very modest changes that we're doing, including closing some tax loopholes and protecting the integrity of the tax system <laughs> through the changing, changes we're making to frank dividends, even that, even that you are opposed to, something that raises a very modest $200 million uh, when implemented. Again, the no coalition with their head in the sand. They want they don't want to pay for anything. They don't want budget repair. They don't want to fix the energy crisis. They don't want to support uh, energy power bill reliefs. They don't want to support housing for women. They don't uh, want Minister, to support Aussie you jobs. Your seat. Um, Senator Chandler. Um, President, the point of order is relevant. It was a very specific question. The minister has been responding for a minute and two seconds, and I would like her to be relevant to the question that I asked. Uh, thank you. The minister is being relevant, and I'll listen to make sure the rest of the question is answered. Senator Wong, did you, are you seeing oh, your You've point? ruled, so thank I don't you. need to make um, Minister Gallagher. Well, the changes to franking dividends the, cha the changing to franking credits um, through uh, the off-market share buybacks uh, arrangement uh, and the capital raising measure, which you guys actually announced and never, never implemented, another Order. one, raise it, put it in there, never do it, uh, to ensure the integrity of the tax system and to close off loopholes. It's a reasonable, rational, measured response that assists very small with budget repair. With budget repair, well, you you are opposed to it, okay? So we are we we will continue on without you. Two hundred million dollars it raises. Um, Minister, please resume your seat. Senator Birmingham. President, and this was quite a precise question with a direct uh, direct point made by Senator Chandler, asking about how Australian companies will pay franking dividends during periods they are raising capital. I would ask you to invite the minister, in the interest of direct relevance, to turn to the issue of companies raising capital under these reforms and how they are impacted. Uh, thank you, Senator Birmingham. Senator Wong. Uh, well, the minister is actually discussing the very policy reform that Senator Chandler asked about. So I'd submit to you that is clearly directly relevant. Uh, 
Thank you, Senator Wong. Order. Order. I do believe that uh, the minister is being relevant, um, so I'll I invite her to continue. Minister. Well, I've answered the question, and those I have. It's the off-share, off-market share buyback please arrangement. Your seat. Please resume your seat. Min minister, I've asked you to resume your seat. I'm asking for order, particularly on my left. Minister, please continue. Thank you. The measure will align off-market share buybacks with on-market share buybacks, which I think is a sensible, rational tax integrity measure that raises a very modest amount of revenue and assists Thank you, with Minister. budget the repair. Time has expired. Uh, Senator Chandler, first supplementary. Thank you, President. How does the minister explain the wording in the explanatory memorandum attached to the franking credit reforms that, and I quote, if an entity has never previously made a distribution, then the entity will not have a practice of making distributions. Minister. Well, I haven't seen where, I haven't got the explanatory memorandum uh, before me, um, and I would wonder if I would want to see the context with which that was set. Like, I mean, you're opposed to the reform. You're trying to blow it into something that it isn't. Oh, no. And, well, I'll have a look at the explanatory memorandum and see the context with. Wait, see the Minister, please resume your seat. Order, order, Senator Wong. Senator Wong. Minister, please continue. I'm happy to look at the explanatory memorandum. I don't have it before me right now, but I do support closing off a tax loophole. And, and ensuring the integrity of our taxation system, um, something that senators in this place used to have an interest in. But we don't expect any of that from the no coalition that are going to say no to everything, no to absolutely everything, including sensible budget repair measures. Uh, you were budget vandals when you're in government, and you're going to continue on with the vandalism from opposition. Thank you, Minister. Senator Chandler. Uh, Senator, Hume, I, Senator Hume, I have a senator on her feet, and you are calling out. Uh, senator Hume, I'm not inviting you to answer and argue back. I'm simply calling you to order. Senator Chandler. There's no fun allowed. Thank you, here. thank you, President. <clears throat> Just like superannuation, Labor repeatedly promised not to make any changes to franking credits if they won government. The Prime Minister stated that, and again I quote, Labor has heard the message clearly and we will not be taking any changes to franking credits to the next election. Yeah. Given Mr Albanese promised no changes to franking credits prior to the election and is now doing the opposite in government, why should any Australian like trust Labor the not to make like further to tax grabs on their order. savings or order. investments? Order. Uh, order. A Senator Hughes, I've called you to order. And Senator McGrath. Minister, please answer the question. Yes, thank you. Well, Senator Chandler's question is wrong. This change does not uh, involve any change to franking credits or dividend imputations, and you know it. You know it. But it doesn't suit your narrative. It doesn't suit your narrative. So now we know that you're opposed to everything. You're also opposed to Order. tax integrity. You're, in close, you're opposed to closing off tax loopholes. We can add that to the list of things that you don't, you don't agree with. So no to housing for women and children escaping domestic violence. No to uh, jobs in the no, manufacturing no, sector. No, no to energy power no, bill relief. And now, no to tax integrity and no to closing off tax loopholes. What please, do you stand for? Minister, Absolutely please nothing. Your seat. Order on my right and left. Minister, please continue. I think I'm finished. <laughs> Senator Waters. Thanks very much. Our President, can I first acknowledge it's International Women's Day. Happy International Women's Day to all. Um, and to Murray Coleman, who's no longer in the chamber but whose presence um, is felt uh, and will be for many years. Uh, so today is International Women's Day and we don't want cupcakes, we want equality. We want investment in women's safety, health and economic security. The government says it would love to do more if it wasn't Senator for a tight Waters, budget. Um, Senator Waters, you haven't addressed your question. 
You are so right. Maybe I needed to eat some of those cupcakes after all. <laughs> My question is to the minister representing herself, the Minister for Women, Minister Gallagher. Happy International Women's Day. The government says it would love to do more if it wasn't for a tight budget, yet you've refused to scrap the stage three tax cuts that would give the balance sheet an extra $254 billion. The women's safety sector has said that $1 billion a year is what's needed to meet demand for frontline services and so that no women or children have to be turned away when they seek help. Will the government commit to that level of funding to keep women safe? Thank you, Senator Waters. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, President. I thank uh, Senator Waters for the question and I acknowledge her, um, her work and interests in the area of women's policy over a number of years. Um, and in, specifically in response to the question she uh, raises with me, we are very conscious of the need to continue to invest in uh, the national plan to end violence against women and their children and the services and systems that support the implementation of those, that plan, including uh, for First Nations women uh, through their own uh, plan and action plan that sits a, a, a alongside of that. We are and we have, um, I think, since coming to government, um, put our money where our mouth is on that and made some investments in October. I'm working with the minister with responsibility for uh, ending violence against women and children, or the minister with responsibility for women's safety and her assistant minister, uh, to look at further measures that we can support uh, in the upcoming budget. Um, they're currently you know, being considered by government, and we are aware of uh, the calls from the sector around the additional money that's required. And these are some of the difficult decisions that you know, I've been trying to, to school those opposite on about how we make room for the services and, and supports we need in areas like ending violence against women and children, whilst they're arguing to maintain those um, high levels of concessionality for um, superannuation account holders with more than $3 million in it. I mean, these are the difficult choices before government. We're making those choices, but I can guarantee that we are continuing to focus on making sure that we can make an actual difference in the lives of women in this country, particularly vulnerable women and women who experience uh, violence as part of their family and, uh, and, um, and how we support Thank you, children Minister. through the that as well. Thank you, Minister. has expired. Senator Waters, first supplementary. Thanks, President. Paying superannuation on paid parental leave would cost around $200 million. Why won't the government prioritise closing the superannuation pay gap rather than turbocharging inequality by giving rich white men more in tax handouts? Uh, thank you, Senator Waters. Minister. Uh, thank you, President. And, uh, the Senator Waters raises a, a very important uh, issue, which is the inequity that exists in the superannuation system uh, for women. Um, we know that uh, women retire with less uh, money than men, considerably less money than men. We know that the average super balance for women in this country, I can see those who are so interested in super a second ago all of a sudden aren't interested anymore, is $140,000. Well, I mean, okay, okay, there we are. They're awake now. They're awake now. $140,000 that the average female super balance is in this country. We don't hear you shouting about that. The reform. We would. Order. Sorry. On both sides of the we, chamber. We. Sorry. We will. We do. We've made it clear we want to pay PPL. Uh, Senator super on PPL. And it's something Payne. that we are finding want to find room in the budget to do, and when we can afford it, we will do it. Thank you, uh, Senator Waters. Second supplementary. Thank you, President. Homelessness and housing insecurity are at crisis levels, and the fastest-growing cohort of people at risk of homelessness is women over the age of 45. It's not over 55 anymore; it's over 45 post-COVID. How many new affordable homes could be built with the $254 billion that you're intending and in giving in tax cuts to rich white men? Uh, Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, uh, President. Well, 
Um, we agree that accommodation and, and a greater supply of a social and affordable and crisis housing actually is required to address uh, the needs of women across the country. Um, we are negotiating with the states and territories under a new homelessness and housing agreement that's being led by um, Julie Collins and we're in from the other place and we are also determined to get our Housing Australia Future Fund up. Um, that, that fund if established, would be an enduring and ongoing fund that allocates thousands, 30,000 social and affordable housing, of which a proportion would be dedicated to Senator women, Rustin. including uh, women with children escaping violence. So I would urge people in this place, if they care about that, even if it's not exactly the model that they would choose to do, support it because this is what we will use to get more housing on the ground for women in Thank those areas. Thank you. Area time has expired. Senator Green. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Wong. Noting that today is International Women's Day, could the minister update the Senate on the situation facing women and girls in Iran and Afghanistan? Minister Wong. Thank you, and I thank Senator Green for her question and for her uh, continued work not, uh, for equality at home and beyond our shores. The UN has described the status of women and girls in Iran as that of second-class citizens. Discrimination is entrenched in Iranian law and practice. But the women of Iran have not been cowed. Instead, these courageous women and girls and their allies have been at the front, forefront of protests, shouting, women, life, freedom and the Australian government stands with them. We have called out Iran for its systematic discrimination against women and girls, most recently at the Human Rights Council last week. We have imposed sanctions on Iranians and Iranian entities involved in the violent crackdown of protesters. We stand too with the women of Afghanistan, where women's rights have been going backwards under the Taliban. The UN has found that the Taliban's treatment of women and girls may even amount to a crime against humanity. Women have been banned from attending university and girls from secondary education. Their movements and access to employment have been restricted. Sexual and gender-based violence have increased. So Australia is supporting the United Nations to provide health facilities and professionals to deliver reproductive health, counselling and protection services to vulnerable Afghan women and children. And last year, we supported the World Food Programme to provide food assistance to over 12 million women and girls. And Australia and others have supported our partners to deliver life-saving health care, shelter, education, nutrition, protection and cash assistance. There are many places in the world where we need to continue to work uh, with the brave women and men who seek for, to improve the position of women and girls in societies where they are regrettably and sadly treated in these ways. Thank you, Senator Wong. Uh, Senator Green, first supplementary. Thank you, President. Uh, could the minister update the Senate on progress toward gender equality globally? Minister Wong. Unfortunately, it's not just Iran and Afghanistan. Women are facing setbacks around the world. The World Economic Forum uh, has estimated that at the current rate of progress, it will take, wait for it, 132 years to, to reach full parity. 132 years on current trajectory for there to be full parity between men and women. And we also know that the crises of COVID-19, climate disruption and food shortages have hurt women and girls more. They have amplified existing inequalities, including gender equality. According to the WEF, we saw a generational loss of gains towards gender parity between 2020 and 21, a documented step backwards in rates of livelihoods and poverty. And Care Australia has estimated that 150 million more women than men uh, are affected by food insecurity. We've seen documented declines in leadership Thank you, Senator and Wong. representation. Thank you, Senator Wong. The time for answering has expired. Senator Green, second supplementary. Thank you, President. Minister, what is the Albanese government doing to address global gender inequality and improve outcomes for women and girls? Minister. Uh, the developments I have outlined are troubling, I, I think, to everyone in this chamber, and they remind us how much work there is to be done. But the Albanese government is acting. 
In our development program, we, are, we have reinstated a performance target requiring 80 per cent of Australia's investments effectively address requiring that 80 per cent of Australia's investments effectively address gender equality in implementation. Uh, we have also introduced a mandatory requirement that our ODA investments over $3 million have a gender equality objective. And in 2022-23, we will pro provide $65 million through the Gender Equality Fund to respond to the needs, interests and rights of diverse women and girls, particularly in the Indo-Pacific region. We have a steadfast commitment to advancing gender equality and the human rights of women and girls at home, in our region and globally. As I've said before, we take the world as it is, but we have to work to shape it for the better. Thank you, Minister. Senator Hanson. Thank you, Madam President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Wong. Does the Albanese government support the establishment of a sovereign, independent, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander nation in Australia? Yes or no? Thank you, Senator Hanson. Minister Wong. The, I think, I, think I'm, I, I understand the motivation behind Senator Hanson's question, uh, and you will know, of course, that um, the issue of sovereignty is something that uh, First Nations people, including in this place, have asserted very clearly. Uh, and you, you would have heard you know, Senator Stewart and others talk about uh, um, the, the First Nations not having ceded their sovereignty. But if the question goes to two nations, uh, we, are, we, are, we are the nation of Australia. Uh, and what we seek to do uh, through the Uluru Statement from the Heart, uh, Voice, Treaty and Truth, uh, is to deal with the reality of our past, uh, to reconcile and to move forward together uh, through those three processes, mechanisms, reforms, a voice first, uh, but also treaty and, and, and Makarata. Uh, Senator Hanson, first supplementary. Well, on that one, I don't feel I've really got an answer whether it was a yes or a no. I understand what you're saying about the um, Uluru Statement. Does the Albanese government consider that all Australians, regardless of race, share sovereignty over Australia and its territories, <laughs> yes or no? Thank you, Senator Hanson. Minister Wong. With, with respect, Senator Hanson, I understand the motivation behind that question. And, uh, uh, I would uh, say to you I think that, that, that the way that's phrased uh, is a question that seeks to divide us. Uh, you, know, you and I both know uh, we are all Australian citizens, uh, but we do have unfinished business when it comes to our First Nations people. Uh, uh, we do have uh, a road that we have to walk as a country to bring us together, uh, and I don't believe uh, that road can be walked in good faith uh, if we if we start to try and divide people in the way that I, I think your question is seeking to do, Senator. Now you're entitled to your views, uh, but what I would say to you is that we are all Australian citizens. Some of us come. We are all Australian. Oh, order, Senator Thorpe. We are all Australian citizens, uh, but uh, there, are, uh, there is work that needs to be done to recognise the place of our First Nations people uh, in our but constitution and in our society. Thank you, Minister. The time for answering has expired. Senator Hanson, second supplementary. Senator Wong, I have never been trying to. I've never tried to um, segregate or divide this nation. I've is only there a called question, for equality Senator Hanson? ever Senator since Hanson, I came into Parliament. A question. My question is. Does the Albanese government support the principle that joke. all Australians should be equally supported according to need, not race? Yes or no? Minister Wong. Uh, Senator Hanson, uh, I think uh, in order to ensure equality that governments need to recognise that some people have not and are not treated equally in great part because of their race. And you only need to look at the history of our First Nations people to recognise that. So yes, sometimes equality does require uh, that we recognise the way in which race has impacted upon the equality of some of our peoples. And I do not think that is a bad thing. I think that is a, that is, uh, a, um, a principle of inclusion, not of separation and not of discrimination, but a principle of inclusion, acceptance and respect. 
Thank you, Senator Wong. Senator Davey. Thank you very much. My question is to the minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. Um, National Transport Commission data shows our truck user would pay an additional $2.6 billion in taxes and charges over three years under the proposed consider considered by Transport Minister Catherine King. Everything Australians grow on farm or they make in a factory or they buy in a shop has to travel by truck. So will these extra taxes and charges add to inflation and make a difficult inflationary situation even worse? Thank you, Senator Davey. Minister Gallagher. I think uh, Senator Davey is talking about the heavy vehicle road user charges. Is that correct? Yep. Um, so any decision to increase heavy vehicle charges is a collective decision of all state and territory governments and no decision has been taken yet. Um, those charges are intended to recover the heavy vehicle share of road expenditure by all governments and the principle that heavy vehicle operators should continue their share towards the cost of roads is shared by government and industry. At the previous infrastructure and transport ministers' meetings, ministers agreed in principle across all governments to a three-year charging cycle following calls from industry for longer-term certainty but no final decision has been reached on these charges. In response to um, the specifics of the question as it relates uh, to the Treasury portfolio as opposed to the infrastructure and transport portfolio, um, the senator asked whether these, any increase in these charges, of which a decision hasn't been made, would uh, have an effect on inflation. I mean, that is, um, one of the reasons why we have an economic plan uh, which is designed to ensure that government, through our revenue and expenditure, is not adding to inflation in the economy. But these aren't not determined. Inflation is not determined by one charge um, in one part of the economy. Uh, it's uh, the entire budget response uh, that this government will be cautious and careful about because we do not want to make the inflation challenge, which is real in this country and which is hurting households, stay around for any longer um, than is necessary to bring it back into the target rate and back into um, a more normalised setting. Um, and that is exactly why we want to concentrate on our economic plan to ensure you, that we're the doing what we need to do. Expired. Senator Davey, first supplementary. Uh, thank you. I think I need to be a bit more specific. Um, has the government received any advice from the departments of finance or treasury as to the inflationary impact of Labor's proposed trucky taxes and whether they could add further pressure for even higher increases on the interest rate? And if so, what is that advice? Minister. Well, as I said, this is not Labor's charge, if you want to call it that way. This is something that's negotiated across governments uh, at the state and territory levels, of which I think there still is some Liberal governments in, in power. Um, so I think it's disingenuous, as is your entire question time attack, really, about— um, well, it is. It is, because, because you can't— because you can't actually go, you can't actually argue on the merits. So Order. you try and you try and dress it up Order. into something that it's not. You try Order. and dress it up into something that it's not. No decision has been taken as to what advice, as to what advice, Treasury and Finance provide. Um, I am not going to go into advice. I I can certainly say I have not been provided. Thank you. Uh, Order. I have not. Uh, I am not aware of. Um, you, you are Senator a, McGrath. Senator McGrath. Um, Senator Davies, second supplementary. Thank you, uh, Minister. Given the potential impact on increasing trucky taxes on transporters and, more importantly, consumers and their grocery bills and national inflation, will the government rule out increasing taxes on Australian truckies? or will this become another one of Mr Albanese's 
broken promises of which the number is mounting. Uh, thank you, yeah. Senator Davey. Minister Gallagher. I should see if Senator McGrath would like to answer this on, on my behalf. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Order. Have a go. Have Order. a crack. Have a crack. Order. You must be so proud of yourself on International Women's Day. Order. Such a champion. Such a champion. Order. Good on you. Well done. Opposition life is hard. Minister it's Gallagher. Hard. Minister it's Gallagher, hard, James. please resume your seat. Order across the chamber. Order across the chamber. Senator Wong, Senator Wong, I have a senator on her feet. Senator Davy. Point of order, relevance. Uh, my question had nothing uh, to do with senator International Davey. Women's Day, and I'd like her to stick to the question. Senator Davy, the minister has just started, and she is being relevant. I am more interested at this point. Order, in there being order across the chamber, so that I might hear the rest of her answer. Minister. Oh. Well, as the senator knows, this is a matter uh, that's actually um, at the decision-making table of inf infrastructure and transport ministers who have not made a decision. It is across government, state and territory governments, involved in discussions uh, with the Commonwealth. So I think it's appropriately resolved at that level, and perhaps you could lobby your colleagues, if you're so concerned about it, about the position they might be taking. Thank you, Minister. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, uh, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Attorney General. This week, Senator Dodson, a former Commissioner of the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody, has called out your government, his own government, over its inaction on implementing the recommendations put forward by the Royal Commission over 30 years ago. Can you tell me if the government is going to ensure full implementation of all 339 of the recommendations? Thank you, Senator Thorpe. Minister Watt. Uh, thank you. Thank you, President, and thank you, Senator Thorpe, for your question. Uh, I agree, and I would like to think that everyone in this chamber would agree with Senator Dodson uh, that 32 years after the Royal Commission into Aboriginal deaths in custody, that rates of incarcerated First Nations adults and youth are unacceptable, uh, and that the uh, rates of uh, deaths in custody among First Nations adults and youth are unacceptable. Uh, there are many members of our government. Uh, and across the chamber, who have said before and will, I'm sure, keep saying that First Nations incarceration rates and deaths in custody are a national shame. Uh, and coming into government, it was clear, unfortunately, that for the last nine years, First Nations justice was just not a priority for the former government. Uh, and that's why last year the Attorney General worked closely with his colleague, uh, Ms. Burney, to form a First Nations justice task force with officials from the Attorney General's Department and the National Indigenous Australians uh, Agency. Senator Watt, please resume your seat. Uh, Senator Thorpe, um, I would in future wait to be noticed rather than calling out. Uh, Senator Thorpe. Uh, Senator Thorpe, I've called you to order. It's not okay to argue back. Okay. Point, you have a point of order? Thank you. Thank you. On relevance? Thank you. The minister is being relevant uh, to your question, so please resume your seat. Minister, please continue. Senator Thorpe, I've asked you to resume your seat. Uh, thank you, President. Uh, as, as I was saying, uh, Minister, please <laughs> resume your seat. Minister, relevance. The question is, when are you going to implement uh, the recommendations you, in full? Uh, Senator Thorpe, I did. On your first point, say that the minister was being relevant, and I'm going to say on your second point the minister is being relevant. Pre Pre Senator Birmingham. Pre President, on, on the point of order and the handling of points of order, this is a seemingly new practice to rule before a senator has even had a chance to put their case. On Senator Thorpe's first point of order, she had no more than got the word relevance out of her mouth than you ruled against her without hearing the basis upon which she was claiming a relevancy of the answer. I would, President, invite you to reflect upon that and to consider in terms of your handling of points of order that I understand where they are repetitious uh, or, um, um, or take approaches uh, that are disorderly in the chamber, uh, but in this case, a first point of order from a senator on a question I think deserves the opportunity for that senator uh, who had the chance you, to make Birmingham. their point. Um, senator Wong, I'm going to respond and then I'll come to you. 
Um, Senator Birmingham, as I've pointed out many times on points of order, I have senators stand and make statements and repeat questions and go to great lengths, which is unnecessary. Uh, in Senator Thorpe's case, and my apologies if she hadn't finished her answer, I understood she had finished her answer, and so I ruled. I'm going to go to Senator Wong. Thank you. Um, uh, oh. Order. <coughs> Yeah, I, I, un if I could perhaps be, uh, make, make a couple of points um, in relation to your ruling. The first is, in fact, it was Senator Ryan who first started to truncate the submissions on points of order because his view was that a number of us, and you know, I may have been one of those, um, made too many contributions on our feed on, on points of order. So uh, I, I was cut off on a number of occasions by, by Senator Ryan in the, as, as the president, uh, um, being of the view that um, he had already come to a view about the, the substance of the point of order. I have to say, Senator, I, I thought you were saying the word and then sitting down. So we, we have no objection if the president wishes to call you to make your submission, if you wish to do that. Uh, Senator Thorpe, on your first point of order, if you hadn't finished, I, I invite you to make a short statement about your point of order. My point of order, thank you for the indulgence, President. My point of order was based on relevance because the question was relating to uh, if the government is going to implement 339 recommendations that will save black lives today. Yep. Thank you, uh, Senator Thorpe. And you went to uh, statements that uh, Senator Dodson had made and in general about the Royal Commission and uh, other matters. So I do believe the minister was being relevant. I'm going to invite him to continue. Thank you, Minister. Uh, thank you, President. And as I was saying last year, uh, in recognition that there is still more work to do in implementing the recommendations of the Royal Commission, the Attorney General uh, established a First Nations Justice Task Force with uh, the Minister for uh, Indigenous Affairs, Ms Burney, um, and that contains officials from both of their agencies. And that task force is leading the design, coordination and implementation of this government's historic $99 million First Nations Justice Package. Um, that includes unprecedented Commonwealth investment in justice reinvestment, unprecedented Commonwealth investment in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander legal services to provide culturally appropriate legal assistance in coronial inquiries, and a commitment to real-time reporting of deaths in custody. The government is also working closely with states and territories on a proposal to raise the minimum age of criminal responsibility. So we acknowledge there's more to work to be done in this space. It needs to happen, and we're Thank getting on you, with it. Thank you, Minister. Your time for answering has expired. Senator Thorpe, first supplementary. Thank you, President, and thank you, Minister, for your response. Uh, what will your government do to support your own special envoy, the father of reconciliation? on taking urgent action on the implementation of the recommendations. And what time frame are you operating under, given it's been over 30 years already? Thank you, Senator Thorpe. Minister Watt. Uh, thank you, Senator Thorpe, and thank you to, for drawing attention to someone that I know we are all extremely proud to have within our ranks, uh, Senator Dodson. Not just the father of reconciliation, but of course a commissioner in the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody. Uh, in fact, I think on a personal level, that's probably where I first became aware of Senator Dodson's incredible advocacy uh, on behalf of our First Peoples. Uh, Senator Dodson has been a lifelong advocate for and a leader amongst First Nations Australians. Uh, and I know that he's making Senator a very Thorpe. strong contribution as a member of the Albanese government. Uh, to deliver on those recommendations and to improve the position of First Nations people in our country every single day. Now, Senator Dodson, I've, I've, I've uh, come to regard as a friend. I've learned a lot from him, and I know that he's someone of incredible goodwill and, has, and puts the, the, uh, uh, the, the needs and rights of First Nations people at the centre of what he does every single day. We can all learn from him and we can all take up his call to do more in this area. Uh, thank you, Senator Watt. Your time has expired. Uh, Senator Thorpe, are you ready to ask a second supplementary? Yeah. Yep, thank you. Thank you, President. One of the key factors impacting deaths in custody in access to health care in prisons 
By making Medicare in prisons available, First Nations people could access Aboriginal health checks and culturally safe health care. Years ago, Labor made a policy commitment to Medicare in prisons. When are you going to make this a reality? Thank you, Senator Thorpe. Minister Watt. Uh, well, of course, thank you, Senator Thorpe. Well, of course, our government is doing everything we possibly can to rebuild Medicare after years of destruction, whether that be in the general community or in prisons. Um, we have been on the record on many occasions saying that after nearly 10 years of Liberal National Party government, Medicare is broken. Uh, and that applies whether we're talking about people seeking to go to a GP in their community or whether we're talking about in prisons as well. Um, that they, these are important issues to make sure uh, that all prisoners, and in particular First Nations prisoners, are given the unacceptable high, high, unacceptably high rates of both incarceration uh, and deaths in custody get the health treatment that they deserve. And I have every confidence uh, that through the leadership of people like Senator Dodson, Senator McCarthy, Ms Burney, Ms Scrimgeour and many others, that this government will be doing more in this space than any government we've ever seen. Uh, thank you, Senator Watts. Senator O'Neill. Thank you, um, Madam President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Industry and Science, Senator Watt. What is the Australian government doing to transform Australian industry, and why is it important to improve Australia's sovereign capability? Uh, Minister Watt. Thank you, uh, President, and thank you, Senator O'Neill, who I know is a very strong supporter of the manufacturing industry, particularly in her state of New South Wales. A key commitment that the Albanese government made at the election was to rebuild Australian manufacturing. After 10 years of neglect and turning its, uh, our back on manufacturing under the former government, the Albanese government committed to build a future made in Australia, and the National Reconstruction Fund is a key part of doing that. The National Reconstruction Fund will provide finance to co-invest with industry to drive investments to grow advanced manufacturing and support businesses to innovate and create more good blue-collar jobs right across our country. The National Reconstruction Fund will also leverage Australia's natural and competitive strengths and shore up our supply chains. We saw through the pandemic how our supply chains were under huge pressure. Products we expected were hard to get. Across a range of products, our supermarkets and pharmacies couldn't get us what we needed. Border we couldn't get ventilators, we couldn't get PPE, and who can forget going to supermarkets with those empty shelves when we couldn't get the products that we needed? Now, that was when some of us took note of the fact that our manufacturing industry had been run down as a country, and some of us took note of that we need to be able to stand on our own two feet and make more things here. And that's when the seed for the National Reconstruction Fund was planted. We know you hate manufacturing. We know you sent the car industry offshore. We know you don't like manufacturing jobs, but you finally have a chance to repent and get behind the National Reconstruction Fund. The Albanese government Labor government is committed to building resilient supply chains and national sovereign capability to reinforce the prosperity, security and well-being of the nation. The National Reconstruction Fund will attract investment, it will help to grow the Australian economy and, most importantly, it will deliver good quality manufacturing jobs across our country. Thank you, Senator Watt. Senator O'Neill, first supplementary. Uh, thank you very much. Minister, how will the National Reconstruction Fund support manufacturing businesses? and create manufacturing jobs, particularly in regional Australia. Thank you, Senator O'Neill. Uh, Minister Watt. Thanks again, uh, Senator O'Neill. When we think about manufacturing, we think about regional Australia. Places like Gladstone, the Hunter Valley, Wyala, Geelong, Bell Bay and so much of Western Australia. Some of us get off the North Shore every now and then, Senator, Senator Hughes, and some of us get out into regional Australia and see what's going on in the manufacturing industry. And that's because regional Australia is a manufacturing powerhouse, and the National Reconstruction Fund will make our regions even stronger. A number of the National Reconstruction Fund priority uh, areas— Senator Oh, Watt. we're back in the North Shore. Senator Watt, order. Order. Uh, Senator Hughes, I haven't called you yet. Order. Order. I have a senator on her feet. Senator Hughes. Uh, I would like to ask Senator Watt to withdraw 
the uh, commentary that he's making in deriding the North Shore of Sydney. Not that I live Senator on the North Hughes. Shore of Sydney, and I have got off the North Senator Shore of Hughes. Sydney many times, Resume unlike you, seat. I lived in. Senator Hughes. Uh, Senator Watt, I haven't called you either. I am going to remind you it's not appropriate to single out particular senators, and I'm going to ask you to direct your comments to the chair. Please continue. I withdraw. Uh, the, um, as I say, the National Reconstruction Fund priorities have a very strong regional presence, sectors like resources, agriculture, defence and renewables. And it's no wonder, therefore, uh, that so many industry groups with a large regional presence are backing the National Reconstruction Fund. To begin with, an organisation I've heard of called the National Farmers Federation, uh, who, when Labor announced uh, this, uh, this commitment, talked about the opportunities for a renaissance of regional manufacturing. I would encourage all senators, particularly a little group over there, Thank to maybe you, listen Senator to groups White, like the NFF. Thank you, Senator White. Your NFF. time has expired. Uh, Senator O'Neill, second supplementary. Thank you, Madam President. Are there, um, Minister, are there any threats to delivering this support for Australian manufacturers? Uh, Minister Watt. Well, Senator O'Neill, it is my melancholy duty to say that there are, there are threats to this proposal. Uh, and while the resources and agriculture, agriculture industry are saying yes, yes, yes to the National Reconstruction Fund, those opposite keep saying no, no, no. And these are industries that the National Party of all groups are supposed to be champions for in this place. And, and I note, uh, I take the interjection from Senator McKenzie that it's a coalition, and perhaps that suggests that maybe there's not full agreement between the Liberals and the Nationals on this point. That would be very interesting to explore. And, and I note that there, in the past, uh, National Senator Matt Canavan has acknowledged the past 20 years of federal governments, including his own, have dropped the ball on Australian manufacturing. Uh, he said that they've dropped the ball, but there's been a real renaissance in manufacturing in Australia. Well, Senator Canavan and all the nationals, I invite you to join with us. I invite you to join with us with the National Farmers Federation, with the Australian Anim Aluminium Council to get behind regional manufacturing. There's an opportunity to stand up to the North Shore Thank Liberals you, and back Your time Australia. has expired. Senator Little. Thank you, President. Now, this question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Gallagher. Minister, your government went to the election with a promise to prioritise Australians' access to health care and reduce the cost of medicines. Given this promise, why has the Albanese Labor government decided to remove an innovative, life-changing form of insulin, FIASP, from the PBS, sending the price soaring to unaffordable levels for 15,000 Australians with diabetes who rely on it. Uh, thank you, Senator Little. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, uh, President. I thank Senator Little uh, for the question. Uh, and uh, Senator Little is right in her, um, in her question about our commitments to improving access to health care and improving Medicare, improving the cri or dealing with the crisis in primary care. It's another one of those issues that was left to us after 10 years of neglect and dysfunction from those opposite, that it was harder to see a doctor and more expensive to access health care. And we are doing everything we can to reduce the price of, uh, of medicines. In fact, our change that came in on 1 January has in, uh, reduced the price of most pharmaceuticals from $42 a script Senator to $30 Hughes. a script. In relation to uh, the um, insulin medication that Senator Little um, has, has raised, uh, this was a, a decision of PBAC, which is an independent expert body which advises the Australian government about the listings of medicine and comprises experts in the field of medicine, health, economics, social policy, health technology and pharmacology. Uh, the health minister was made aware on the 22nd of February of the company's intention to delist this medication from PBS from the 1st of April. Um, we understand that this is causing concern for people who. Senator Rustin. This, we understand that this is causing concern for people who are using that uh, le that medication, and the minister has asked his department to work with the company to look at uh, res resolving the matter. The PBAC has advised that, due to the unavailable to the availability of other medicines. 
the removal of this particular medication from PBS will not result in unmet clinical need. Uh, Thank you, need. Minister. The time for answering this question has expired. Senator Little, first supplementary. Thank you. Senator Minister. Rustin, just a moment, Senator Little. You've got one of your own senators on her feet ready to ask a question. Senator Little, please continue. Thank you. Minister, your government went to the election with a promise to prioritise Australians' access to health care and make it easier to see a doctor, which is particularly important for rural, regional and remote Australians. Given that promise, why has the Albanese Labor government ripped GPs out of rural, regional and remote Australia by changing the distribution priority areas for overseas trained doctors, making it harder for millions of Australians in those areas to see a doctor? Thank you, Senator Little. Minister Gallagher. Well, uh, with, with respect, Senator Little's question is, is not correct to say that Labor has ripped GPs out of areas. That is just simply, it is simply not true. And honestly, to have the interjections from uh, Senator Rustin, who was a member of the ERC that sat there and watched while Medicare fell into crisis and areas like workforce uh, were not dealt with. Uh, while it took delays through the immigration system for health professionals to come here, that Senator we are Rustin. now fixing Senator and Rustin. cleaning up, the interjections are outrageous. Honestly, it's like she, she hopes that everyone has amnesia from nine years of failure. Well, we remember, we remember, Senator Rustin, what you did to the health care system in this country, and Minister Butler and this government are fixing it. We're fixing it bit by bit with workforce, with difficult decisions, with looking at where we can make investments, to looking at how we can fix primary care and ensure Thank that people you, the in regional and rural Australia have expired. Have a Senator Little, second supplementary. Minister, another promise was to prioritise Australians' access to health care and protect Medicare. Given that promise, why has the Albanese Labor government slashed Medicare subsidised mental health support in half, removing access to psychology sessions from the Australians who need the most support? Why are you breaking promises on medicines, country doctors, Medicare and mental health? Thank you, Senator Little. Minister Gallagher. The question is wrong um, on all three issues. It is. It's wrong. But we, we get what you're doing. We get what you're doing. OK. You ask incorrect questions and then I get to answer them, which is what I'm doing now. But we are the party of Medicare. We are the party that built Medicare. We are the party that will save it. We are the party that will make investments in, in health care. We will make medicines cheaper. We will have new models of care like urgent care centres. Are you opposed to those Order. as well? Is the coalition opposed to those as well? We will make it easier to bring in workforce that we so desperately need in this country that you had failed to do, that left to millions waiting, uh, uh, visas waiting to come into the country. The backlog we're fixing to try and ensure Senator that Rustin. the people that Senator L Little raises, the people living in rural and regional Australia, actually get the health care they deserve because it declined so badly under your watch. Thank That's exactly you, what we're your doing. Time has expired. Senator Wong? I ask that further questions be placed on notice. If everybody could leave the chamber in a quiet fashion, that would be appreciated, please, by Hansard. I'm thinking of Hansard. I'm thinking of Hansard. Please, everybody, I'm being serious. Um, Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, pursuant to Standing Order Number 74, Part 5, which requires that uh, estimates questions on notice be answered within 30 days. I seek an exclamation from the minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care as to why answers to 13 questions um, uh, that have not been provided within the requisite days. And those 13 questions are SQ22, 
numbers 366, 368, 531, 593, and SQ 23 questions number 1, 4, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 18, and 19. Um, and I move that the Senate take note of the Minister's uh, failure. No. <laughs> Oh, let the explanation. So, uh, Minister. Uh, thank you. And I um, acknowledge the notice that Senator Rustin gave. Um, uh, this, uh, so, on the issue at hand, the department has provided the advice that 358 questions in writing and on notice from uh, the estimates hearing held in October 2022. For those questions that were provided on time, the Department of Health provided on time responses to 94 per cent of the questions received. I can advise uh, the Senate that, although it's a different number to the one Senator Rustin just used, approximately 20 questions in writing arising from November estimates that are outstanding, and the department advises it's expected that these will be tabled by the end of the week. The Department of Health and Ageing has already received approximately 905 questions in writing um, already from those hearings, of which 300 of them come from one senator alone. So there are a lot of questions that the Department of Health are trying to answer in the relevant time. Um, there are no questions awaiting clearance um, through the minister's office. They've all been cleared, so we're just waiting to get those outstanding ones from the Department of Health. Senator Rustin. That the Senate take note um, of the minister's inability to actually provide an explanation as to why all of these questions have not been responded to within the statutory time frame. Senator Cash. Oh, sorry. So, um, look, thank you very much. And um, you know, it's interesting to note that, that the minister, in response to um, to this particular um, question, um, came in and, and listed the number of questions that have been put on notice to the department. Uh, well, you know, it is really quite extraordinary when you consider that there are a significant uh, greater number of questions were put on notice by those opposite when they were in opposition. But I would also put on, uh, on the record that the reason that these questions are put on notice is because um, um, time after time after time of asking for, uh, for answers to questions, there is a failure by the department in estimates and often in this place to actually provide answers to those particular questions. Um, it's also interesting, um, I did give notice to uh, the department and the agencies and the minister that was in, at, at estimates that I was seeking answers to these remaining questions because they are actually um, relate to a particular group of um, or set of questions that um, I think that the public has every right to have an answer to, and they're not particularly onerous questions in which to answer. I mean, one of the questions, as an example, as I simply asked for the overseas travel um, up until that particular point in time, which was actually um, into November 2022, so not a particularly long period of time. Uh, during this government's term for the overseas travel by the five ministers within the health and aged care portfolio. As to why the department would still have that question and it has not been, uh, in, as the, the minister uh, representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care has said that, um, that none of the questions that have been unanswered are in the minister's office, I would under, would not, could not quite understand why the department would not be able to answer a question around the travel arrangements. One would have thought the minister's office might have been able to do that. Um, one of the more concerning of the questions that remains outstanding is um, for an amount of $312.6 million that has been allocated within the agency for ICT changes. I mean, $312.6 million uh, of a budget line item with no detail that we sought additional detail as to um, the details of expenditure of that kind of money. And now, some you know, sort of five months later, we still don't have any information about something that was contained in the October budget. So we're talking about um, a transparency around the expenditure of quite a significant amount of money. Um, the purpose of the estimates, obviously, is to get information around the expenditure of money, but $312.6 million apparently is not sufficient to warrant responding to. Um, simple question around how many conferences. Uh, that the minister um, has sent departmental officials to attend on their behalf. So, how many times has the minister been asked or invited to attend conferences where departmental officials um, have been uh, have been sent to represent the minister? It does not strike me as something that would have been terribly difficult for the department 
to be able to answer, or for that matter, the minister's office, because of course, if the minister was invited and he sent the department, they would have had copies of those invitations. Um, and just a minute ago, we saw um, Senator Little ask a very serious question about cuts to mental health um, that have occurred under uh, this current government, uh, the Medicare funded uh, Medicare rebates, um, subsidised rebates to people with serious mental health conditions. And uh, we didn't get one word about mental health. But in these questions that we have not had answered, one of the issues was about the consultations that were undertaken prior to the decision to cut mental health. Um, another really, really serious um, question that was asked, we often hear those officers talk about the great things that they've done since coming into government in health. And one of them was a copycat policy, uh, which was a copycat of ours, around providing continuous glucose monitoring devices to people with type 1 diabetes. Uh, it was re received with great acclamation, and we've seen the minister and many of the assistant ministers running around heralding the, the great achievements of this. We asked questions about there appears to be a severe shortage about the provision of these devices to Australians with diabetes. This question was put on notice. We still don't have an answer. We do not know. Uh, what the shortages are. We do not know how many Australians are waiting for this life-changing um, devices to be made available to them, and yet we have this government running around telling Australia how fabulous they are because apparently they've fulfilled this promise, but they can't answer the question as to whether they really have or not. Uh, in relation to a number of questions on notice around a piece of legislation that was pushed through the parliament yesterday, where I asked a number of questions of two representing ministers um, about um, details that sit behind changes to um, private hospitals and the use of, um, of implantable devices. I raised these questions in November and I raised these questions in my detail in the February estimates. So for the government to have arrived in here yesterday with the bills before the chamber and still not be able to answer questions, questions that have been on notice for some period of time, once again just points to the fact that we have got a government that is absolutely prepared to push legislation through with no detail and refuse to answer the questions that have been uh, that are legitimately being asked by those on this side to make sure that we have transparency and that the that the, that the sectors that need to know the answer to these questions have them so they're just some examples of the kinds of questions that are unnoticed that haven't been answered they are not questions that would have required onerous amount of work by the department to provide the answers. They are reasonably simple questions that quite clearly, in the absence of an answer to those questions, you'd have to suggest that the government is either hiding something or they haven't done anything and they're not prepared to admit to that. So I would say that um, a government that had been elected on a platform of transparency, the opaqueness and refusal to provide details about things that are tremendously important. Um, would suggest that, that, once again, their guarantee of a transparent government was nothing more than every other promise that they have made, and that was a headline promise that they never had any intention of ever delivering. Senator Cash. Uh, thank you very much, Acting uh, Deputy President. And I also rise to take note of the minister's answer, um, or rather excuses, uh, as Senator Rustin has outlined as to why questions that have been placed on the notice paper, and as we know, uh, senators are entitled to place questions on the notice paper and expect a response uh, within the allocated time of 30 days have not yet been provided. But the point that Minister Rustin makes is actually the point that the Senate does need to take note of. When you look at the platform that Mr Albanese went to the Australian people on, which was all one about integrity, integrity uh, and transparency. In fact, Prior to the election, he was very vocal, very vocal when he made announcements to the Australian people that if elected, both he as the Prime Minister and his ministers as part of the Albanese government, they would deliver transparency, integrity and accountability in everything we do. But as we know, all talk, all talk before the election. Just like so many of the promises that they made to the Australian people, and we can go through them shortly, what you now have is broken promises from a tricky government. And this is a government that, prior to the election, talks big on integrity, accountability, and transparency, and yet, once elected to office, fails to actually hold itself. 
to the standards that it set for itself prior to the election. Now, Senator Rustin has raised an issue with the minister today in relation to questions in the health portfolio that have not yet been answered. I myself, prior to question time today, had raised with Senator Watt, as the minister representing the Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations, Senator Burke, that I too would be raising this in relation to my portfolio after question time. Uh, I had 155 questions uh, that had been asked in January of this year that were due to be tabled on the 9th of February 2023 that were still outstanding. Now, lo and behold, just before question time was finalised today, Minister Burke tabled the answers to the questions. Now, interestingly, I thought that I would be sent by my office 155 answers. One would expect 155 questions. One might then say 155 answers. Can you my surprise, colleagues, when I was given one piece of paper? One piece of paper. So much for integrity, transparency and accountability. One piece of paper, question number 1162 to 1317. There's quite a jump in between, let me assure you. Question date, the 10th of January 2023. Table office due date, the 9th of February 2023, just before question time today, after the minister has been notified that I too would be taking note of a failure by the minister to uphold the standards that Mr Albanese told the Australian people uh, both he and his ministers uh, would be implementing when, if and when they are elected to government, uh, transparency, integrity and account accountability. I suddenly get one page. It is a global answer to 155 questions, but it does inform me—and this is the good news, colleagues—the Office of the Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations and the Department have undertaken a review of my questions on notice 1162 to 1317. So at least a step in the right direction. They obviously opened the file that was sent to them, and they at least reviewed them. And then, quite literally, as part of administering the workplace relations system, the minister, the minister's office, and the department meet with employee and employer representatives, for example, to consult on policy development. This is the beauty of the answer, though. Contact with some of the named representatives may have occurred in this context. Well, may have. Well, what, what, what does may have mean, in particular, for a government that, again, prior to the election, expounded virtues when it came to integrity, transparency? and accountability. So what you have is, quite frankly, contempt for the Australian Senate. And that is not just me talking. I do reflect on comments that were made by those that are now in government when they were in opposition. And in particular, I have to say the now Attorney General of Australia, Mark Dreyfus, someone who is a great preacher, I wouldn't necessarily say uh, acting deputy president, that he is a practiser. But he does like preaching, as so many have stated, in relation to accountability and integrity. In fact, Mr Dreyfus proudly told the Office of the Information Commissioner in a speech on Right to Know Day last year. This is very interesting. Information held by government and public institutions is a public resource. I'm assuming that he thought that was a complete, total and utter joke. He also said a culture of transparency within government is everyone's responsibility. Perhaps what he should have done, though, was put in brackets, except for the following ministers, and in this case, uh, Minister Burke, who again, 155 questions on notice, 155 questions outstanding uh, as at the 8th of March, and then prior to question time, a one-page answer in relation to all of these questions. But also, Mr Dreyfus clearly are not worried about practising what he preaches, said this. Appropriate, prompt and proactive disclosure of government-held information informs community, increases participation and enhances decision-making, builds trust and confidence, is required and permitted by law and improves efficiency. So, again, I'm a little confused. 
What part of treating the Senate with contempt by providing a one-page answer to 155 questions well after the 30-day time period has expired actually fits within appropriate? Absolutely not. Prompt? Definitely not. Proactive disclosure? Well, absolutely not there. Um, informs community? Well, one page doesn't inform us of much. Increases participation and enhances decision making, builds trust and confidence, and is required and permitted by law, and improves efficiency. Well, the answers that I have been provided with, or rather, one page answer, clearly does not do any of that. But then again, now they are in government, those on the other side are clearly holding themselves to very, very different standards um, to what they actually preached prior to the election. And if I actually look at what now Minister Watt said in June 2021, just over 20 months ago, uh, and this was in relation to a failure to provide answers to questions on notice in a timely fashion, and those on the other side, they are also entitled to raise this when we are in government. But the problem is they have then got to actually look at the answers they gave when they were in opposition and judge themselves and hold themselves to the standards that they screamed at the other side were required when we were in government. This is what Minister Watt now said. We deserve answers and transparency. He went even further and said it is not negotiable and it should not be negotiable to comply with the standing orders and properly answer those questions. Well, perhaps Minister Watt, on behalf of senators in this place, may actually raise that with both the Prime Minister and Minister Burke in terms of the way they have responded to the questions that I had on notice, and certainly in the way that Senator Rustin's questions have not been answered, despite, again, the standards by which Mr Albanese said his government would be judged if and, in due course, they were elected. Other, others on the other side have also, though, and again, sometimes you actually need to read what you preached when you were in opposition uh, to ensure that you are practising it when in government. Senator Mario Smith said on the 15th of October 2019, I am relatively new to this place, but it doesn't really seem like an unreasonable request to me that these questions are answered within 30 days. It's not an unreasonable request, Senator Smith. Um, Senator Sheldon, on the 15th of October 2019, said, when you answer the questions, it drives results and it drives accountability. This is what this parliament is for. And then I have to say, with all due respect to poor Senator Giacconi, on the 3rd of December 2019, Senator Giacconi, I will have to remind you, I will have to remind you uh, of what you stated. But I'm sure you impress upon this. I'm sure you impress upon your ministers this. It is a fundamental responsibility of this place to hold any government of the day to account. The Australian community expect us as senators to ask these very questions. These questions need to be asked for any Minister of the Crown to simply ignore this place. To disrespect the Senate and, through it, the Australian community is very much unacceptable. And I have to say it was very well said, Senator Kearney, very well said. Order. It is just a shame Order. that both the Prime Minister of Australia and, in my case, Minister Burke, uh, have not actually listened to what are your very, very wise words. So, Mr President, or Mr Acting Deputy President, um, as Senator Rustin has clearly articulated, uh, as is evident from what those on the other side said when they were in opposition, and certainly by the actions of the now Albanese government ministers, but in particular the Prime Minister himself, they set themselves the standards of being a government that would have integrity, be transparent with both the Senate and the other place and the Australian people, and certainly provide accountability. And yet, day after day after day, and we haven't even reached the first year anniversary of the election, all we in this Senate and the Australian people are seeing is a government that doesn't really care what it said prior to the election. A government that, once elected, turns its back on the promises that it made. A government that fails to hold itself to the standards it set and, quite frankly, is a government that is just full of broken promises. Senator Bragg. Uh, Acting Deputy President, 
And I rise to take note of the failure to answer questions. And it is a systemic problem, I think, across this government. There are basically three mechanisms where we can get transparency on key issues for the Australian people. Now, we have the questions on notice processes, which Senator Cash has already detailed has not been respected by the government. Uh, then there are the orders for production of documents, which I must, uh, I must say are also have been regularly ignored. And then there's, of course, the mechanism of freedom of information, which is available to any citizen. And what you often see from this government is a tendency to merge a freedom of information request lodged by a, a citizen, uh, who may also be a senator at the same time, uh, with a question or notice, or with a order for production of documents. Now, of course, these things are not supposed to merge. They are supposed to be treated separately. But we see a deliberate uh, corruption of these processes across the board. And by using that term, I don't mean to say that people are corrupt, but I mean to say that the, the process is often corrupted in the sense that it is not respected for what it should be. Now, I have lodged, for better, for better or worse, many questions on notice through the uh, Senator Gallagher's office uh, on behalf of Mr. Minister Jones. Now, um, these things range from detailed questions on financial advice policy, superannuation policy, uh, matters to do with the uh, Australian Securities and Investments Commission. Now, the government is now sitting on a, a key test in relation to these matters because after yesterday's motion on this report into the ASIC deputy chair, uh, the government will have to decide uh, is it going to release a report that the Senate voted overwhelmingly for the government to release. Now, we haven't called on the Securities and Investments Commission to make the report public. We've called on the government through the Treasury and the Treasurer to deliver that report. And it, it will be up to the Treasurer now to comply with that order. And I would say that it would be very risky territory now for the Treasurer to hide behind uh, some strange reasoning uh, not to release a report, which has cost taxpayers $200,000. Taxpayers have forked out $200,000 for a secret investigation into an ASIC commissioner, which was covered up by ASIC, or tended to be covered up by ASIC at Senate estimates. And fancy that. The corporate regulator, the organisation which is required to hold Australian companies to account, is covering up an investigation into one of its own. Now, is there any wonder why Corporate Australia regularly breaks the laws we set here in Canberra, that Corporate Australia doesn't take ASIC seriously, that ASIC's reputation is in the toilet, and that people don't fear ASIC. And we see a repeat of lawlessness, and then we see royal commissions which make recommendations which are ignored. And one of the core problems here is that the law enforcement agencies are not doing their jobs and then the government of the day seeks to cover it up. Now, this is going to be a key test. And all of the questions that have been asked, almost all the questions that have been asked in the Treasury portfolio since the election have not been answered properly. And I refer here to questions on notice uh, 356, where I asked how many meetings has the minister, this is Minister Jones, had with stakeholders in his review of the best financial interest duty which the Treasury is conducting? And no answer. And then question on notice number 565, where I asked again the same minister, Minister Jones, is the minister aware of disclosures made by Australian Super on Wednesday 14 September 2022 in their annual members meeting notice? Now, in that meeting notice, uh, because uh, regulations had been made by the government, uh, the, that super fund was able to cover up over $100 million in related party transactions and $1 million in payments to unions. I asked subsequent questions to the minister. Was the minister aware of these uh, huge, uh, uh, huge, huge uh, covers up of key information? And again, no answers. So it is a very regrettable situation that the government is taking policy judgments or making policy judgments to do certain things. They're asked about them in the usual way through the, the means we have here in the chamber and through questions on notice, and the government is deciding 
not to provide that information. And that is showing that the government holds the chamber in contempt. And it is a pattern, as I say, it is a pattern of behaviour where all the transparency measures are treated so poorly by the government. Now, there was a long and twisted debate about the creation of an integrity commission, which I personally have favoured the establishment of for many years. A lot of the people who made the, the argument to have an integrity commission made the argument as if there were no other integrity measures or there were no other transparency measures as part of our system of government. Now, one of the great things about our system of government is that we have the committee system, we have Senate estimates, we have these transparency measures, and if they're not treated poorly, they will be eroded over time. So therefore, the creation of an integrity commission will have less power or less capacity to improve our system over the long run if the other measures are watered down. So it is it, it does take I mean a, a government needs to respect the institutions that it inherits over time. And the failure to address questions that are asked through proper means and methods uh, is hugely regrettable. And always pointing the finger at past practices is not a very good answer. And I'm sure that there have been cases in the past where governments have not answered questions properly. And I think, think that is hugely regrettable. Uh, governments who want to preach to the electorate that they are going to be the paragon of virtue and the paragon of integrity uh, should, of course, hold themselves to that standard. I think that is only reasonable that that's what an opposition would seek a government to do. That if we are asking reasonable questions in accordance with the rules, that they would be answered within the timetable or at least the substance of the answers be given uh, rather than fobbed off. So I have to say that it, is, it, it, it concerns me that answers aren't given, but it also concerns me that when answers are given, they're not actually given. But the greatest concern I have here is the meshing together of the processes which aren't supposed to be meshed together. If I ask a question on notice to the minister, I'm not supposed to get an answer back saying, oh, we've, we've got an FOI from you. You're supposed to actually treat them as if they are not intersecting with one another. So uh, regularly we're receiving correspondence back uh, from ministers saying, we have your FOI, even though you've asked a question on notice now. Of course, I've asked the FOI as citizen brag, not a senator brag, so um, I would, wouldn't expect those things would uh, overlap. So uh, we hope that the government can do better here because it's an important part of the institution which we don't want to see eroded over time. Uh, thank you, Senator Bragg. Senator O'Sullivan. Yeah, thank you. I will associate myself with uh, my colleagues that have, that have stood up uh, and made a contribution on this issue. It's, uh, of course, a very important issue of, of transparency. We heard uh, right throughout the election campaign, and indeed, I was elected in 2019, and almost uh, every question time, the, this particular topic of uh, transparency. And integrity was raised, and it was something that uh, the Albanese government, uh, or the opposition then, took to the Australian people, saying that this is uh, what they're going to do, that they're going to be the new measure, that they're going to be the new measure of transparency that Australians can expect. And what we're seeing, a pattern that's been developed here now over, over nearly 12 months, where there's been a complete avoidance of, of transparency, and when the opportunity to uh, to be upfront, to be transparent, uh, it, uh, that we're not seeing this government take that seriously. And uh, so I, I associate everything uh, myself with uh, everything that Senator Rustin, um, Senator Cash, Senator Bragg uh, have have said. Uh, and I thought it was quite interesting that in the contribution that Senator Cash made, that uh, she reflected on some of the comments that uh, my colleagues on the other side, when they were on this side, were making uh, in the last term. And uh, she, uh, Senator Cash referenced a statement that uh, my good friend uh, Senator Sheldon made, uh, where he said that uh, when, when questions are answered, there's, there's progress, or words to that effect. Uh, things happen. And, and he's absolutely right. And what we need to see is this government start to take their responsibilities more seriously, and, or at least, at the very least, Take this chamber and the processes as Senator Bragg was speaking about uh, more seriously and, and understand the importance of their role in ensuring good accountability and good government. 
Uh, and some of the questions, I was just going through some of the questions that uh, Senator Rustin is, is waiting on, questions that, that she's put to, to, the, the, to the Minister for Health in relation to you know, various issues of the health portfolio. I mean, they, some of these questions are hardly gotcha questions. Like they're, not, they're not there to just trip the government up. Some of them relate to very serious issues that many Australians are facing. Now, I remember uh, about 12 months ago, or just, just over, uh, I had uh, someone come into my office and it was a father of a, a child that has juvenile diabetes. And this father, Jeff, his name was, he explained to me that, uh, that for a child who has a continuous glucose monitoring device, that the worst day of their lives <coughs> is actually their 21st birthday. Because on their 21st birthday, uh, they lose the, they were going to lose the, the access to that glucose monitoring device uh, because it was no longer going to be covered under the PBS or under, under Medicare. And uh, because as an adult they, they weren't afforded. Now, we uh, and many of my colleagues were, would have been approached by similar uh, stories uh, in, their, uh, in their electorate offices as people came forward, and there was a, quite an active campaign to convince the government of the day that, uh, that, that ensuring that adults got access to those, uh, those devices uh, was, was important. And we, uh, I remember engaging with the Minister for Health and, the, and through the election campaign, uh, the Health Minister, then Health Minister, uh, Greg Hunt, made uh, a commitment on behalf of the Australian government that should the coalition be elected, uh, they would provide those services to and provide those devices to adults. And Thankfully, the Labor Party matched that commitment. They matched that commitment. And so here we have a question that goes to, you know, what are you doing? You said you would do it. You said it was part of your election commitment. You jumped on the Me Too bandwagon. That's right, Senator, Senator Hughes. Uh, they jumped straight on it. Now, good. That we, we applauded the fact that there was unanimity on, on this issue, and, and Australians were, were very, very grateful for that. So here's a question. It's not a gotcha question. It's just a very straightforward question about the implementation of that change, about the implementation of that program. You know, uh, how many additional devices are estimated to be required to meet the demand? Pretty, pretty basic question. Not, not, nothing there to trip the government up. Uh, how many patients are waiting to access a device? Pretty straightforward. Is there a shortage of continuous glucose monitoring devices for type 1 diabetic patients? Again. Pretty straightforward. Uh, how is the department triaging which patients have access to a device? My point is that not only is it important to ensure that uh, we have transparency, to ensure the integrity of the government uh, is, is intact uh, and the, respecting the process, as Senator Bragg was talking about, and being able to ask these questions and have them respond in a timely fashion, it actually goes to you know, very serious issues, like Senator Sheldon was saying. If we want to see progress, then we've got to see answers to these questions. We've got to see answers to these questions. So that's why we ask these questions. That's why these questions are there. And, and expecting a response is important. And having those responses come in a timely fashion is critical because it actually impacts people's lives. It's disappointing that families look to a 21st birthday is actually the biggest disappointment. I mean, most people look to their 21st birthday and it's a big celebration. But for sadly too many people, when, as they're becoming adults and progressing through their life, if, they, if they've got type 1 diabetes and they, they're going to lose access to that machine, uh, to that device, it's going to obviously have a dramatic impact on their well-being, on, on their health. And so that's what this is about. It's, it's, it's more than just transparency. It's more than just integrity. It's about people's lives. And I urge this government to take their job seriously. You weren't just elected to have a, hold a position. You were elected to, to lead. You were elected to actually deliver the services that Australia, Australians expect you to deliver and that good taxpayers are paying for the delivery of those services. So I implore you, take this job seriously. Don't treat us with contempt. Don't treat this place, this Senate, with contempt. Because you're, all, you're, you're not just working against the institution, you're actually working against the Australian people who expect more and expect you to stand up for them.
Thank you, uh, Senator O'Sullivan. So the question is that the motion is put by Senator Cash be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Well, I think we're now moving to taking note. Is that you, Senator Hughes? Yes. Yes. Thank you, Madam President. I rise to take note of uh, questions asked by, to Senator Gallagher by Senator Payne, <coughs> Senator Gallagher by Senator Chandler, Senator Davey to Senator Gallagher and Senator Little to Senator Gallagher. Um, we once again heard today from the government that they were going to make a modest change to superannuation. They didn't understand why everyone's knickers were getting in a twist because it's a modest change. And I thought, well, we keep hearing this. It's obviously been featured throughout the focus groups that they've been conducting and how to best sell uh, these broken promises to the electorate. Because before the election, you didn't say modest change. Mr Albanese said no change, very clearly, no change. And so I had a look at what the word modest means in the dictionary, because I felt it might be helpful for those officers to understand that modest means relatively small, moderate, or limited. And then if you look up what no means, when you talk about no change to superannuation, no change to franking credits, no means not at all, not any, to no extent. So what we have those from those opposite is a litany, a litany of broken promises, one after the other. And superannuation, one that is attacking the retirement savings of people's investments that have made long-term strategies that we now know is not going to impact 0.5 per cent of Australians. It's going to impact 10 per cent of Australians because their broken promises continue. They're also going to stop allowing companies from offering franking credits. Now, we all remember the election when Chris Bowen said, if you don't like uh, the Senator policy, Hughes, don't vote I remind for us. Sorry, you to, Senator Hughes, I remind you to refer to others uh, in the other place by their correct title. Uh, really should have written down what member of the seat he is, but Mr Bowen, uh, he uh, said, if you don't like our policies, don't vote for us. And the Australian electorate very kindly took his advice and chose not to vote for those opposite uh, and ended Bill Shorten's long-held ambition uh, to be Senator Prime Hughes, Minister. Senator Hughes, once again, I remind you to refer to people— —ambition to become Prime Minister, which I understand has not faded. Uh, however, he may have to deal with the member for Sydney, who apparently has the support of all her colleagues. Uh, but Minister Bowen, uh, as he said back then as the member, don't vote, don't like the policy, don't vote for us. So the lesson that was learnt by the Labor Party was don't tell the electorate. Don't tell them the policies to let them make a decision on whether or not they vote for you. Your decision was we just won't tell them the policies. We will just say, as, as Senator O'Sullivan was just saying, you jumped on the Me Too movement. Every time you saw a policy that came out from the college, oh, but that's us too. Don't worry, we're a safe pair of hands. Dr Chalmers doing the work on his PhD, saying he absolutely looks up to Paul Keating, the former Prime Minister, and his and Prime Minister Hawke's their attempts to make sure the Australian economy modernised. But as soon as Dr Chalmers has got in, He's unwinding all of those economic gains, taking the Labor Party back to the good old days of left-wing socialism, redistribution of wealth. But they knew if they told the Australian electorate that, they weren't going to like it. They weren't going to back your superannuation changes. They weren't going to support you on changes to franking credits. But what we do want to find out, and the funny, you know, again, as was just said by Senator Sullivan, some of the questions that are being asked are really quite serious questions that are just about the policy detail. How are everyday Australians going to be affected by this? So a really reasonable question about how is unrealised gains going to be taxed? Self-managed super farms. You've got a farm, it's worth $2 million in the, in the self-managed super fund, you get a couple of land values increase, all of a sudden you, your farm's valued at over $3 million one year. It's not a realised asset. It's not sold. It's still part of the family fund. We cannot get an answer 
about what sort of modelling was done, how many families are going to be impacted. And actually, we asked where else in the world has this ever been implemented and successfully implemented and had a positive impact. The only place I think we can find is one African country which had its economy collapse. So that's a really great model for those opposite to be uh, trying to, to copy. But these are simple questions, and it either just shows you're continuing to lie to the Australian people, breaking promises, or you simply just don't know the answers. Thank you, Senator Hughes. Your time has expired. Senator Polly. President, thank you for the opportunity of being able to make a contribution to this debate. Well, can I just remind those listening and those on the opposition benches that they were in government for almost a decade. And when they left government, one has to ask, why were they booted out? The Australian people lost confidence in them. Why? Because of the rotting, the dysfunction of uh, the government, the mismanagement. And when the good senator asked questions today, the question in relation to health and access to GPs, one has to remember that the former Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, had such little faith in his health minister that he actually took control of the health portfolio as well as being Prime Minister and four other ministries. So that's how dysfunctional that government was. But you cannot accept, and the Australian people understand this, you cannot accept that a new government coming in, and I think we're a very good government, but even we can't fix the mess that was left behind by those opposite for the last decade. Now, we all know, and from my home state of Tasmania, we know only too well the crisis in health there that's been left. <clears throat> Lack of access to GPs, hospitals that are under enormous stress. We know that the ambulances and the good senator from Tasmania here understands that the Royal Hobart Hospital and the Launceston General Hospital and in Burnie and other hospitals, the ramping uh, and the issues facing our health system uh, is really chronic. Now, we're the ones, whenever we've been in government, it's been a Labor government that has built the nation when it comes to skills. We've built the nation around Medicare and ensuring people have access to their GPs. We invest in mental health. We invest in housing. We are very aware of the homeless crisis in this country. And then we've got the opposition who now, they want us to just rewrite history and forget about the trillion dollar debt that they left the Australian community, and we're the government who now has to manage that debt, we have to begin to start paying that down. So what we've introduced is a very, very modest, modest change to superannuation. So what we've got is those people all this week they've come in at every question time and taking note bleating about the impact that's going to have on people who have three million dollars plus in their superannuation. That they are still going to get a concession, but not as great a concession as the rest of the people. And let's face it, most Australians, most Australians have a balance of $120,000 in their superannuation fund. So I look at it and say, we've got a trillion dollar debt on this hand. We're going to have to pay it down there. The Australian taxpayer, Australians are going to have to pay this. So a modest impact on those who have, as I said, $3 million plus in their superannuation, which is going to affect 0.5 per cent of, of the Australian taxation and those who have superannuation is very modest. But indeed, it, it is, just seems to me it's just another attempt by those opposite, the no-alition, who it doesn't matter what this government will put forward, they're not going to support it. They talk about homelessness, they talk about health, but when it comes to addressing those issues, like providing a housing future fund so we can supply and assist people to get into affordable housing, 
particularly when it comes to women and children, what do we get from the Liberal Coalition? No, they won't support it. They won't support it. So don't come into the chamber, as I said, rewriting history, bleating about your concerns, when, when you're in government, again, if we look at skills and training and manufacturing, you let all of those companies go offshore. The only way you're going to provide uh, manufacturing in this country is to support TAFE system. That's why we've introduced 180,000 free, free TAFE Thank you, places. Senator Polly. Your time has expired. Senator Little. Thank you. Well, Labor is really all talk and no action. Labor said they were going to strengthen Medicare, but so far they have only weakened our health system. They've slashed Medicare mental health support in half. They've cut 70 telehealth items cut hospital funding in the budget and bulk billing, well, that's plummeting. This is particularly concerning for rural and regional Australia and in South Australia, my state, where we know workforce shortages are hitting the hardest and this government has only made it worse. They have ripped doctors out of country towns through their changes to the distribution priority areas for overseas trained doctors. I hear it in South Australia. And now they are relegating international doctors and nurses working in regional Australia to the bottom of the visa pile by failing to prioritise 887 regional skilled visas. On the eve of the election, the Finance Minister, Katie Gallagher, promised Australians that an elected Labor government would have 50 urgent care clinics up and running within the first 12 months. But it's clear they have broken this promise too, as they cannot even confirm whether one clinic will be up and running by July, let alone, loan, along with 50 promises across the country. Labor went to the election with a promise to reduce the cost of medicines, but now the Albanese Labor government has decided to remove an innovative, life-changing form of insulin, FIAS, from the PBS setting the price soaring to unaffordable levels for the 15,000 Australians with diabetes who rely on it. Now let's talk about mental health access. As part of our response to support Australians in tough times, the former coalition government doubled the number of Medicare subsidised psychology sessions available through the Better Access Initiative from 10 to 20. Given the significant pressures that Australians are facing right now with the cost of living, and energy bills skyrocketing, mental health support could not be more important. But despite these pressures still impacting our communities, the Labor government has decided that now is the right time to slash access to psychology sessions in half. Serious mental health issues are often at their highest two or three years after a crisis, pandemic or natural disaster, which is why it is absolutely vital that vulnerable Australians have continued access to the psychology sessions they need. The independent evaluation of the Better Access Initiative even recommended that the additional 10 sessions should continue to be made available and should be targeted towards those with complex mental health needs. This government needs to stop their irresponsible attacks on the mental health services Australians are relying on and explain why they have gone against Recommendation 12 of the review and the needs of vulnerable Australians by cutting this support. That is why the Coalition has organised a petition calling on the government to urgently reinstate these critical Medicare subsidised psychology sessions until such time as they put in place an alternative to ensure adequate access to mental health support for all Australians who need it. Talking about the broken promises, before the election, the Prime Minister and the Treasurer made many promises. Remember the promise to cut your electricity bill by $275? Broken. Remember the promises of cheaper mortgages? Broken. Remember the promise of no changes to super? Also broken. Remember the promise of lower inflation? Well, that's definitely broken. Remember the promise that we're not touching franking credits? Broken. Remember the promise that industry-wide bargaining is not part of our policy? Definitely broken. 
Remember the promise that we will be doing our bit to assist real wage increases? Mm, broken. Remember the promise that we are not about raising taxes? Mm, broken too. Remember the promise to cut the cost of consultants and contractors? Hmm. Broken. Look forward to seeing just how broken that one is. These are all broken promises from what is a tricky government and just goes to prove that on promises you just can't trust the Albanese government. Thanks, Senator Little. Senator Ciccone. Thanks a lot, President. And uh, unfortunately, I can tell you what's broken is that the, the coalition continues continues in their persistence of undermining the working people of this country. They are a broken record. That is what is broken. Those opposite. And the reason why that they don't want to talk about the benefits of the superannuation scheme is because those opposite are embarrassed about the $1 trillion that they racked up when they were last in government not too long ago. They racked up $1 trillion and not put forward any solutions about how this government fixes the structural deficit that we have inherited and we are now trying to fix. But yet they come into this place and instead defending the workers of the country, are defending the 0.5 per cent of people who are very well off and who can afford to pay a bit more tax in order for us to fix the budget structural deficit that we have inherited. So before they come in here and accuse us of trying to break any promises, I think you should have looked at yourselves first about the mess that you have left us. The mess that you have left us and that the majority of Australians have actually said yes to. Two thirds of Australians in the latest new poll actually agree with the government's position of fixing the budget bottom line. In fact, the majority of coalition voters have actually agreed with the Labor Party's policy that we have recently announced. So it is extraordinary to see the coalition continue to attack the government's steps to repair the budget. The government is making modest changes. It is making modest changes but allowing the very wealthy to still receive a tax concession. The only difference is, instead of paying 15 per cent, they'll pay 30 per cent. And these are people that would be paying around 45 per cent on their income tax. So they are still much better off. But unfortunately, governments have to make these tough decisions to fix the, the, the budget bottom line. Now, it was Labor that did build this system of superannuation back in the 80s under Bob Hawke and Paul Keating, and will always continue to protect it and make sure that we protect it so it is stronger and it is sustainable into the future for working people, so that they, when they retire, the workers, the family of these workers can have a retirement that is comfortable and they are not reliant on government in the future. That was the whole point of setting up the superannuation scheme as part of the accord with industry, with business, with the governments and with the unions. But also it's important to remember that it was those opposite in the last government, many backbenchers, some of them in this place today, that were opposed to the super guarantee, opposed to the guarantee increasing from 9.5% further opposition around those 0.5 per cent incremental increases. Yes, hello, Senator Rennick. I do know your opposition to that. But it was a number of Liberal and national senators and members in the other place, President, that were opposed to super guarantee increases and today remain opposed to superannuation even existing. So since coming to government, we have been upfront about the challenges about the economy and the budget. We've inherited a trillion dollars and the $50 billion structural deficit that we are now trying to fix. Now, this is about responsible budget management, and the government has to make these choices so that we can continue to invest in defence, in health, in aged care and the NDIS. But it is really something about the coalition priorities that has got me today. And I want to place on the record, in the last minute that I have, about a speech that former Assistant Treasurer Senator Rod Kemp gave in a speech in Brisbane on the 20th of May 1999, entitled The Government's Approach to Super. 
Now, in his speech, he said, and I quote, On coming to government, it was clear that the existing tax concessions for superannuation were unfairly skewed to high income earners. To address this inequity, the government, that is the Howard government, introduced the superannuation surcharge. While this measure has been criticised by some, there is no question that it meets the equity objective, nor have I heard any justification of why high income earners should have continued to receive the disproportionately large tax advantages that were available before the introduction of the surcharge. Thank you, Senator Giacconi. Senator Rennick. Uh, thank you, Madam President. And, uh, I'm glad Senator Giacconi uh, quoted uh, former uh, Assistant Treasurer Rod Kemp. He didn't really have to go back that far because I've said that all along, ever since I got into this chamber, that superannuation is a rort uh, and it was only a matter of time before Labor would try and get their hands on the money. But we should also, given that it is International Women's Day, just talk about how inequitable superannuation really is for women. If we actually look at the mean balance uh, of superannuation for women uh, aged 60 to 64, their balance is uh, the mean balance is 280,000, whereas for men it's 360,000, uh, and so there's about a 30% uh, higher uh, mean balance for people when they retire for men than there are for women. So what better way on International Women's Day to decide to abolish super and let women keep their superannuation so they can own a house? So they can own a house. Because at the end of the day, you know, if, if you've you know, got a, a man and woman in a house, they share it 50 per cent. So what, what better way uh, of, of sharing um, the debt than that? But uh, I, I would also like to uh, just follow up on uh, Senator Little's uh, questions, which I thought were very relevant, uh, and I uh, commented on this earlier this week about the Labor Party abolishing the PBS uh, uh, subsidy for the 15,000 people with diabetes. I find it incredible that you would uh, make it harder for these people to abolish a, uh, a drug that actually does work. Uh, I note that the Labor Party uh, continues to push uh, a fifth jab, a, boot, a, a shot of the vaccine uh, that you know, hasn't stopped transmission or infection. Uh, so maybe they should actually stop spending money on vaccines that don't work and actually put it back into measures for mental health and for diabetes, which, mind you, has up uh, by 10 per cent uh, since the rollout of the COVID vaccine, which isn't surprising because uh, diabetes is an autoimmune disease. And as we know, the vaccine induces an autoimmune response. So surprise, surprise, are we surprised that we actually get uh, an increase in diabetes? No, we aren't, if I can answer my own rhetorical question. And I'd also like to pick up on Senator Giacconi's claim that we've actually got a trillion dollars in debt. We don't actually have a trillion dollars in debt. Uh, I just looked up just then on the Australian Office of Financial Management, and we're currently at 900 billion. But can I say that a lot of that debt was incurred throughout COVID in response to the uh, hysteria driven by Labor premiers who got up there every day, day after day, one at nine o'clock, one at 10 o'clock, one at 11 o'clock, giving us all the COVID cases. And when there weren't COVID cases, uh, they'd tell us that there was COVID in the sewerage. And then when we'd go for three months without COVID, we'd get one case and we'd shut down the entire state over one case. Uh, and then finally, when COVID did break out last year, we were told not to go to the hospital, but rather, if you had the case of COVID, uh, but to actually stay at home and take Panadol. So after all the hoo-ha about being told how we had to shut down and lock down and how we, the federal government was you know, basically blackmailed into throwing uh, hundreds of millions of dollars at the state governments who were just generating fear, that was the real pandemic fear, uh, you know, we found out in the end that hospitals still weren't ready. Uh, and they're still not ready today, mind you. Our, our ambulance uh, waiting times are through the roof. Uh, the hospital, uh, the ambulance ramping is out of control. Uh, we've got waiting lists, record waiting lists across all the states, who, of course, overinvested in hysteria and didn't actually invest in good, solid, long-term health infrastructure like beds, like more doctors, uh, like nurses. Uh, and actually put the money into actually putting more money on the front line for services instead of fear-mongering. But of course, that is what we get with this side of the government. 
And uh, just back to some of this original super stuff. Now, personally, I've always been on the record as saying superannuation is a tax rort and it does favour the wealthy. But can I say that this new rule, this proposed rule that we're going to tax unrealised gains, is totally unworkable? And I'm not saying that as a politician. I'm saying that who spent 30 years in finance uh, reconciling balance sheets. And I can assure you that if you think you're going to be able to to calculate unrealised gains on any equitable manner, you are kidding yourself. Because what it's going to do is you're going to add compliance costs, so you're going to have to pay for an auditor or an evaluator to actually value these assets. Then you're going to actually have liquidity problems because you're going to have to sell an asset to actually pay the tax. Uh, and then the third problem is you're going to generate uncertainty because people aren't going to know what the value of that asset will deem to be before June 30. So I would ask that you at least reconsider that unrealised gain you, proposition Senator because Rennick, it's your time unworkable. Has expired. Senator Thorpe, were you seeking the call? Thank you, President. I oh, beg your pardon. Let me just put the question first. So the question is that the motion, as moved by Senator Hughes, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. Senator Thorpe, the no, the ayes have it. Thank you, President. I rise to take note of uh, Minister Watts' answers. Uh, today in question time relating to Aboriginal deaths in custody. As you will know, our people have never stopped calling on the government to fully implement the recommendations of the Royal Commission into Aboriginal deaths in custody. I do thank Senator Dodson for echoing our calls for action in this space, and we will keep the pressure on day by day until we finally see action. You don't need to go out looking for new solutions. The solutions have been there for over 30 years. They've been sitting on the government's shelf collecting dust whilst our people still continue to die at the hands of the system. Today I asked a simple question requiring a yes or no answer if the government will implement the recommendations in full and Senator Watt failed to answer that simple question. He also failed to answer how the government is going to respond to their own special envoys' requests for action. I appreciate that some steps are being taken on deaths in custody by this government, but in many other areas we have seen the federal government's continuously palm off responsibility on deaths in custody to the states and territories. The federal government needs to finally lead the way in this space to make sure all recommendations are implemented in full. We need urgent action today. Every death in custody is one too many. Deaths in custody are preventable. Families and communities are always in a state of mourning from this ongoing torture in the Australian prison system against First Nations people. One simple action for this government to take is to get Medicare and PBS into the prison systems in this country. You wonder why people are dying in custody. They don't get medical attention in the way that they need to. They don't have Medicare in prisons. This will benefit everybody. This will allow better healthcare services and wider medications available to those incarcerated. This will also allow for early detection of diseases and allow their prevention. For imprisoned First Nations people, it would mean access to culturally safe community health services and Aboriginal health checks. It would also mean that a continuation of care is possible after the release from prison, which would prevent a lot of health challenges for our people experienced during that time. It would also mean access to much-needed mental health services. Medicare in prisons is theoretically a labour policy, but we never have seen any effort to actually make it happen. Well, it's time to do so. Another obvious step to take is to review the implementation of the 339 recommendations that are on someone's shelf, dusty, from 32 years ago. Uh, the last review was handed down in 2018 by Deloitte and has been widely dismissed by experts 
due to the dodgy desktop analysis that they took. They didn't even talk to the people. They sat at the computer and done an analysis and said, oh, yeah, this recommendation looks like it's OK. We'll just say that that one's been implemented. So it was a dodgy desktop review. We need our people to be part of this solution. This government needs to conduct a real independent review of where the implementation of the recommendations is at and take urgent action to save black lives in this country. You have once again have blood on your hands, Labor, because you had the opportunity last time you were in government to implement these recommendations. Now, ten years later, you're back, and we're sick of the rhetoric. We're sick of the all talk and no action. Even your own special envoy, your voice in your party, is asking you to implement the recommendations because he was one of the commissioners at the time. So at least listen to your own voice. If you want us to listen Thank to you, this Senator other one, Thorpe, your time has expired. So the question is: the motion is moved by Senator Thorpe be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. We'll now move to notices of motion to be given for another day. Are there any of those? No. Nope. Uh, I shall now proceed to the placing of business. Is it desired to postpone or rearrange the business? I call the clerk. Postponement notifications have been lodged as follows. General business notice of motion 168 for today to the 9th of March. Business of the Senate number one for today to the 29th of March. And business of the Senate number two for today to the 20th of March. Thank you. I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. I shall now proceed to the discovery of General business, and I'll start with general business notice of motion number 163, standing in the name of Senator Wish Wilson. Is that you, Senator McKim? It does appear so, President. Thank uh, you. I ask that general business notice of motion number 163, in the name of Senator Wish Wilson, be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator McKim. Thanks, President. I move the motion. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator McKim, standing in the name of Senator Wish Wilson, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I think I'll move to the other one in Senator Wish Wilson's name. Is that you again? That's uh, 171. Jordan. Thanks, Senator McKim. Uh, thanks. Was that 171, President? Yes. 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 Thank you. I ask that general business notice of motion number 171 be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator McKim. Uh, thank you, President. I move the motion. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 171, standing in the name of Senator Wish Wilson, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I'll now move to general business notice of motion number 165, standing in the name of Senator Hume. Senator Askey. On behalf of Senator Hume, I ask that general business notice of motion number 165 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Askew. I move the motion. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 165, standing in the name of Senator Hume and moved by Senator Askew, be agreed. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. We'll now move to uh, general business notice of motion number 164, standing in the name of Senator Wish Wilson. Senator McKim. Thank you, President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 164 be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Wish Wilson. I call uh, Senator McKim. Thank you, Bigger President. Pardon? I move the motion. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 164, standing in the name of Senator Wish Wilson and moved by Senator McKim, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? Uh, I believe the noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 164, standing in the name of Senator Wish Wilson, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Askew as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes. Order. There being 40 ayes and 17 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. I advise senators there may be further divisions. We will now move to general business notice of motion number 166, standing in the name of Senators Brockman and Cadell. Is that you? Senator Askew. On behalf of Senator Brockman, Senators Brockman and Cadell, I ask that general business notice of motion number 166 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any um, opposition to this being taken as formal? There being none, I call <laughs> Senator Askew. I move the motion. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 166, standing in the name of Senators Brockman and Cadell, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Against? No. Uh, I believe the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for. Is it? <laughs> do it for one, and we do it. ring the bells for one minute. Are you ready? Lock the doors. 
So the question is that general business notice of motion number 166, standing in the name of Senators Brockman and Cadell, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the nose to the left. I appoint Senator Askew as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the nose. Order, there being 29 ayes and 31 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. We we'll now move to general business. Notice of motion number 167. 167. I'm going to withdraw. Senator Askew. On behalf of Senator Nampa Jim Price, Senators Brockman and myself, uh, we wish to seek to withdraw general business notice of motion number 167. Thank you. We'll now move to general business notice of motion number 169, standing in the name of Senator Birmingham. Senator Dunningham. Uh, thank you, President. I ask on behalf of Senator Birmingham that general business notices of motion 169 and 170 uh, be taken as formal. Is there any objection to these motions being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Dunningham. I move those motions. So the question is that uh, general business notice of motion number 169 and 170 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? No. Uh, I believe the, the noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. One Lock the doors. So the question is that general business notices number 169 and 170, standing in the name of Senator Birmingham and moved by Senator Dunningham, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Askew as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes.
order, there being 40 ayes and 17 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. I now move to General Business Notice of Motion Number 172, standing in the name of Senator Hume. Senator Askew. On behalf of Senator Hume, I ask that General Business Notice of Motion Number 172 be taken as formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Askew. I move the motion. So, question is that General Business Notice of Motion Number 172, standing in the name of Senator Hume and moved by Senator Askew, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. I believe the noes have it. Ayes have it. Ring the bells for. One minute. Lock the doors. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 172, standing in the name of Senator Hume, be agreed to. Though I shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Askew as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes. Order. There being 40 ayes and 17, 17 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. I now move to general business notice of motion number 173, standing in the name of Senator Steele John. Thank you. Thank you, President. I ask that general business uh, notice of motion number 173, relating to the establishment of a select committee into the provision and access of dental services in Australia, uh, be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Steele John. Thank you, President. I proudly move the motion. Yeah. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 173, standing in the name of Senator Steele John, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Against? There's no against? Okay. So the ayes have it.
Members, if you're not participating in the matter of public importance, I'd ask that you leave the chamber quietly, please. A proposal from Senator Hughes has been received under Standing Order 75 as follows. Start again. Thank you. Uh, the President has uh, received the following letter from Senator McKim. The letter is, Dear President, pursuant to Standing Order 75, I give notice that today the Australian Greens propose to move that, in the opinion of the Senate, the following uh, is a matter of urgency, that women in Australia deserve genuine progress on women's safety, health and economic security, including fully funded frontline women's safety services, superannuation on paid parental leave, investment in affordable housing to tackle the growing risk of homelessness amongst older women, raising the rate of income support and the minimum wage, making a full range of pre-productive health care accessible through the public health system, and making uh, universal and high-quality early education and childcare free and accessible across the country, all of which should be funded with the $254 billion in savings from scra scrapping the stage three tax cuts which mostly benefit rich men. Uh, from Senator McKim of Tasmania. Is the proposal supported? Thank you. The concurrence of the Senate and the clerks will set the clocks in line with the informal arrangements made by WHIPS. I call Senator Waters. Thank you so very much, um, Acting Deputy President. It's great to see a woman of colour in the chair on International Women's Day. Um, I move the matter of urgency uh, standing in my name today. It is International Women's Day, and women deserve genuine progress on safety, on health, on economic security, including fully funded frontline women's safety services, superannuation on a decent amount of paid parental leave, investment in affordable housing to tackle the growing risk of homelessness, which is rising amongst older women. Women deserve raising the rate of income support and the rate of the minimum wage, which is disproportionately earned by women. Women deserve making a full range of reproductive health care accessible through the public health system so that people can actually afford to access the reproductive health care they deserve. And women deserve making universal, high-quality early childhood education free and accessible no matter where you are in this country. Now, all of those amazing things that would improve the daily material lives of women could be funded. They could be funded if this government chose to ditch the stage three tax cuts initially proposed by Scott Morrison and now backed in by this Labor government. They could save $254 billion of public money and instead of giving it to the 40 per cent of rich white men, they could instead spend it on women and deliver those policy outcomes which will actually help people, will pull people out of poverty, will help us achieve safety and equality. So every day this government could choose to improve the lives of women, but today being International Women's Day, you'd think that on this day the Albanese government would commit to something real, a real tangible action on improving women's safety or on economic security or on equality. Instead, we've got a report card telling us what we already know. It's a good distillation of the data, but unfortunately there was no announcement today from the government saying what they would do to fix any of those hideous metrics about women being killed, about women being in poverty, about women being paid less than blokes. The list goes on and it's very sobering reading. But if this government still doesn't know what needs to be done to actually achieve gender equality 
then it's time to start listening to the women of the country who have been very vocal about this, and there's even an obvious way to pay for it. It beggars belief that Labor refuses to walk away from the stage three tax cuts. As I mentioned before, 40 per cent of those would go to men already in the top 10 per cent of earners, a group that certainly doesn't need any more help from the government. They're doing very nicely. The Status of Women report card says that women approaching retirement have 23.1 per cent less super than men of the same age. We know that paying superannuation on paid parental leave would go a long way towards closing that gap. But we haven't heard a commitment from this government on that yet. We also know that the fastest growing cohort of people at risk of homelessness are women, and it's not just women over the age of 55 as it was before COVID, it's now women over the age of 45. Yet this government's proposal to fix the housing crisis falls so far short of, what needed, of what's needed. It actually makes things worse by not keeping pace with people who need a roof over their head. Women make up more than 60 per cent of those relying on income support payments. Job seeker, student and parenting payments, they are struggling to make ends meet as the cost of living rises, but the government still will not raise the rate. The Status of Women report card notes that it takes an average of five years to receive a diagnosis of endometriosis, despite one in nine women suffering from it. This inequality in access to women's reproductive health care will persist without federal intervention. What's missing from the Status of Women report card is a real-time toll of women killed by violence to keep that issue at the front of decision-makers' minds. What's also missing is data about unmet need. How many women are turned away from frontline services because those, those services simply don't have the resources that keep up with demand? The, service, the women's support and uh, women's safety sector have said time and time again they need a billion dollars to help everyone that seeks their help. They are turning women and children away because they do not have the resources to help them. The last budget fell short on that pledge. And I asked the minister earlier today in question time whether or not any movement could be seen on that, and I was given a promising response. We will hold you to account on that. The women of Australia are grateful for this compilation of data showing how unequal we are, but what we actually want is policy action to redress, uh, to redress that inequality, and those stage three tax cuts are the best way to fund women's safety, equality and economic security. Thank you. Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, uh, Acting Deputy President. Well, I stand today very proudly uh, as a member of the coalition team that in winning government was absolutely committed to improving women's safety, economic security and health, health outcomes for Australian women. We absolutely know that family, domestic and sexual violence is a complete scourge on Australian society. And we in the coalition believe that this is a matter that needs to be tackled without any partisanship because unless we do so, we can never hope to actually achieve that goal of striving towards a zero violence target, which I think is something that every single person in this chamber, in this government and hopefully in this country wants to strive for. So improving safety for women, uh, women and their children uh, is obviously something that is, it, it does, comes with a price tag, and that's why women government we were very pleased to have allocated in the 2000 uh, and 22-23 budget $1.3 billion to prove, improve outcomes through initiatives. Uh, in relation to women's safety. Um, and this brought the coalition government's commitment to women's safety um, over the period of the final two years and the first year of the, uh, the next action plans uh, to $2.5 billion to support the transition and implementation towards the next action plan. And having been the former Minister for Women's Safety, I was really proud to have been part of the development of the Next Action Plan, uh, which we saw as a blueprint towards providing the kind of uh, commitments that all levels of government, all levels of society uh, would put towards driving that goal of towards zero. Because the reality is um, that our commitments have to span the life cycle of violence, but also our commitments have to actually span every single person in Australia because it is no use for governments to spend money. It is no use for us to stand here and make commitments unless we can convince every single Australian that violence against women and children, in fact, any violence, is absolutely wrong. So to end gendered violence, we have to stop it from happening in the first place. And that's why measures that 
go towards organisations such as Our Watch, who intrinsically um, are designed and, and established to make sure that we have campaigns so that we can teach younger Australians about issues such as respect, stopping violence, calling violence out, making sure that their behaviours are respectful and making sure that we and they are investing in community-led initiatives to deal with violence at the front line. But we also have to realise that in the process of doing this, we still have to respond at the other end to those women who are facing violence and their children daily. And that's why we were pleased to establish the escaping violence payment to provide women with up to $5,000 so that when they were escaping violence, they had the financial assistance to be able to set up homes and start to establish a life free from violence. So we are very pleased to have been able to stand um, with Australian women in making sure that we were the first ones to put the largest ever commitment um, against ending violence against women and their children, and acknowledge that the new government has continued that investment uh, and that commitment towards zero um, for Australian women to live a life free of violence. But I'm also pleased to say that we also made a very significant commitment in women's health um, because we believe that the overall wellbeing of women can only be underpinned if they have access to um, affordable um, health care to meet their health care needs. Uh, and that was why we put significant funding towards maternal, sexual and reproductive health, but most particularly one area that we were very pleased to have worked uh, in a bipartisan way with the then opposition it was in relation to funding uh, for women who are affected by endometriosis. And I I want to give a shout out to Nicole Flint, uh, a previous member in this place for the, for the Liberal Party, and to Gay Brockman, who was uh, a previous member in this place for the Labor Party, who together worked very, very hard to establish a platform and a plan um, for endometriosis uh, and to respond to endometriosis, which when in government we were pleased to put a $58 million commitment towards to make sure that we were dealing with earlier diagnosis, ensuring women had access to the kind of resources so that they could make informed decisions about their health and so that doctors were provided with guidance around best treatment to help women who live with endometriosis. Um, I want to acknowledge that when we made that announcement of $58 million, the then opposition, now government, said that they would honour that commitment as well, and we were obviously delighted. I was also delighted earlier in this year to stand next to um, the Assistant Minister for Health and Aged Care when two of the initiatives that were contained in that $58 million um, were announced as um, being activated and ongoing. Um, obviously, we await um, to make sure that the remainder of the initiatives in that announcement uh, are delivered by this government, but I hope we can continue in a bipartisan way for the sake of Australia's women. Thank you. Senator Marielle Smith. Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. Look, I'm uh, really happy to be contributing to this debate today as well. It's a really important debate and a really important topic, and particularly today on International Women's Day. But I'm particularly happy to be able to contribute to this debate from the government benches as part of the Albanese Labor government. Now, we agree that women in Australia, of course, deserve genuine progress on their safety, on health and on economic security. But do you know how that happens? It happens from only the structural changes, the long-term systemic changes, which you can do from government. And if you need any evidence of this, you can see it in the past decade, where no amount of protest or opposition was enough to stop Tony Abbott when he appointed himself as a Minister for Women in a cabinet with only one other woman. It wasn't enough to stop the Liberals trying to force those experiencing domestic violence to raid their superannuation accounts. It wasn't enough to stop the op now opposition, then government, leaving the Respect at Work report gathering dust on a shelf. And it wasn't enough to stop the plummet in staff numbers at the Office for Women. No opposition, as loud as it may have been, wasn't enough. It wasn't enough to stop us going from 23 to 50 for overall gender equality in the Gender Gap Index. That's what happened under the previous government. But you know how you change it? You know how you turn that around? You do it from within government, by forming government. Not from opposition, not from the noisy stuff on the sidelines. And being in government requires adult decision making processes, decisions which require you to pay for things, cost them, prioritise them, and deliver them. And we do deliver 
in the Labor Party. When we're in government, we deliver. Indeed, I would say we are the only party in this place who could stand here with any meaningful credibility and say we have delivered the real long-term systemic changes which have made a significant difference to gender equity and equality in Australia. And we've done this because we believe in gender equality, we fight for it, but also we are the embodiment of it. This is the first government in our nation's history which is majority female. And it shows. It shows in what we're doing, it shows in how we're acting, it shows in what we're prioritising. And this government, this Labor government, is not the first reforming Labor government on the question of gender equality. Actually, every government, every time we've held government, we've made significant strides to make this place, this country, a better, fairer, equal, more safe place for women. Whether it's the Whitlam government introducing no-fault divorce and their support for equal pay, or the Hawke and Keating governments with the Sex Discrimination Act, Rudd and Gillard governments introducing Commonwealth Pay Parental Leave and the National Plan to Reduce Domestic and Family Violence. Every time we're in government, every time Labor is in government, we deliver for women. Not from the sidelines, but from these benches, by making the tough decisions, the difficult decisions that prioritise women's equality and equity. Our government, the Albanese government, will be no exception. We're one year in, but already we're embedding women's economic equality as a core economic imperative, making significant investments in early childhood education to boost productivity and women's ability to participate in the workforce, knowing that their children are well cared for, that they can afford to make that decision to go back to work. We're extending pay parental leave progressively up to six months, but importantly, we're also making it fairer so that more families can access paid parental leave, including single parent families. We're establishing the Women's Economic Equality Task Force to provide advice to government and commence work on a national strategy to achieve gender equality. We supported a pay increase for aged care and low paid workers, overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly who are women. We have led negotiations with the states and territories to finalise the national plan to end violence against women and children. And we've backed this up with funding. $1.7 billion to implement the plan, including $83 million for consent and respectful relationship education and $100 million for crisis and transitional housing options for women and children fleeing domestic and family violence. We've legislated paid family and domestic violence leave, a huge and proud moment in this parliament. And we're funding and legislating to fully implement all 55 recommendations of the Respect at Work report. In addition to this, when it comes to women's health, we've established a National Women's Advisory Council to tackle medical misogyny. You don't have to dig too deep into our healthcare system to see how it disadvantages women. But the truth is, if you want to make these changes, these big structural changes, you have to do it as a party of government. There's only one party in this place who's delivered for women on these big structural issues, made meaningful strides towards gender equality. It's Labor, Labor, Labor. Thank you. Senator Tyrrell. Thank you, Acting Deputy. You may not know this, but five years ago, Tasmanian women needed to travel to Melbourne to access a surgical abortion. The last private surgical clinic in the state had shut down, and women had nowhere else to go. Women were generally spending over $1,500 to travel to another state to get access to the health care they needed, and some had to pay more. Access to safe termination services were bad. In practice, it was really only available to the people who could afford it. Now women in Tasmania can access surgical abortions through the public hospital system. And I think that's a really great thing. We've come a long way in the last five years, but access to a surgical termination is just one obstacle that's been removed for women who want an abortion in Tasmania. There's still a whole field of hurdles left to go. I've been speaking to some Tassie women's health organisations and listening to the evidence presented to the Senate inquiry into universal access to reproductive health care. I've heard that in Tassie it's cheaper and easier to access surgical termination than to access chemical termination. You need a spare $350 or so to get a chemical termination and you can get a rebate on this. In the end, you're out of pocket by about $150. But what if you don't have a spare $150 just lying around, let alone the $350 you need to pay up front before the rebate? Well, you go to the hospital because that's free. It's free for you but it costs the taxpayer around $3,000. You get a bed in the hospital, but that's a bed someone else can't get access to. 
Our system shouldn't be pushing people to access surgical terminations if there's less invasive, quicker and cheaper ways of doing things. We need better, cheaper access to chemical abortions. We need clinics in place that are serviced by public transport. They all need to be open at least five days a week. I'd like to hear from Tassie women and families about their experiences with access to termination services. I want to know what you need and what we can do to help you. Senator Polly. I'm proud to stand here today on International Women's Day as a member of the Albanese Labor government, the first ever majority government in Australia's history, the first ever women's majority government in Australia's history. Now, Australian Greens believe that women in Australia deserve genuine progress on women's safety health and economic security, and I couldn't agree more. And the Albanese Labor government could not agree more. That's why we've passed 10 days of paid family and domestic violence leave, appointed Ms Cronin as the first domestic family and sexual violence commissioner, delivered $1.3 billion in the October 2022 budget towards implementation of the National Plan to End Violence Against Women and Children in 2022-32, allocated $100 million for crisis and transitional housing options for older women at risk of homelessness and for women and children leaving family and domestic violence situations. We've invested in early childhood education and paid parental leave, supported a pay rise for our lowest paid workers and for aged care workers in particular that I've been fighting for for so long. We've supported those women, predominated by women in their workforce. We've established a National Women's Advisory Council to improve health outcomes for women and to tackle medical bias, committed to implementing all 55 recommendations from the Respect at Work report to ensure that our workplaces are environments that are free from harassment, assault and abuse. Australia is by no means perfect. Our globally standing on women's rights has dropped significantly, especially over the last 10 years in action and disregard by the previous government. But the work of the Albanese Labor government is righting these wrongs. We are working hard every day to ensure that women are safe and respected in the workplaces, in their homes and in our communities. I want to add that International Women's Day is a day to reflect on inspiring women within every community and none more so in my home state of Tasmania. We can also reflect on accomplishments of women in our lives and where we are achieving change and remember the journey we've taken personally. I remember campaigning for a girl's right at my high school to wear trousers instead of uniforms. Uh, of skirts during winter because it was so cold. I campaigned for girls' rights to study woodwork and metalwork in my high school. The campaign for gender equality continues as we try to end the gender pay gap, gap sorry, and ensure women and girls are afforded opportunities to succeed in whatever field or endeavours they choose to pursue in work and in life. And this week we spent a lot of time, particularly in question time, talking about the increase uh, superannuation changes that have been made for people that uh, have $3 million or more in their superannuation fund. Well, I remember as a young woman working in Melbourne in a short-term money market in the finance sector, and at that time you had to work for that company for 10 years before you might might be invited to join the superannuation scheme. So I thank Paul Keating, again, a Labor government that introduced superannuation, which gave 
uh, women like myself the opportunity to start earning some superannuation because, as we all know, there is a disadvantage for, for women when they leave the workforce to have their children and then when they come back in. And for people of my generation, for women of my generation, we just don't have the savings in superannuation that, thankfully, my daughters will have going forward. So there is still so much to be done. And I think instead of uh, you know, at times, people coming into this chamber and trying to make political uh, points. I urge, as I know others, including Senator Waters, uh, where we believe women should be working together, irrespective of where your political views are. The only way we're going to advance women and to give our daughters and granddaughters the future they deserve is if we work together, if we keep raising these issues to make people aware that women still don't have the same rights when it comes to earnings as what our male counterparts do. Thank you. Senator Orman Payne. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. One of the things that stands out to me each International Women's Day is how corporatised, white collar and lacking in class politics it's become. It's certainly a long way from its socialist origins. As BBC News was reporting today, the seeds of International Women's Day were planted in 1908 when 15,000 women marched through New York City demanding shorter working hours, better pay and the right to vote. The following year, the Socialist Party of America declared the first National Women's Day. The idea to make the, interna the day international came from Clara Zetkin, a communist activist and advocate for women's rights. Ms Setkin suggested the idea in 1910 at an international conference of working women in Copenhagen. There were 100 women there from 17 countries, and they agreed on her suggestion unanimously. Whilst many things have changed since 1910 for women, there is still much to be done. The fact of the matter is that women's economic security has a long way to go, and it's worse for women of colour, First Nations women, migrant women, trans women and for those of us who live in regional Australia. The gender pay gap still exists, including within many feminised professions, such as midwifery and teaching. Despite women making up 99 per cent of the midwifery workforce, the gender pay gap in that profession still sits at 19 per cent. The government is forcing women to wait to have 26 weeks of paid parental leave, and just last week the government said they'd like to add super to paid parental leave, but the budget can't accommodate it. In my community of Gladstone, women are still driving over 100 kilometres to Rockhampton to give birth, with the maternity unit still on bypass after 243 days. I reckon if men gave birth, this problem would have been sorted yesterday. And now women over 45 are the fastest growing group who are experiencing homelessness. It's the same story all over the country. There's always money for stage three tax cuts, which will overwhelmingly benefit rich blokes, but there's never enough for women's health or women's super or women's parental leave or women's salaries in feminised industries. We're sick to death of it. This morning on the radio, the Treasurer said that Labor's stage three tax cuts would go ahead, but the cost of living relief for people who are a paycheck away from homelessness or a meal away from starving would only be possible when inflation was tamed. Go down and, go down and tell a homeless woman that. Come up to Gladstone and tell the women that they'll have to drive over an hour on a potholed highway to give birth. Tell every woman in this country who is paid less than men that they'll have to wait. And meanwhile, you'll hand out your stage three tax cuts to rich blokes. It makes me sick. Happy International Women's Day, everyone. Thank you. Senator Hanson. I support helping women, but no doubt I'll be the only woman today speaking for the most oppressed and neglected minority in Australia, men. It's ironic that the women who bring men into the world are so ready to dismiss and abandon them to boost their orthodox feminist credentials. But in Australia, men are severely overrepresented in suicides, in prison, in homelessness and in unemployment. What has been done to close these enormous gaps? Nothing. In particular, Australian men are severely disadvantaged in the family law system and labourists make it worse by removing shared parenting. Men deserve a much 
as much access to the children as women do. Men deserve acknowledgement as representing a quarter of domestic violence victims. Men deserve help with their health issues. Men deserve much more recognition by this government and this parliament. How about we start with a minister for men? Thank you, Senator Barbara Pocock. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Happy International Women's Day to all my sisters uh, here and beyond the chamber. Um, today, uh, the government has given us what women have always craved for International Women's Day, a report card. We don't need another report card. I have a library of them, like every other gender equality advocate in the country. We could paper the walls of this place with the reports, report cards we have on gender equity. I'm sure uh, that many of people on, across this chamber could uh, contribute reports. We've seen so many. If report cards won the day on gender equity, we'd be in a paradise. We don't need report cards. We need action. We're told we have to wait. Well, I'm waiting for the day when we hear that defence has to wait for some things they really, really want. They want $170 billion to buy some submarines. Um, we could do with a bit of that going to women. So instead of a report card, I want to suggest a few things the government could do that are action. First of all, put super into paid parental leave. It won't close the gender super gap. It would narrow it by about 10 percentage points in my calculation, but it's an insult not to be doing it already. It's cost, it'll cost about 2.5 per cent of a Virginia-class Virginia submarine, probably the periscope. Secondly, 20 weeks paid parental leave now, not in 2026. Still only half the international standard. So while um, uh, we, while you're at it, we should do with, get a map going for 52 weeks as soon as possible, much less than a submarine would cost. Make childcare free, not just cheaper, but make it free. Fourth, give an immediate wage supplement to working carers who are leaving jobs that they love in droves across the aged care system, across childcare and disability. We women want more than a report card. We deserve better. We know our pay is 84 per cent of men's. We know we do more unpaid work than men. It's time to give us action and share out the public dollars that are there to support what we really need now. Thank you. Uh, the time for discussion has expired. I'm now going to put the question uh, that the uh, matter of importance uh, Sorry, the urgency motion on women's safety, health and economic security um, moved by Senator Waters is agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. no. I think the ayes have it. No. Division required. And bells for four minutes. Do you not want to divide? Okay. Cancelling the division. The, the ayes have it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Moving on to Matt. Sorry, uh, Senator Rustin. Uh, Madam Deputy um, President, um, I seek leave to move a motion in relation to setting up. I, I give notice. <laughs> I seek leave to give notice. <laughs> is left uh, granted. I don't think we'll be starting with John O seeks leave to give notice. Um, and he I, didn't have eight years as deputy. I, I seek, seek leave to give notice in relation to the general business motion for tomorrow afternoon. Uh, so I give notice on the next sitting day I shall move uh, that the Senate notes the Albanese government's broken promises to deliver cheaper power prices, cheaper mortgages, to not make any changes to super as well as broken promises on medicines, country doctors, Medicare and mental health. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Senator Rustin. <laughs> Moving on to the matter of importance, a uh, proposal from Senator Hughes has been received under Standing Order 75 as follows. Uh, dear President, pursuant to Standing Order 75, I propose that the following matter of public importance be submitted to the Senate for discussion. The government's failure to provide certainty about who and what will be taxed under Labor's broken promises for new super taxes and new franking credit taxes, including our hard-working farmers who are at risk of paying thousands more in 
in tax simply because of paper fluctuations in commercial property prices. Uh, is the proposal supported? Thank you. With the concurrence of <laughs> got one from the other side. With the concurrence of the Senate, the clerks will now set the clocks in lines with the informal arrangements made by whips. And I call Senator Hughes. Thank you, Matt, Madam Acting Deputy President. It's all going well for everyone today, isn't it? It's all running very, very smoothly. Uh, what's not going so smoothly, though, is the superannuation plans of so many Australians. I mean, it's just extraordinary. Day after day, we're now seeing broken promise after broken promise, pants on fire as they've once again deceived the Australian electorate into what they said they would do before the election and to what they are doing now. This government seems to think that it can somehow just push through lovely sounding ideas, no substance, no detail, how much it will cost, how it will actually work and who it will impact, but yet think that everyday Australians are just not going to notice. But the Australian people are smarter than this and they see through this plan. But what we do know about those opposite when they don't have a plan, when they can't stop spending, when they run out of money, they're going to come after yours. The Treasurer and the Prime Minister have been missing in action in addressing our cost of living crisis that is impacting every single Australian. And every decision they do make just makes a bad situation worse. They do enjoy appearing in front of the cameras with a sombre look on their faces as if to say they feel the pain of Australians that are doing it tough out there. But is there a solution? No. No, there's not. Let's just pray to God that the RBA governor's 10th consecutive rate does the trick. On a wing and a prayer, this Labor government is hopeful that the RBA will stop raising interest rates on their watch. Let's blame the war in Ukraine and let's blame the previous government for what's occurring. No responsibility taken and no transparency and no maintenance of maintaining their promises. As most Australians would know, they have a typical mortgage of over, uh, around $750,000. They're now paying $1,700 more a month. That's an extra $20,000 per year. That is an awful lot of money for a lot of families who are now struggling to make end meet. And what we do know as well is that not only is this impact causing great financial stress and the stress levels are increasing to such a level that Lifeline is increasing significant more activity and requirement for its services, there is actually data from Suicide Prevention Australia that shows that 46 per cent of Australians have reported feeling increased pressure as the cost of living rises to, continues to rise. This is up 5 per cent from last year. The decisions of this government have real impacts on real families and real people's lives. They're not doing enough to make the Reserves Bank easier. They're doing nothing to look after inflation. And What we do know is now, with an increase to, tra to taxes on truckies, they're going to further put pressure on inflation as the cost of absolutely everything in our country that's produced on a farm, everything thing that's manufactured in this country that utilises trucking services to get to the consumer, all of those prices are set to increase, adding inflationary pressure. Perhaps a few of those opposites should have attended the Parliamentary Friends of Trucking event that was held earlier this week, particularly around cold chain supply, uh, where Senator Stirl, their great colleague, long history in the trucking industry, spoke of the heroes that exist in the trucking industry. Yet his colleagues cannot more quickly than they can do, they can help it to make those truckies' lives difficult with increased taxes, with looking to make their road user charges increase. All of this they did not say before the last election. But I guess for those in the bush, it's not just looking at the logistical issues, it's just, just the trucking issues, it's not just the impact that these uh, broken promises will have on those farming families. But I think one of the greatest concerns is the change to this superannuation, uh, $3 million threshold that they claimed was 0.5 per cent, that we now know is 10 per cent, is the unrealised asset of the family farm. 
Never before have we seen an Australian government try and implement a tax on an unrealised asset, and yet when asked simply, when asked directly how many Australian families, how many self-managed super funds are going to be impacted, it's embarrassingly silent. The prevarication of a modest change. Well, I can tell you it's not a modest change if you get a paper value increase on the family farm as part of your self-managed super fund, and all of a sudden you've got a tax bill and have to sell the lifeblood and the history of your family to pay for this government's failure. Okay, I'll call Senator uh, Ayres. Just on a quick procedural matter, um, uh, there, there was some confusion at the end of that division. Uh, I didn't hear. I describe it as a change of shift issue um, with uh, with the uh, urgency that we just dealt with. Um, the Greens urgency. The Greens urgency. Yeah. Um, I want to I did not hear you rule on whether it was uh, ruled for the eyes or for the nose. I'd like at the very least for it to be recorded that Labor senators voted against the proposition and the question of whether we need to divide. I'd propose not to interrupt the, the matter that's been dealt with at the moment but may need to be dealt with at the conclusion of the current debate. Yes, that's right. So there's a there, there, there is that question, but that may lead to a subsequent decision by um, my friends in the Greens party that, that they would then seek for it to go to a division, which is fine, um, but I'd ask that that be dealt with at the conclusion of this debate. Uh, and um, Apologies for the confusion. Thank you for clearing that up, Senator Ayres. So maybe if I, sorry, Senator O'Sullivan? We'll deal with it uh, at the conclusion, but uh, in case we don't, I'll just state that the uh, opposition also voted no. Okay. So maybe I'll put the question again, or would you like it dealt with at the end? We're, we're in the middle of the coalition's NPI. I'm right. very happy for them to proceed with that. I don't want to interrupt that. But also, give my uh, colleagues the lead to say anything about the solvent situation. We'll deal with that at the end. So we'll continue with the NPI. Thank you for uh, clarifying that, you. Senator Ayres. Uh, I now call Senator Sheldon. Good, thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. Well, you know, the Liberals used to pretend they were, they were standing up for working people. Now we know they're only standing up for the 0.5 per cent. And not about the fact that the 0.5 per cent are paying appropriate amount of tax for the fact that they should be turning around in superannuation and paying an amount of tax which is appropriate to the amount of money they had. Because have, because we all know that superannuation, we all know, the country knows it, the people opposite me don't know it, superannuation was built on the fact and the purpose was to make sure that we have money set aside for every Australian to be able to retire in a good and faithful way. And because what, because what it is is because we have the Liberals, you know, they have abandoned Howard's battlers, they're now just about Dutton's billionaires. That's what they're about, because we've initiated a, a, a response to the fact that this trillion dollars worth of debt has been placed onto this country because of the excessive and inappropriate nature of how these people recklessly spent without investing on improving productivity in this country. Because then we saw wages go down, we saw productivity go down because they flopped it, they failed. And of course, we as a country are paying the consequences. So what we're saying to those many billionaires is that, yes, there's still a tax benefit, but the tax benefit has changed. Because someone we have to weigh to turn around and look at this minor change to make sure that we have the opportunity to start paying down their debt. Their debt. And the people that are most capable of paying that down are the ones that are still getting a tax benefit, but not the tax benefit that they are receiving for a scheme that they have been rotting against the intent of what the scheme was for. Because the scheme was always for to make sure that there was a fair and reasonable retirement scheme. So what they have managed to do and what we have been saying is that those people that are on the 0.5 per cent that have actually turned around and minimised their tax, not illegally, legally, but against the spirit of what that legislation was and because of the nature of what the, the, those opposite have done with a trillion dollars debt, that they should turn around and make a contribution, because they still have an opportunity after the election, on, in, between now and the election, about how they deal with those changes of circumstances. But I really want to point out one of the billionaires 
that these people are supporting across the way. Billionaire property magnate John Gandall has slammed the federal government's proposed change. And I'm reading from an article from the Sydney Morning Herald um, by Ms. Uh, Ms. Sample on the 2nd of March. Gandall made the criticism on Wednesday by the, of, at the launch of a $70 million entertainment precinct at the huge Chadston shopping centre in Melbourne, southeast, that the co-owns with Vicinity Centre's property group. Now, the mall magnate, it goes on to say, was frustrated by the government's decision to double the tax on earnings on superannuation balances over three million, and said it would inevitably affect more than just the country's top earners. He says a tax high hike on the top earners of the country who have worked hard in this country will always come down on the middle class. Now, this is John Gandall, right? John Gandall. Now, for those that don't recall the history of some of the history of super. The people opposite stopped the lowest paid people in this country, people that were getting the minimum superannuation on International Women's Day, particularly women who are disadvantaged under superannuation, from getting the superannuation guarantee increased. In actual fact, from 2014 to 2020, from the per capita inquiry into the super consequences of their delay, it cost the average worker on fifty odd thousand dollars a year, four thousand three hundred dollars, nine percent of their entire income for a year was stolen by these people across here, and they're worrying about Mr. Chandle. Of course, he is worried about the middle class, because he obviously. Oh, no, second thoughts. I've looked and I've looked. No, he never spoke up about the fact that the minimum increase for superannuation, the superannuation guarantee, had to be fixed for the middle class. Because what he's doing, he's conflating his own self-interest, because that $4,300 that would have been going into the dozens and hundreds and thousands of people that work in companies that he either directly employs or employs through his developments would have got that money. So he pocketed that money and guess where he put it? I guess he put it into his superannuation scheme. He took it out of theirs and put it in his. That's what he did. Thank Dutton's you, billionaires Senator won out. Your time has expired. Senator McKim. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Well, <laughs> here we go again for the third day out of the three sitting days this week. We're getting uh, a slightly different version of the, the pity the multimillionaires routine that uh, the Liberal National Party loves so much to run. Um, it's really interesting that they would include um, farmers in, uh, in their wording on this motion. I talk to a lot of farmers and you know the number one thing, almost universally, the very first thing farmers bring up with me is climate change. That's what they bring up with me. What do we hear about the Liberals on climate change? How to oppose real climate action. That's what we hear from the Liberals. We've just had 10 successive rate rises um, by the RBA, absolutely smashing anyone, including farmers, who is carrying debt. Uh, what do we hear from Mr Dutton about that? Absolutely nothing. And yet here we go, when the only people who are going to be affected by the government's very modest fiddling at the margins proposal on superannuation tax concessions are the multimillionaires, and suddenly, oh, well, what about uh, the hard-working farmers. Well, undoubtedly, many farmers do work hard, but I want to make the point that just because somebody is a hard-working farmer, it doesn't mean they're not rich, and it doesn't mean, if they are rich, that they shouldn't be paying their fair share of tax. Because if farmers are going to be impacted by the changes that Labor is proposing to the superannuation tax concessions, then by definition they are at the wealthy end of the spectrum. So this is just another example of the LNP uh, using farmers to run their pity the multimillionaires argument. But of course this is more than just a pity the multimillionaires argument we're hearing today. By calling on Labor not to break election promises, that is of course the way that the Liberals are defending their much loved stage three tax cuts for the top end defending a quarter of a trillion dollars worth of tax cuts that the top 20 per cent 
of earners get 80 per cent of the benefit of. And on International Women's Day, defending a quarter of a trillion dollars worth of tax cuts where men get twice the benefit of women. I mean, happy International Women's Day, everyone on the LNP side of the chamber coming in here and defending the stage three tax cuts where women will only get half the benefit that men do. Shame on you all. Thank you. Senator Brockman. Well, we've just heard it. We've just heard it. The Labor Greens Alliance never met a tax they didn't like. We've just heard it from Senator McKim claiming to know the views of farmers. Well, I do talk to farmers, Senator McKim. I talk to farmers every day. And I have talked to a number of farmers on this superannuation issue. And I can tell you right now, Senator McKim, they are concerned about these issues. They are concerned about these issues. You laugh. Senator Ayres, but farmers are concerned about these issues, and I'll, I'll explain to you why, because I don't think you understand, and I don't think this government understands, and I certainly know the Greens don't understand. Farmers uh, uh, are not necessarily cash-rich. Cash Their asset significantly. They have significant assets at various times, but they are not cash-rich. One of the legitimate ways they prepare for their retirement is to put farming property into super funds. And this is not just true of farmers, this is true of small business owners, particularly in regional areas where they will put their premises into their super fund. It is true of professionals, not just in not just in not just in you're laughing at the farmers again, Senator Ayres. It's professionals, not just in regional Order. Australia, not just in regional Australia, but in, in, in our south capital cities, where professionals put their offices into their super funds, and then the farmer will retire, and their super fund may not be generating large amounts of cash. In fact, it may only be generating enough cash to pay a pension. So, what happens then when they get this tax bill from the government? What happens then when they get this tax bill? And I want all Australians to understand out there that $3 million land holding in a super fund is not a massive amount. A, a, a property that was purchased, a property that was purchased, say in the 1980s and placed into a super fund, could easily have appreciated. Could easily have appreciated. So you've got a super fund which has got a large physical asset in it, Senator McKim, but it's not generating that much cash. It's only generating enough cash for the, for the person involved to take out their pension. So what do then they have to do when they get the tax bill from the government? What do they have to do? They have to either pay the tax out of their own pocket or they have to sell assets. That is the reality of what the government is proposing here today. And this doesn't just affect farmers, this affects small business owners who have their, their uh, uh, at property assets, uh, possibly their business in their uh, super fund. Again, these are people who don't necessarily take an income directly. They don't necessarily have a lot of cash to put in super. They have an asset, a physical asset in super. This is the first time that the appreciation in value of that physical asset is being taxed before the asset is realised. Before the sale of an asset is turned into cash, it is being taxed. And that is grossly unfair. And what we're seeing here from this government in alliance with the Greens, we can see the Greens trying to push them into even more taxes, and the Labor government will pretend they're resisting, but they'll go along with it in the end. They'll go along with it in the end because they've never seen a tax they don't like. And farmers are worried about this. And I've spoken to the farmers. And, and I've, I've said to farmers, I've said, how many people, how many of your, 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 your fellow farmers, uh, you're in this position, but how many of your fellow farmers would have property in, in self-managed superannuation? And they, the, the words that were said back to me was, well, definitely the majority. Definitely the majority. This is not an uh, unusual practice. This is not a big end of town practice. This is not something that only you know, highly wealthy farming uh, families are doing. This is a legitimate way of planning for their retirements in a way that was, was completely legal, completely allowed, and they plan for their retirements by putting this property, uh, whether it's farming property, whether it's, it's residential uh, uh, or, or real estate, whether it's, it's, it's a business premises, whether it's professional offices, 
into their super funds to plan for their retirements. They don't necessarily have a lot of cash, and that's the reality of a lot of small business owners. That's the reality of a lot of small business owners. They're not cash rich. They may have assets. They may have assets that, in your view, those opposites' view puts them in the big end of town, but they're cash poor. And if you are taxing an unrealised asset, then the only way to find the cash to pay that tax is either to take it out of your own pocket or to sell the asset. And that is a disgrace. Thank you. Senator Payman. Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. I'm really glad to be here again to be able to respond to the ridiculous claims being made by the opposition. I'm happy to explain in detail exactly the modest proposal we have made, because apparently some of you still don't get it. But first, I want to ask, what was, where was this passion and concern when you were in government? You have left us with a trillion dollars of debt and nothing to show for it. So why now the hysteria as we propose these modest changes Order. to repair the budget? Order. The hypocrisy from those on the other side is astounding and Australians can see right through it. Our Treasurer, Jim Chalmers, has always been honest and open with Australians and we're happy to continue having this conversation. We're making modest adjustments to superannuation tax breaks for earnings on balances above $3 million. This change won't come into effect until after the next election. 99.5% of Australians with super accounts will keep receiving the same generous tax breaks, and the 0.5% of people with balances above $3 million will still receive tax breaks, just slightly less generous. There continues to be no limit on the amount of money people can put into their super in the accumulation phase, and it applies to future earnings. It's not retrospective. Since coming to government, we've been upfront about the challenges facing the economy and the budget. We inherited a trillion dollars in debt, as well as growing spending pressures in defence, health, aged care and the NDIS. This is about responsible economic management, something I think those on the other side have yet to wrap their heads around. Right now, Australians are making hard choices around the kitchen table about their priorities, and it's important that the government does the same thing around the cabinet table. Today, on International Women's Day, I also want to acknowledge that gender inequality exists within super. Women retire with less than men, and the average super balance of a woman is in the order of $140,000. The Labor Party is serious about doing more to address inequality while also repairing the budget. Part of addressing that is dealing with wage rises for feminised industries in which women are typically underpaid, such as aged care, which we have delivered already. Now, our, our highest priority is targeted cost of living relief in the budget, while the Liberals' highest priority is bigger tax breaks for people who already have tens of millions of dollars in super. I think it's about time the opposition had a look in the mirror and got serious about helping Australians who need it. You could have chosen to rise to the moment and get serious about working for all Australians, but instead you've jumped straight into stoking fear and division. The Liberals know, as well as we do, that they've left us with a trillion dollars of debt. And so it really astounds me that they now want us to borrow more money to subsidise people with millions of dollars already in their superannuation accounts. Is this really the hill you want to die on? Is this really more important than energy bill relief for pensioners? Than more affordable housing for women fleeing domestic violence? Than supporting manufacturing jobs? What about the cheaper childcare uh, for families? I certainly don't see it that way. And after hearing the contributions from senators opposite, I'm even more thankful that the adults Order. are back in Order. charge. We have to address the challenges in the budget. There's no getting around that. No beating around the bush and no uh, burying our heads in the sand. Order. And we could, we could make tax concessions for people with millions of dollars more sustainable, making the system fairer or, for everyone, 
Or we could go after the most vulnerable, like the Liberals did with robo-debt and attacking Medicare. Well, Order. Acting Deputy President, I'm proud of our choices and I'm proud that our Treasurer and Prime Minister have been upfront with the Australian people. Don't forget that it was the Australian people who voted us to clean your mess. The decade of delay, denial and destruction that you left them in. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Payman. Senator Davey. Thank you, and thank you so much, Senator Payman, for opening the way for me to remind people what they voted for. They voted for a government who said that they would cut electricity bills by $275. Broken promise. That people would have cheaper mortgages. Broken promise. That there would be no changes to superannuation broken promise, there would be lower inflation, broken promise, that they would not touch franking credits, broken promise, that there would not be industry-wide bargaining, it's not part of our policy, they said, broken promise, we will be do our, doing our bit to assist real wage rises, broken promise. I can go on and on and on about broken promises. In fact, the only promise they won't break is the promise to go out and buy water from innocent farmers. But I digress on the real issue today. The real issue today is that while Senator Payman is talking about people with tens of millions of dollars in super, and over in the other place the Assistant Treasurer is talking about people with hundreds of millions of dollars in super, the reality is what Labor want to do is tax people people at a threshold of just three million. Why won't you talk about the three million, Senator Payman? Why won't the Assistant Treasurer in the other place talk about the three million? Because as we learnt this week, it's not 0.5 per cent of the population that these super taxes will hit. It's a minimum of 10 per cent of the population. Someone who is 37 today, in 30 years' time when they're re ready to retire, will be hit by these taxes. And now we are learning that, uh, when asked in question time today, the Assistant Treasurer basically admitted. He said that, yes, farmers or family businesses who have their assets in self-managed future should have just put more money aside for li liquidity fluctuations. He said super is about providing a retirement income stream, but in the same breath said that the very people who have put assets in their super for their retirement income stream should have put more cash aside to pay their taxes. The Assistant Treasurer basically said Farmers holding farmland or family businesses holding their assets in self-managed super funds could be forced to pay tens of thousands more in taxes under Labor's superannuation changes due to nothing more than fluctuations in volatile commercial property prices. Now we are not talking about the few people with mainstream super that have balances over three million. We are talking about the very same hardworking people who have planned for their retirement. As the Assistant Treasurer said today, superannuation is about providing adequate retirement savings. And that's exactly what these people we're talking about have been doing. And now they're being told, oh, if your paper valuation of your assets goes up, you need enough liquid cash to be able to pay your tax. The National Farmers Federation have warned that these superannuation changes could call investment in agriculture. Now, I, for one, have been talking ad infinitum about the need for Australians to invest in Australian agriculture. We need Australian super firms to invest in Australian agriculture. Indeed, overseas super firms think Australian agriculture is a great investment. Look at the Canadian superannuation funds. They invest over here. They won't be hit by these taxes, but we will call our own investment in Australian agriculture through these changes. For many farmers, their farm is their superannuation, and it's not uncommon, uncommon to hold land assets in superannuation. But in what we've learnt today, where they say that Labor will tax unrealised paper gains. So if that's a yes for property, it's also a yes for shares. 
and if it's a yes for shares, it must also then apply to direct, um, defined benefit funds. And it must also apply to the hundreds of Commonwealth public servants who have high superannuation pension funds that will also be quaking in fear by what we are learning drip by drip, just like water torture, every time we hear more about this Labor super tax. Uh, thank you, Senator Davey. Uh, the time uh, for this discussion has expired. Uh, and I understand that we uh, need to uh, vote on um, Senator McKim's urgency uh, motion um, uh, and that that needs to occur for reasons that precede my presence in the chair. Uh, so I will now um, put the question uh, that the motion moved by Senator McKim be agreed. Uh, those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. no. I think the noes have it. Is a division required? Uh, a division is required. Uh, ring the bells for four minutes.
lock the doors. The question is that the motion moved by Senator McKim be agreed. The ayes will move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator McKim for the ayes and Senator Cadell for the noes. <laughs> the result of the division is ayes 11, noes 24. The question is resolved in the negative. And uh, for the convenience of the chamber, I don't think we're expecting another division anytime soon. So if honourable senators wanted to leave the chamber or or stay and listen. They, they are more than welcome to do so. Uh, I shall now proceed to the consideration of documents. The documents are listed on page four of today's order of business. Uh, and I am looking around the chamber to see whether anybody has anything to say about the documents listed on page four of today's order of business. And it doesn't appear that there are any contributions on that. Uh, so we are now moving to tabling and consideration of committee reports and government responses. And uh, Senator Eckert. Yes, I might just do um, a couple and get them out of the way. So, on behalf of the Joint Standing Committee on Treaties, I present the committee's 206th report. And on behalf of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security, I present the report of the committee on its review of the 2022 relisting of four organisations as terrorist organisations under the Criminal Code. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Urquhart. Senator Chacon. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I present the Scrutiny Digest No. 2 of 2023 of the Standing Committee for the Scrutiny Appeals, and I move that the Senate take note of the report. Um, but I also would like to make some contributions as well, too, if I could, please. Uh as um, the chair of the Standing Committee for the scr uh, scrutiny of bills um, from today, and I do note that Senator Dean Smith, uh, who's actually the chair, is not, uh, um, I, I wasn't able to uh, be here today. So as the deputy chair, but acting as chair, I, I rise to um, speak on the tabling of the Scrutiny's Digest Number 2 of 2023. The Digest contains the committee's assessment of all the bills recently introduced into the parliament. Each bill is assessed against the committee's technical scrutiny principles set out in the Standing Order 24. These principles focus on the effect of the proposed legislation on parliamentary scrutiny and individual rights, uh, liberties and obligations. Importantly, the committee has a strong and long-standing commitment to the non-partisan uh, non, uh, par non ship and accordingly the Digest does not consider the policy merits of bills. Scrutiny Digest No. 2 uh, of 2023 reports on the committee's consideration of 18 bills, which were introduced into the parliament during the recent sitting weeks. 
It also contains the committee's comments on recent ministerial responses in relation to 11 bills. In this digest, uh, the committee has welcomed several undertakings made in response to the committee's recommendations. For instance, the Minister for Health and Aged Care has accepted the committee's recommendations to amend the Private Health Insurance Legislation Amendment, Medical Device and Human Tissue Product List and Cost Recovery Bill 2022. The bill seeks to provide the minister with a discretionary power to delist certain kinds of medical devices or human tissue products where a person who is liable to pay a relevant cost recovery fee or levy has failed to do so. Delisting would remove a private health insurer's mandatory obligation to pay a set benefit in relation to the relevant medical device or human tissue product. Similarly, the bill would provide the minister with a discretionary power to direct that certain activities not be carried out where a person has failed to pay a cost recovery fee or a levy. For example, a bill would allow the minister to refuse to carry out services in relation to a request to list a new product if the applicant has not paid the application fee. Now, following the committee's recommendation, the Minister for Health and Aged Care has undertaken to introduce an amendment which would require the minister to first have regard to certain matters prior to making a decision. Namely, the minister would be required to consider whether the exercise of the discretionary powers would adversely affect the interests of patients or significantly and adversely limit the professional freedom of medical practitioners. And I thank the minister on behalf of the committee for his constructive engagement with this committee. I'd also like to highlight the committee's comments in relation to two bills which introduce new powers to allow for automated decision making. The use of computer processes to assist government decision making has significant administrative benefits, including increased consistency, efficiency and accuracy. However, if used inappropriately, these processes have the potential to impact on rights of individuals and may lead to legal error. The committee therefore closely scrutinises any proposal which, uh, which um, uh, automated decision-making processes to determine whether its use is adequately justified and is subject to appropriate safeguards. The committee generally expects these safeguards to be set out on the face of a bill rather than within delegated legislation. Administrative law typically requires decision-makers to engage in an active intellectual process to respect so in, in respect of the decisions they are required or empowered to make. A failure to engage in such a process, for example, where decisions are made by computer rather than by a person, may lead to a legal error. In addition, there are risks that the use of an automated decision-making process may operate as a fetter on discretionary power by inflexibly applying to predetermined criteria or decisions that should be made on the merits of the individual case. Now, these matters are particularly relevant to more complex or discretionary decisions. The Treasury Laws Amendment uh, 2023 Measures No. 1, Bill 2023, seeks to amend the Corporations Act of 2001 to alter the process by which ASIC deals with applications for financial advisors reg uh, register. The bill would allow uh, ASIC to arrange for the use of computer processes to assist decision making for purposes for which ASIC may make decision in relation to registration. There are several safeguards set out within the bill in relation to the use of automated decision making, including that ASIC may change a decision that has been made by a computerised process if it is satisfied that the decision is wrong. The committee welcomes these safeguards. However, the committee is concerned about the breadth of the power to arrange for use of computer processes to assist in decision making. It is unclear to the committee why this power could not be narrowed to particular decisions. For example, providing, by, by providing that such processes would only allow for binary, non-discretionary decisions. The committee therefore requested the Treasurer's uh, advice in relation to whether all of the relevant decisions will be non-discretionary, what processes ASIC has in place to identify potentially incorrect decisions made by a computer, and what policies are in place to ensure that the integrity and the transparency of the decision-making process. 
The Migration uh, Amendment, Australia's Engagement in the Pacific and Other Measures Bill of 2023, would establish a new framework for a visa pre-application process. The intention that the new framework would allow computer processes to be used randomly to select eligible persons from a pool of applicants who may then apply for a relevant visa upon selection. In this case, automated decision making will only be used in relation to non-discretionary decisions, given that the process is intended to be random and that eligibility requirements for the registration of a person must be objective. The non-discretionary nature of these decisions significantly reduces the committee's concerns. However, the committee is nonetheless concerned that a majority of the detail as to how the automated decision-making process is intended to operate is being left to delegated legislation. Indeed, while the bill has been introduced in anticipation of the creation of the Pacific Engagement Visa, the framework nature of the bill would provide for the power to undertake visa pre-application process in relation to any visa. The committee therefore expressed the view that further safeguards in relation to the use of computer processes should be set out in the bill. For example, the committee has recommended that it may be appropriate to allow a departmental officer to review data input, inputted into the system to ensure that any mistakes made by an individual do not preclude them from eligibility. The committee has also recommended that the bill set out clear arrangements for the ongoing monitoring and evaluation of the computer system. The committee has requested the Minister for Home Affairs advice in relation to these matters. I encourage uh, all senators and members of the other place to carefully consider the committee's analysis that's contained in this digest. With these comments, I commend the committee's scrutiny digest number two of 2023 to the Senate. Thank you, Deputy President. Uh, thank you, Senator Chacon. And the question is that the Senate take note of the report. Those of that opinion say aye. Uh, those against say no. The ayes have it. Senator White. Uh, I present delegated legislation and monitor three of 2023 of the Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation, together with the ministerial correspondence relating to the report. And I move that the Senate take note of the report. And I have uh, some comments to make in relation to uh, the tabling. This monitor reports on the committee's consideration of 54 legislative instruments registered between. 1 February 2023 and the 20th of February 2023, as well as the committee's ongoing consideration of instruments registered in previous periods. I would first uh, like to draw the Chamber's attention to the committee's scrutiny of two instruments in the Treasury portfolio. The Corporations Amendment Litigation Funding Regulations 2022 provide litigation funding schemes with explicit exemptions from the Corporations Act, including the product disclosure regime and anti-hawking provisions. The Treasury Laws Amendment Rationalising ASIC Instruments Regulations 2022 similarly inserts ongoing exemptions to, uh, to requirements in the Corporations Act and the Consumer Credit Protection Act. It is the committee's long-standing view that the modifications to or exemptions from primary law should be set out in the primary law itself. When these measures are in delegated legislation, the committee expects there will be, they will be time-limited to ensure frequent parliamentary oversight. This also provides the executive with the ability to assess whether the measures remain appropriate and necessary. Not only do these instruments insert a number of exemptions to primary legislation, but they are in place on an ongoing basis as the measures are not subject to the usual 10-year sunsetting period. It is of particular concern that the rationalising ASIC instruments regulations have the effect of shifting exemptions previously contained in individual legislative instruments, usually time limited to a period of three to five years, or at a minimum subject to sunsetting pe periods, into the principal regulations which are exempt from sunsetting. This means that these exemptions from primary law are being placed in delegated legislation indefinitely, which is a significant scrutiny concern for the committee. For this reason, the committee sought the Assistant Treasurer's advice as to why it was necessary and appropriate to introduce these exemptions in delegated rather than primary legislation. Further, the committee asked whether there is any intention to move the exemptions 
into primary legislation and, if not, whether the instrument can be time limited. The Assistant Treasurer advised that there is no intention to in introduce the exemptions in primary law or to time limit them. He advised that delegated legislation is the most appropriate place for the exemptions. He also advised that including the exemptions in the instrument would ensure they are co-located with existing exemptions and time lim limiting them would only introduce uncertainty and confusion. Unfortunately, this response did not address the committee's scrutiny concerns about this matter. For this reason, the committee is now seeking the assistant treasurer's further, uh, including, uh, further advice, including whether the primary legislation could be amended to include these exemptions. The other instrument I would like to draw the Chamber's attention to is the Telecommunications Amendment Disclosure of Information for the Purpose of Cyber Security Regulations 2022. This instrument has the effect of permitting carriers and carriage service providers to disclose government identifiers to financial services entities and government uh, agency. it all, agencies. It also enables the minister to expand and specify by notifiable instrument the class of information that can be disclosed. The minister has since confirmed that this involves the disclo disclosure of personal information. The committee considered the use of notifiable instruments in its inquiry into the exemption of delegated legislation from parliamentary oversight. It formed the view that classifying instruments as notifiable rather than legislative instruments significantly limits the parliament's scrutiny function. This is because notifiable instruments are not subject to the usual tabling, disallowance or sunsetting processes. This concern is heightened when the subject matter of the notifiable instrument is significant. For this reason, the committee sought the Minister for Communications advice about why it was necessary and appropriate to use notifiable rather than legislative instruments to expand the classes of personal information that can be disclosed. The, the minister advised that the, instruments aim, the instrument aims to provide a degree of flexibility so that they can quickly respond to emergency, emerging data breaches. Further, she advised that notifiable instruments are inherently more certain than legislative instruments because they do not face the prospect of disallowance. The minister also noted that while parliamentary scrutiny is normally desirable, it can create delay and uncertainty when swift and decisive action is needed. While the committee appreciates the need to swiftly respond to data breaches as they emerge, the committee reiterates that a potential for disallowance does not prevent the government from acting quickly and decisively. The disallowance process does not inhibit the immediate commencement and enforceability of instruments, nor does it invalidate any actions taken under the instrument prior to disallowance. Further, the committee has not previously accepted justifications such as the need for certainty, flexibility and the need to act urgently on their own to be an adequate justification for an exemption from parliamentary oversight. Further, the committee considers the disclosure of personal information to be a serious matter and expanding the types of information that can be disclosed is not a mere matter of detail. For, for this reason, the committee reiterates its scrutiny concerns about the use of notifiable instruments in this instance and is seeking the minister's advice as, ha as to whether the instrument can be amended to enable the use of legislative rather than notifiable instruments to expand the class of disclosable uh, information. With these comments, I commend the committee's delegated legislation, Monitor 3 of 2023, to the Senate. Thank you, Senator White. Senator Chandler, on the same issue? On a different report, Chair. Uh, um, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, sorry, which report? Uh, I'm rising to take note of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence okay. and Security report. Thank you. So, uh, sorry, Senator Chandler, I might just need to put uh, that the report um, by, uh, on the Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation be agreed to. All that in favour say aye. All those against say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Thank you, Senator Chandler. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, and I rise to take note of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security report, review of the 2022 relisting of four organisations as terrorist organisations under the Criminal Code. I welcome the opportunity to speak briefly to acknowledge this bipartisan report and its recommendations here in the Senate this evening. This report of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security supports the relisting of two affiliates of al-Qaeda and two affiliates of the Islamic State. The report by the committee makes clear that these are groups involved in engaging in terrorism. 
It is absolutely appropriate that they are therefore relisted as terrorist organisations under the Criminal Code Act. I think it's relevant to note here, uh, while we are talking about Al Qaeda, the confirmation by the United Nations and the United States State Department that the current leader of Al Qaeda is based in Iran. As a State Department spokesperson said in February, offering safe havens to Al Qaeda is another example of Iran's wide-ranging support for terrorism. And we know that the group which, uses Iran, uh, which Iran uses to fund and support terrorism is the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps. That is why the IRGC is designated as a foreign terrorist organisation by the United States. The recent Senate committee inquiry, which I chaired, found that Australia too should take the necessary steps to list the IRGC as a terrorist organisation. There is no question that the IRGC is engaged in terrorist activity. No serious authority is disputing this. That is why the Iranian-Australian community keeps asking when steps will be taken to ensure that the IRGC is listed as a terrorist organisation. We need leadership and we need action from the government here, but all we are getting is hands up in the air saying that it can't be done. And with that, Madam Acting Deputy President, I seek leave to continue my remarks. Thank you, Senator Chandler. Um, so I'll put the question that the parliamentary joint uh, the You are seeking leave to be in continuation? Thank you. Okay. Um, I put the question that the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security report. Um, unless there's any other committee reports, no, we will move on to ministerial statements. Are there any ministerial statements? Minister Watt. Acting Deputy President. Um, I table documents relating to orders for the production of documents concerning the government's response to the Samuel Review, budget funding for the Environmental Defenders Office and, the, and Environmental Justice Australia, the potential World Heritage listing of the Burrup Peninsula and the Bunbury Outer Ring Road project. Okay. We'll move to uh, messages. Sorry. Thank you. The president has received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the Referendum Machinery Provisions Amendment Bill 2022 for concurrence. I call the minister. I move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. So I put the question. Those in favour say aye. aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Uh, I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to referendums and for related purposes. Minister. I move that this bill be now read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? All those in favour say aye. aye. All those against say no. Leave granted. Minister. I move that the debate be now adjourned. So I'll put the question that. Sorry. I put the question that the debate be adjourned. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Minister. Thanks, Acting Deputy President. Sorry. I move that the resumption of the debate be an order of the day for a later hour. So I'll put the question. All those in favour say aye. Those aye. against say no. The ayes have it. Sorry, Minister. Uh, I also table a replacement explanatory memorandum relating to the telecommunications Legislation Amendment, Information Disclosure, National Interest and Other Measures Bill 2022. Um, I call the clerk. Government Business Orders of the Day Number 2, Therapeutic Goods Amendment 2022 Measures Number 1 Bill. Uh, second reading debate and on the motion moved by Senator Steele-John. 
Senator Roberts, I understand you're in continuation. That's correct. Please. Thank you. As a servant to the many varied people making up the amazing Queensland community and Australian nation, I speak to the Therapeutic Goods Amendment Bill 2022. It's significant in my speech's opening that I refer to myself as a servant to the Queensland and Australian people. Whoever wrote this bill is not a servant of the people. In fact, the proposer of this bill sees the people as their servants, slaves, serfs. It destroys fundamental human rights, smashes fundamentals of law, removes the tried and true system for authorising new drugs and places the Australian public at the mercy and under the control of unelected bureaucrats. These same bureaucrats proved themselves unfit to exercise their current already disproportionately large power during COVID, all with no accountability. First, let me explain this bill's provisions. Introducing a framework for the mandatory reporting of adverse events. One Nation supports this measure. Introduces, secondly, introduces a new marketing approval pathway for biologicals for export only. One Nation supports this. Enables the Secretary of the Department of Health and Aged Care to approve the importation or supply of overseas prescription medicines that are substitutes for existing medicines with no checks and balances on that process. One Nation opposes this measure. Fourth, it eliminates the human rights of people to contest decisions on the provision of documents the Secretary requires. One Nation totally opposes the removal of common law rights to due process. Next, enabling the Secretary to require any person to provide information or documents relevant to a possible contravention of the Act. This bill does not do so fairly and therefore we do not support this provision. Permitting therapeutic goods advertising. In the absence of a justification for making this charge, One Nation opposes this. It clarifies the Secretary is not obliged to observe natural justice. One Nation will defend the rights of everyday Australians to enjoy basic human rights provided across 1,500 years of common law, and so we oppose this provision. This is a significant bill with new powers and provisions that did not go to committee inquiry. It's, that sums up the arrogance of this Soviet-level government that such a wide-ranging bill, removing basic human rights, smashing legal principles, containing significant penalties and coercion, and with a huge impact on the approval of new drugs, would be forced through Parliament without being subject to committee inquiry, especially after the separate scrutiny of Bill's committee in its seven-page report thrashed the Therapeutic Goods Amendment Bill 2022. Here are the main elements of that criticism. One, reversal of the evidential burden of proof. Item two of Schedule five of this bill seeks to insert a proposed section 45 AC into the Therapeutic Goods Act 1989 to create an offence for failing to comply with the notice from the Secretary requiring document production. Section 45 AC three provides the defence of reasonable excuse, yet the defendant must prove their defence. In simple terms, this bill treats anyone coming to the attention of the Secretary of the Health Department as guilty and less proven innocent. The presumption of innocence dates from Roman Emperor Justinian in the 6th century and for 15 centuries has remained a fundamental principle of Western law. If the bill allowed the normal checks and balances that criminal and civil courts provide, the defence of reasonable excuse would not be necessary. It would be available automatically. This bill is extinguishing a defendant's existing legal rights. All this smashing of legal rights and principles from a Labor government. Secondly, strict liability offences. Item 2 of Schedule 5 proposes to introduce subsections 45AC2 and AD2, which contain strict liability offences for failing to comply with a notice to produce documents. The recipient of a notice does not have to be a large corporation that can afford the compliance cost. It can be any medical professional or administrator. If the recipient fails to produce a notice as the secretary demands, then a strict liability offence is committed. If the defendant was in hospital the whole time, for instance, it doesn't matter. Here's the fine, $27,000, pay up, no appeals. Does that sound fair? No. Thirdly, procedural fairness. Item 1, Schedule 10 to the bill, seeks to insert subsection 6113 into the Act so that the secretary is not required to observe any requirements of natural justice in relation to releasing information under the Act. What does the secretary think they are? Fourth, incorporation of external material. These are all criticisms from the Scrutiny of Bills Committee. Instruments made under items 12, 15, 16, 20 and 30 of this bill allow for the later inclusion of any written matter from any suitable source. 
The material itself is not included, so anyone subject to some government action under this bill will have no idea of the full legal position they're operating in. How can Australians follow the law if we're not able to determine what the law is? We cannot. The last time this was used was to remove the reference in the Banking Code of Practice to the International Standard for Handling Customer Disputes, which was only available to paying customers from an American company that maintained the code. That document established banking customers had rights they were unaware of. Linking to the document, instead of explicitly setting out those rights, let the banks run riot from 2003 through to the Banking Royal Commission final report in 2019. The ALP have clearly learnt nothing from history, or they have deliberately ignored history. These four criticisms alone of the bill from the Senate's Scrutiny of Bills Committee are all valid. The Soviet-style government should, should have addressed all before the bill came to the Senate. I urge all senators to vote this bill down, resist the attack on common law rights and restore principles of law that everyday Australians have held since Western settlement of our beautiful country. And slipped into the Therapeutic Goods Amendment Bill 2022 are provisions that circumvent the approval process for new drugs. The policy direction implicit in Schedule 9 should have been sent, set out in a separate bill sent to the committee, widely consulted and properly debated. So extreme is this provision. Schedule 9 to be, quote, the Secretary may approve the importation into Australia or the supply in Australia of specified therapeutic goods if the Secretary is satisfied, A, that there are no registered goods that could act as a substitute for the subject goods, and that all of the following apply. The subject goods are not registered or approved for general marketing in any of the foreign countries that the Secretary specifies. The subject goods are registered for or approved for general marketing in at least one foreign country that the Secretary does not specify. What? Those statements appear to cancel each other out. Thirdly, the manufacturing and quality control procedures used in the manufacturing of the subject goods are acceptable. Not even good manufacturing processes specified. The minimum required for a supermarket packet of vitamins in Australia. Just acceptable. What on earth does acceptable mean? This gives bureaucrats unlimited power with no accountability. D. That the subject goods are of a kind included in Schedule 10 to the Therapeutic Goods Regulation 1990, which for clarity includes vaccines and that the approval is necessary in the interest of public health, in the bureaucrat's opinion. So let's take a closer look at this deceit. The, word of this section, the wording of this section is turned around. A drug can be approved if there is no drug already available that can substitute for the new drug. Isn't that any new drug? Because by definition there will be no existing drug to substitute for it. Isn't this just a backdoor to allow the secretary to approve new drugs at their discretion? without a specified approval process. This is being sold as a measure to combat drug scarcity, yet it's not how this section was actually written. This section does not contain any of the following. There's no explicit binding limitation that this provision can only be used in the case of a drug scarcity. There's no definition around when the provisions are exercised other than a general statement about interests of public health, which of course could be anything that the bureaucrat decides on a whim. There's no sunset clause. With the wave of the Secretary's magic scepter, even under the excuse of shortage, drugs and vaccines are approved permanently. There's no requirement for safety testing. There's no suitable requirement for manufacturing quality and consistency. Now, if powerful multinational pharmaceutical companies have the ability to get a new generation drug approved with a shiny new patent to replace a drug that's out of patent, and all they had to do was stop making the old drug to create a deliberate shortage, what do you think the drug company will do? Of course this will be rorted, with no protections in place to stop that happening. 400 new mRNA drugs are in development. Two mRNA manufacturing facilities are already in, under construction in Australia alone. What did the drug companies know last year when they started construction of these plants? This, this is what they knew. This was coming for them. Schedule 9 will save drug companies billions in regulatory costs. During COVID, the TGA approved 23 new, 23 new drugs under emergency use authorisation. There was no long-term safety testing, minimal testing of any kind, no testing on progeny and no close monitoring of database for adverse event notifications, other than to minimise the extent of the harm family doctors reported all over Australia. Or rather, doctors were reporting until APRA bullied medical professionals into silence. 
With the Therapeutic Goods Amendment, Bill 2022, the, and the, and the Albanese Labor government is setting Australia up to be a paradise for big multinational pharmaceutical companies and to be a killing field. Separately on today's notice paper is the Work, Health and Safety Amendment Bill 2022, which, if passed, will require every business in the country to introduce vaccine mandates for their staff, their people, and employers who do not will face savage penalties. The Albanese Labor government is not a government of the people. It's a government of the global elites, for the global elites. And with Big Pharma's $500,000, half a million dollars in election campaign donations to Labor, a government, it's a government under globalist elites, the globalist predators, BlackRock, Vanguard, State Street. Welcome to the facade that they have in front of them, apparently with the consent and aid of the Greens and with the Liberal Nationals who scored Big Pharma election donations of $500,000, another half a million bucks. Now I'm old enough to remember when the Greens campaigned against foreign multinational pharmaceutical companies. Now the Greens actively expand Big Pharma's influence, expand their market share, expand their profit and their control over people. Talk about please explain we cannot say with complete certainty whether the 20,000 excess deaths up to October of 2022, that's just in 10 months, were the cause of COVID vaccines or some other factor. Most likely, it's a combination of many factors with medical experts saying quite clearly that excess deaths are directly and indirectly attri attributable due to COVID injections causing heart attacks, blood clots, cancers, Alzheimer's and many other adverse effects. What is inexcusable is not knowing the causes and not caring. Inhuman. How can 20,000 extra Australians die in a 10-month period and there not be a hue and cry to get to the bottom of it? That's immoral. It's inhuman. Yet now Labor wants to give these callous, shifty bureaucrats greater power to work for their big pharma mates. Surely we have to understand why so many people are dying before we make any significant change to the authorisation of new pharmaceutical drugs. Surely, surely we have to understand why so many people are dying before we make any significant change to the authorisation of new pharmaceutical drugs. If, as seems highly likely, the extreme level of harm being experienced is confirmed and deaths is confirmed as due to the mRNA technology or the spike proteins in these hideous things, and we, as a Senate, approve a dismantling of the drug approval process, then the very people we are here to represent will rightly damn you all for all time. I am appalled and disgusted that the Albanese Labor government would even think about introducing this monstrous inhuman bill. Minister Watt. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Uh, the Therapeutic Goods Amendment 2022 Measures No. 1 Bill amends the Therapeutic Goods Act 1989 to implement a number of measures which support the delivery of the highest quality health care for the Australian public by ensuring the continued access to critical prescription medicines and supporting the safe use of therapeutic goods by strengthening therapeutic goods post-market monitoring and compliance. In particular, the bill supports the implementation of a scheme for the mandatory reporting, of, mandatory reporting by hospitals of adverse events associated with medical devices. This measure would support the improved monitoring of safety concerns associated with medical devices through access to information held by hospitals that identifies serious adverse events and earlier detection of safety signals that may raise concerns about particular devices. The bill encourages innovation and investment in biologicals in Australia by introducing a new dedicated pathway for marketing approval uh, of biologicals that are for export only. The bill addresses and alleviates the effects of medicine shortages by amending the Act to allow the Secretary of the Department of Health and Aged Care to approve the importation or supply 
of an unapproved medicine that could act as a substitute for medicine that was previously approved in Australia. This measure is designed to ensure the continued supply of critical prescription medicines for Australians. The bill supports the safe use of therapeutic goods by strengthening monitoring and compliance activities through a number of measures, including stronger information gathering powers, extending the time frame for retaining seized goods and allowing the due date for an infringement notice to be extended once the due date has passed. The bill expands the persons to whom therapeutic goods advertising may be directed to include certain health professionals, persons pur purchasing therapeutic goods on behalf of registered charities or governments, and purchasing officers or practice managers of a healthcare practice. The bill also provides a mechanism for the approval of a restricted representation to be withdrawn where additional information about the efficacy of therapeutic goods becomes available, ensuring that advertising only corrects correct and accurate information and reducing the risk of unsafe use by consumers. I thank senators for their contributions to debate on this bill. So I'll put the question that the second reading amendment moved by Senator Steele John be agreed to. It's on sheet 1835. All those in favour say aye. aye. All those against? No. The noes have it. Aye. Division required? Bring the bill. Sorry. Sorry. Sorry, they've called a division. Yeah. So, can I just clarify, Senator Steele, John, you want to go to a division? Yes. Thank you. So, bring the bells.
Lock the doors. So the question is that the second reading amendment moved by Senator Steele drawn on sheet 1835 be agreed to. I'll call Senator Askew for the noes and I'll call anybody want to be the whip on, on the yes or Who, who's the whip? Senator Rice for the ayes. If we're visual. There being ayes 14, noes 25, the question is resolved in the negative. Um, I'll give senators a moment to either leave the chamber or move. Okay, um, Senator Rice, are you happy to move your amendment now? Yes, so I'd like to move my second reading amendment on sheet 1836. So, so I'll put the question that the um, amendment by Senator Rice on sheet 1836 be agreed to. All those in favour say aye. aye. All those against? Uh, the noes have it. Uh, Senator Rice, it is after 6.30, so there is no divisions. Would you like to do it on the voices? You want to hold it over till tomorrow? Okay, we'll, we'll do that. Sorry, Senator Wish Wilson, you have to stand and ask for, get the call if you want me to hear it. Uh, Senator Babette, do you wish to move your amendment now? Um, yes, I would. I would like to move my amendment from a second reading debate sheet uh, 1850, please. And Senator Babette, the same issue will arise in regard to the vote. Would you like to hold that over till tomorrow? Sorry. I'll put the question first. All those in favour of um, the amendment by Senator Babette on sheet 1850 say aye. aye. All those against? No. Uh, the noes have it. 
Okay. Senator Babette, would you like to hold that over till tomorrow morning? Thank you. Because it is after 6.30 and we're holding uh, votes over until tomorrow, there is no further uh, discussion tonight available on this bill, so I will call the clerk. Clerk. Government Business Orders of the Day number 3, Work, Health and Safety Amendment Bill 2022, second reading debate. Senator Cash, you're seeking the call. Thank you very much. And I rise to speak in support of the Work Health and Safety Amendment Bill 2022. Work health and safety laws in Australia are a shared responsibility. Each jurisdiction is responsible for implementing, regulating and enforcing their own work health and safety laws. Australia has model work health and safety laws that have been adopted in all jurisdictions except Victoria, which have similar laws in place. These model work health and safety laws are developed and administered by an independent statutory body, Safe Work Australia, through a process involving all jurisdictions as well as employer and employee representatives. In 2018, the five yearly review of the model work health and safety laws was commissioned by Safe Work Australia. Safe Work Australia appointed independent reviewer Ms. Marie Boland to conduct the review. The Boland review found that the laws were largely operating as intended, and the 34 recommendations from the Boland review were mainly clarifying in nature. In May 2021, as the Commonwealth Minister responsible for work health and safety, I convened a work health and safety ministers' meeting to consider the response to the Boland review. Ministers agreed on action for all 34 items of the Boland Review, reflecting the cooperative approach to the discussions that we all took. A key outcome of the meeting was ministers' unanimous agreement to introduce gross negligence or equivalent as a fault element for Category 1 offences, which apply when a worker is killed or suffers a serious injury or illness, which this bill will now introduce. This bill before the House introduces the first uh, before the Senate introduces the first tranche of policy decisions that were settled in the minister's meeting. These decisions were amending the model work health and safety laws to provide that a work group is negotiated with workers who are proposed to form the work group. That was recommendation 7B. Amending the obligation to train health and safety representatives to provide that health and safety representatives are entitled to choose a course of uh, training. That was recommendation 10. To align the process for the issuing and services of notices under the Model Work Health and Safety Act to provide for clarity and consistency. That was recommendation 16. Providing the ability for inspectors to require production of documents and answers to questions for 30 days after the day they or another inspector enter a workplace. That was recommendation 17. Enabling and clarifying that work health and safety regulators can participate in cross-border information sharing. That was recommendation 19. Amending the Work Health and Safety Act to include, as I've stated, gross negligence as a fault element in Category 1 offences under the Work Health and Safety Act. That was recommendation 23A extending the 12-month deadline to 18 months for a person to make a request to the regulator to bring a prosecution for a Category 1 or 2 offence, that was Recommendation 24, and prohibiting the insurance for work health and safety fines and inclusion of offences for breaching this prohibition. And that was Recommendation 26. In this bill, the government is also setting the fines for the newly created offence for providing insurance for work health and safety penalties. One of the most important aspects of this bill, as I said, and I worked through this with the ministers at the time in a very, very cooperative fashion, 
is the introduction of gross negligence as a fault element for Category 1 offences and the extension of time. Uh, without a doubt, any workplace death is a tragedy, and one death is one too many. Category 1 offences, as they currently stand, have a standard of recklessness which requires prosecutors to prove any intent to disregard a risk of death or serious injury. Now, this can be very, very difficult to prove at times. So what this bill will do is introduce Recommendation 23A of the Boland Review, which was the inclusion of gross negligence as a fault element in Category 1 offences. Can I just note, as the Commonwealth Minister at the time, that was negotiating with and working with the state jurisdictions, the state and territory jurisdictions, this recommendation was universally supported by all jurisdictions, and I am very proud that we are, were at the time able to achieve that result, and it is now being legislated. Grossly negligent conduct, as well as recklessness, should attract the most serious penalties under our work health and safety laws. And that is why, when in government, I was pleased to lead the Commonwealth Government charge to support the decision to introduce this change. By introducing the fault element of gross or criminal negligence, the change will ensure that the appropriate threshold is set to capture culpable conduct but also prevent or preserve the current risk-based approach adopted in the Category 1 offence. A Category 1 offence is an offence by a person engaging in conduct that exposes an individual to whom a duty is owed to a risk of death or serious injury being reckless to the risk. So, for example, an employer in the construction industry does not provide safety equipment, such as a harness netting or railing, in an open aired elevated workspace, and an employee severely injures themselves. The employer may be penalised under a Category 1 offence as they were grossly negligent and or reckless in their work health and safety duty, which led to a serious injury. This means businesses as well as workers with a work health and safety duty can be penalised if they are needlessly reckless or negligent in their duty. It also means that where accidents do occur, businesses and workers with work health and safety duties are not going to be unfairly penalised when they take the appropriate steps and minimise the risk of death or injury. Importantly, it continues the key principle of a risk-based approach for the work health and safety laws and does not focus on the outcome that occurs. In other words, we are seeking to prevent that outcome from occurring. It is critical that we ensure prosecutions and higher penalties apply not only to when a death or serious injury or illness occurs, but when there is a near miss due to gross or criminal negligence. This will ensure that Australian workplaces become safer for all. The priority must be on strengthening the risk-based approach of the work health and safety framework and to apply higher penalties equally to near misses and serious injuries, and these decisions in the bill do just this. The bill will also extend the deadline for requests of regulators to bring prosecution for Category 1 and Category 2 offences. This was another recommendation of the Boland Review, which again, as the Commonwealth Minister, I supported in the Work Health and Safety Minister's meeting. What the extension of time will actually do is ensure that another six months will be provided before a person loses the ability to request a regulator to actually bring a prosecution. What this in turn does is provide more time to them to provide the information as to why, especially due to the likelihood in these incidences for significant recovery, uh, for, for, the, for the grieving process, etc., and processes that mean you could actually miss the deadline. And that is why this additional six months was so important. In terms of the banning of the insurance and the indemnity products for work health and safety fines and penalties, uh, what the bill does, and again this was unanimously supported, it will also prevent a person required to pay a penalty under the law 
from recovering that penalty under a contract of insurance. The banning of the provision of insurance or indemnity products for criminal fines and penalties is not uncommon in Australia. For example, the Corporations Act 2001, the Financial Accountability Regime and its predecessor, the Banking Executive and Accountability Regime, they already have or had similar provisions to prohibit insurance and indemnity for penalties. Under the Fair Work Act, federal courts have the ability to make personal payment orders uh, for breaches of the Fair Work Act. This was an often used provision to ensure payment by individuals of, say, matters the CFMEU brought uh, to the court by the now abolished ABCC. The power to do this was reconfirmed by the High Court in the Australian Building and Construction Commission v the CFMEU in 2018. This was actually a High Court of Australia case. The rationale provided in the Boland Review is that the provision of insurance and or indemnification for work health and safety penalties, what that actually does is it undermines the deterrent effect of imposing such penalties. The rationale, as set out in the review and agreed to by the ministers, makes sense, and it accepted in the similar scenarios to ensure personal payment uh, for misconduct. This is why the Commonwealth supported this recommendation. It is important for the record as well to clarify for businesses that this part of the bill will not criminalise access to insurance and indemnity arrangements for legal costs in defending a prosecution. The Boland Review itself expressly stated that companies and officers should not be precluded from accessing insurance or indemnity arrangements for legal costs in defending a prosecution. The legislation before us does not do that either. It only stops insurance and indemnity from when prosecution has been successful and the penalty itself has been determined. In terms of clarifying Safe Work Australia's access to data, the bill will also amend the Safe Work Australia Act to clarify for the avoidance of doubt that information necessary to support Safe Work Australia's data and evidence functions may be provided to Safe Work Australia. Safe Work Australia is the national policy body for work health and safety and workers' compensation. Its members represent the interests of Commonwealth, states, territories, as well as employers and workers. As part of its role in developing these national policies and strategies, Safe Work Australia maintains and publishes national data and it sets to help inform policies that improve Australia's work health and safety laws and policies. Maintaining national data sets and developing evidence-based research relies on input from a range of sources, including jurisdictional authorities. The amendments in the bill that we have before us will ensure that persons with relevant information including work health and safety regulators and workers' compensation bodies, are to be able to provide this information to Safe Work Australia. The Work Health and Safety Minister's meeting also recommended that the work health and safety regulations be amended to deal with psychological risks and injury. And again, this was recommendation two of the Boland Review. Amending the regulations in this way represented a strengthening of our commitment to addressing and preventing psychological injury in Australian workplaces. This recommendation responded to stakeholder concerns at the absence of specific regulation on this issue, and it should now assist business, in particular obviously small businesses, to meet their obligations in relation to psychological health. Many recommendations agreed to at the meeting of ministers in May 2021 respond to concerns raised by families who have been affected by a workplace death, and they overlapped with a number of the recommendations that were contained in the Senate inquiry into industrial deaths. They never came home. Ministers at that time or at this time also agreed for Safe Work Australia to work with relevant experts to undertake a review into the feasibility of developing national work health and safety sentencing guidelines, and that was recommendation 25. Ministers also endorsed the national principles to support families following an industrial death. These principles were developed by Safe Work Australia in response to the recommendations of the Senate inquiry into industrial deaths. They never came home. All ministers, including myself at the time, 
agreed to task Safe Work Australia to also work with experts to undertake whether it was possible or feasible for a national work health and safety sentencing guidelines, which would help further harmonise regulators' responses in similar situations across jurisdictions. In the same meeting, Work Health and Safety Ministers agreed for Safe Work Australia to produce and publish the model Code of Practice Managing the Risks of Respiral Crystalline Silica from Engineered Stone in the Workplace. And other, um, other work Safe Work Australia is undertaking, a resort of the former, former coalition government included, drafting amendments to the model Work Health and Safety Regulations to prohibit the uncontrolled processing of engineered stone, publishing revised national guidance on working with silica and silica-containing products and developing additional guidance materials on managing the risks of occupational lung diseases. Without a doubt, all Australians, all Australians have the right to be safe in their workplaces, and it is important to Australians, whether they be employers or employees, that there are consistent laws around workplace health and safety. I am very pleased that the laws that we are introducing today uh, were agreed to when I was the minister, and I am very pleased to support the bill. Thank you, Senator Cash. Senator Shoebridge. Uh, thanks, Acting Deputy President. Um, I rise on behalf of the Greens to indicate we will be supporting this bill. And to indicate the context in which this debate is happening, last year I think 169 workplace fatalities occurred in the country. That is 169 workers who went to work and did not return. And, and to think of the collective trauma amongst the families and their co workers. And to acknowledge that at the outset and why it is essential that this House gets work health safety right, this parliament gets work health safety right, and why we look forward to reducing risk in the future, and why that should be an essential part of the work of this chamber and this parliament. Now, this bill is a largely non controversial bill that makes a number of changes to improve and streamline the operation of work health safety laws in the country. Um, it in large part seeks to implement recommendations made by uh, Ms Mary Boland as part of the review she did of the model work health safety laws and in particular her final report which she delivered in 2018. I'm just pausing there, it is somewhat frustrating that it's taken five years to actually implement these recommendations. And, and I, do, I do want to credit the minister for moving this through the parliament and bringing it on and putting it in place. Five years was too long to wait for the implementation of these reforms um, from the Boland Review. Uh, the, the, the amendments to the Work Health Safety Act, and I won't go into detail in each of them, but they include providing that negligence can be an alternative fault element for the most serious for, for category one offences. And of, and of course it should be. And, and the fact that it wasn't there in the initial um, laws has, has, has led to a number of a good many prosecutions not being put forward, because in the absence of that alternative basis for proving fault, it was next to impossible, next to impossible, to meet the standard, to hold employers and others to account for the most serious breaches of work health safety laws. The amendments also prohibit insurance for work health and safety fines. And that's critical if we're going to have accountability in the space. Because if, it, if employers can insure away the potential cost to them as corporations or individuals, they can just insure the risk, well, that creates a, 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 a lack of personal incentive to ensure that the laws are complied with. If you can contract out your criminal risk, well, obviously that makes workplaces less safe. And, and, and clearly prohibiting insurance for work health and safety fines is essential. It also clarifies that health and safety representatives are entitled to choose a course of training. They don't just sim simply have to take the training often offered by the employer. And there are obvious reasons why you would want to empower health and safety representatives to be able to, um, to choose the training that is going to be best for them rather than the training that their employer may want them to actually undertake. It, uh, 
it, it, it deals with some of the complications um, around processes for issuing and servicing of notice, simplifies that, and I think that's a good thing for all involved. And it has a series of other modest technical and clarifying um, amendments. Um, it is clear, though, that even with the passage of this bill, there is a vast amount more to do. After essentially a decade of the intentional erosion of workplace conditions, workers' pay and rights under the former coalition government. There is a lot more to do than is contained in this bill. Workers have seen their wages and conditions eroded. Overwork and unsafe work in parts of our economy has become normalised. Precari precarious work is becoming a business model. And all of this is of deep concern for work health safety um, in, in, in the increasingly diverse workplaces in this country. And the Greens will continue to push for comprehensive reforms that workers need going forward. And in particular, safe work needs to be, needs to be up to this reform task. And, and the evidence to date would suggest it isn't. Uh, uh, the Greens will be moving a second reading amendment to reflect one specific aspect of the future reform work that's needed. And that relates to the ongoing use of manufactured stone and the scourge of silicosis and the workers who work with it. We know that for years safe work has recognised silica as a workplace hazard, indeed a lethal workplace hazard, and has at different times recommended standards for treatment, recommended additional air filtering, made recommendations about wet or dry cutting, made recommendations about personal protective equipment. But they've known from the outset that those aren't working in place. They're not working in the diverse array of, of workplaces, often without much supervision, where manufactured stone is being cut, whether it's in small workshops in Western Sydney or cut on site in the high-rises commercial and residential buildings where this manufactured stone is being put in place. They know it doesn't work. And they've known it for years. And they've known that every year that they allow manufactured stone, high silica manufactured stone, to be put in workplaces, that young workers and others are being exposed to early, awful, painful, and in some cases utterly inevitable deaths as a result of their exposure to this dust. They've known it and they've failed to give the advice, the key advice, about banning it. And that's been put to them for years. Uh, I know this for a fact because in my former work as a, as a state MP in New South Wales, we undertook in 2019 a review of the state's dust diseases scheme. And the thoracic surgeons, the unions, the workers came to us in that inquiry and gave us some of the most heartbreaking evidence about young workers' lives being cut short by silicosis. I still remember the workers coming into the committee hearings and telling us about their diagnosis, telling us about the high likelihood of an early death in two or three years. And some of these workers were in their late 20s or early 30s. They spoke about their families. They spoke about how they'd done the work because they were skilled in it and they needed the income for their families, and now it was killing them and leaving their families with nothing. And I, I remember to today just how absolutely heartbreaking it was. And then to hear that Safe Work Australia wasn't moving to ban the product, but was just putting yet more ineffectual measures in place. It was so frustrating. And then neither the state government, or even at the time the state Labor opposition, let, let alone the federal coalition government or Safe Work Australia, were willing to make the hard call then and ban this stuff. And so in a, in a dissenting statement at the end of that, that, that inquiry, I, I said this, and I stand by it to this day. Manufactured stone is a relatively new product, first being distributed in the New South Wales construction set, sector in or about 2001. There are numerous credible alternatives for it in all aspects of construction, consistent with a hierarchy of control measures that forms the core of work health safety responses in Australia. The first response to an identifiable hazard like manufactured stone is, where possible, to remove it from the workplace. There's no doubt that manufactured stone has certain attributes that make it attractive to use. It's consistent, it's relatively cheap, and it provides a relatively low, high-gloss high finish that is attractive to certain consumers. 
In its time, asbestos also had certain attributes that made it attractive. It was low cost, highly fire resistant, easily cut and affixed. However, as the full medical and human cost of its use became apparent, asbestos was, nev was nevertheless eventually banned. This was after initial attempts by the industry to seek safer handling procedures and more restricted uses. I firmly believe we should learn from this history and, based on the evidence available to date, make the call to ban the use of manufactured stone in New South Wales. Of course, a federal ban would be preferable, and I acknowledge that New South Wales cannot ban its importation or availability in New South Wales. However, we can regulate construction and work health safety matters, and under those heads of power, a ban is entirely possible. Every month and year we delay, more workers will be exposed to the risk of deadly silicosis. No shiny benchtop is worth that. So I, that's what I said in 2020, but I said it with the support of thoracic surgeons, the CFMEU, and the workers at the end of 2019 the beginning of 2020. And what has Safe Work done to date? More of this tinkering at the edges. More of this, oh, we can deal with it by um, um, greater regulations in the workplaces. We can put more filtering in the workplaces. None of that will work. None of that will stop workers dying of silicosis. They've known that for years. And that's why I am, um, on behalf of the Greens, moving the second reading amendment um, that was circulated on sheet 1847 as revised. And that second reading amendment says this. It notes that high silica manufactured stone is currently causing the painful death of many young workers who contract deadly silicosis. The federal government and Safe Work have been on notice about the deadly health impacts posed by manufactured stone since at least 2019, when the matter was canvassed extensively in an inquiry by the New South Wales Legislative Council Standing Committee on Law and Justice and by the press. High silica manufactured stone is the asbestos of our age, and the evidence shows it is not being used safely with deadly results. And the Senate calls on the government to work with all relevant authorities to consider an urgent ban on manufactured stone and to ensure medical and financial support for those workers who are suffering with silicosis. And I want to put on the record my gratitude for the minister in working collaboratively to get agreement on that form of words and hopefully work to the truth of that. But I say again, where was safe work? And why is safe work still not providing the unambiguous evidence, the unambiguous advice that all the evidence says they should be providing? They're the, safe, they're the, they're the work safety regulator for the country. They've been told by unions, by workers, by thoracic surgeons, by everybody, apart from the, the companies themselves, that this stuff is deadly and they can't bring themselves to give the obvious advice that it should be banned. And worse than that, workers who have been exposed to this deadly dust since September of 2020 in this country, many of them can't even rely upon the fact that there's an insurance product from the manufacturers that will actually meet the costs of their claims that they have. Because the biggest manufacturer in the, in the space globally, Caesar Stone, has been refused insurance for its manufactured stone product in Australia since September 2020. And we know that not because of what Safe Work Australia has done. We know that because Caesar Stone has had to put their returns into US corporate authorities and give the disclosure in their returns to US corporate authorities. And so what has Safe Work's response been, been? When they know that this stuff is deadly, they know that workers are dying, and they know that the, the main distributor, distributor and manufacturer of the product in Australia, Caesar Stone, hasn't even been able to get insurance for the cost since September 2020. They've done bugger all. So yes, let's get this amendment through. And yes, I commend the work that the minister, but the unions and the workers and others in the space have been doing to move towards a ban. But this can't wait another week. Can't wait another month. It can't wait another six months. Every day of delay sees more workers exposed to deadly silicosis. And, 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 and at the moment, any worker whose exposure came through Caesar Stone faces the very real risk of not only having a deadly disease but having no insurance product to meet the claim for them and their loved ones and their families. 
And if Caesar Stone, which is a foreign corporation, decides to just pack up in, in Australia and cease its business, there will be no assets, no insurance, nowhere to go. It's like James Hardy Mark II, and it's unfolding directly in front of us. It's unfolding directly in front of us. And if there's one agency that's had the job to prevent this happening and has failed to act, failed to live up to its duty of care, it's Safe Work Australia. And we have a collective responsibility to do better. Because as I said before, and I'll say it again, no shiny bench top is worth the death of a worker. Thank you, Senator Shoebridge. Senator Green. Thank you very much, um, Madam Acting Deputy President. And um, I do rise to speak in favour of the Albanese Labor government's Workplace Health and Safety Amendment Bill. Um, and in doing so, I might just um, quickly uh, speak to some of what um, Senator Shoebridge um, was raising and the very real and urgent need to address um, uh, engineered stone and the impact it's having on workers. And I want to thank um, the Minister for um, Workplace Relations um, for um, uh, urging urgent reform on this and working with states and territory ministers um, to get that urgent reform. Um, we know that this is something that has been on the agenda um, for some time, uh, and it's something that does need to be dealt with urgently, and I look forward to seeing those reforms um, in place uh, at a national level but across the country. Um, I welcome the opportunity to speak on these um, important measures in the bill and congratulate the Minister on, uh, uh, for Employment and Workplace Relations as well as his state and territory counterparts for landing a consensus on these measures. Um, they might be modest, but they are very meaningful reforms. Um, this bill harmonises the existing Act with the model laws from Safe Work Australia's work in response to the Boland Review. Not many people may have heard about what the Boland Review is, but it's a really important piece of policy work. Ms Marie Boland conducted a review of Australia's model work health and safety laws in 2018. The Boland Review made 34 recommendations on updates to model work health and safety laws. And I want to thank Ms Boland for her important work in this space. Since then, the recommendations of the review have been the subject of tripartite collaboration between Commonwealth, state, territories, as well as employers and unions. These groups have been meeting to examine the recommendations and build consensus on a model workplace health and safety laws. This bill is a first step in the Albanese Labor government's work health and safety reforms. So what will change because of this bill? As I said at the top of my remarks, these modest but meaningful reforms have the potential to make important impacts on the prevention of workplace accidents. This bill strength strengthens the government's national approach to managing work, health and safety, delivering more consistency across jurisdictions and better information sharing better between key organisations. Importantly, this bill clarifies that health and safety representatives, or HSRs as they're commonly referred to in the workplace, um, elected by their workmates, can choose a course of training and more effectively issue improvement notices. HSRs are elected by their workmates to do the important work of maintaining and advocating for safe systems of work and the elimination of hazards. It would seem straightforward that a HSR should be able to elect a training course best suited to them and their workmates to ensure they are prepared and supported in the important work that they do. It would seem that way, but not all employers have respected that principle. Uh, a few years ago at a train maintenance depot in Sydney, two HSRs went to their boss and put in their paperwork for a health and safety course of their choosing, which suited the needs of them and their workmates. They were told by their management that they weren't able to attend their chosen training and that management would choose where they go. Those HSRs fought this direction all the way to the State Industrial Relations Commission and they won. The, that precedent informs the clarification that we see now in this suite of measures. I want to congratulate those particular HSRs uh, and their workmates who backed them every step of the way. I also want to acknowledge the members and staff of the Australian Manufacturing Workers Union who got behind those HSRs and made that win possible. Because of their support, that win is now becoming national law. 
We know that health and safety representatives are trusted leaders and play a vital role in keeping workplaces safe. This is why we are updating the laws to make their jobs easier and simpler. Our government's work health and safety amendment also closes a loophole that some unscrupulous employers have used to avoid accountability for poor safety performance. Currently, employers can purchase insurance and work health and safety fines, which is extraordinary when you think about it. Imagine if an ordinary person could take out an insurance policy against getting parking fines. You would imagine the compulsion to act in the way that avoids punishment would seriously diminish, and that is exactly what has happened on workplaces. That's what this loophole means for some employers. The potential punishment and spirit of the penalties are neutralised. Our changes mean that employers doing the wrong thing can't avoid taking financial responsibility for unsafe work environments. Our changes prohibit insurance for work health and safety fines. Importantly, the bill also guarantees stronger consequences and penalties for employers who expose workers to serious and fatal risks. The bill strengthens the ability for action to be taken against employers who recklessly cause fatal injury to a worker. It updates what are called Category 1 offences, the most serious category of prosecution in relation to injuries to a worker, to now include negligence, which has a more realistic prospect of prosecution. Previously, Category 1 only listed offences on the basis of recklessness leading to the death of a worker, which has never been used because of the unrealistic threshold for prosecution. This sounds like a very small technical legal change, but my hope is that it is a first step in more prosecutions in cases where there has been a death of a worker that could have been prevented. Too many workers are killed in preventable workplace accidents. Last year, 169 workers lost their lives. They went to work and they never came home. Just over two weeks ago in North Queensland, two workers lost their life. Dylan Landridge was 33 years old and Trevor Davis was aged 36. They had long lives ahead of them. They died in North Queensland in a mine when they were trapped underground. They went to work and they should have come home. I want to be really clear about this because this is incredibly important. The only acceptable number of workplace deaths is zero. Every single worker has the right to come home at the end of their shift just as safe and just as healthy as when they left for work. Our government not only believes that, but today we are legislating to make that so. That's because Labor is on the side of working people. We believe that workers should be safe, respected and fairly paid. These changes start our work at improving workers' safety. The previous government had this report since 2018. Until now, not a single recommendation has been implemented by the Commonwealth. These are modest and mostly technical changes but they demonstrate our government's commitment to safety and respect at work, and they paint a stark contrast with the previous government. This is just the beginning of our government's reforms on health, safety and respect at work. The tripartite body that made these recommendations has continued their work looking at future reforms. I understand that the next tranche of reforms will continue to strengthen protections for workers from serious and fatal injuries due to negligence and recklessness. This is what's needed to keep workers safe. I also want to acknowledge the important work being done alongside union members and our state counterparts to take long overdue action against hazards, including silicosis. This is incredibly important work that has gone silent for too long and it must be fixed. Our government is also working through industrial relations changes which have direct correlation with better health and safety. If you want a safe workplace, if you support workers coming home at the end of the day, then you should support same job, same pay laws. Because we know 
that when workers have the same job and the same pay, when they are treated with dignity and respect, and they are given the power to speak up about safety, they come home safe at the end of the day. I commend these changes to the chamber, and I urge the Senate to support them. I thank the Senate. Thank, thank you, Senator Green. Senator Scar. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, I too rise to speak in favour of these amendments. I don't accept the characterisation from the previous speaker in relation to the last government, uh, but I'll quickly move on. Uh, to deal with the substance of the issues here. And the way I want to address this is talking about a particular case. And when I was looking into this topic, uh, I saw some commentary in relation to this case, and I went back and actually read this case. So let me tell you the story of Brett Fritch and why his story is extraordinarily relevant to the legislation which we're talking about today. So, during the construction, I'm quoting from the case, during the construction of the Adelaide desalination water plant on 16 July 2010, occupational health and safety offences were committed by a company called Ferrocon SA Pty Ltd and the relevant responsible officer for safety. They resulted in the death of 35-year-old rigger Brett Fritsch and a near miss for another rigger by the name of Craig Fowler. The rigger's employer, Ferro Con, was using a large crane to install a 1.8-tonne, 14-metre-long steel monorail beam to the rafters of a partially built building. The lifting of the beam had been poorly planned by others. No risk assessment or job safety analysis had been undertaken for this type of lift, and no safe working procedure had been devised to take account of the particular hazards of the task. As a result, Mr Fritsch was required to pull down heavily on a tagline in, in an attempt to lower the tilted beam's high end to a level position, so it could then be bolted to a rafter. This necessarily required Mr Fritsch to stand under the beam. Just think about that. To stand under a 1.8 ton beam to exert the required force, contrary to a general instruction to not stand under a load. Whilst Mr Fritsch was trying to do this, the fabric sling supporting the beam snapped, resulting in the end of the beam dropping directly onto his head. He was instantly rendered unconscious and died soon after. The other rigger, Craig Fowler, was standing on an elevated work platform at the time. His machine was struck by the falling beam, but he was able to ride the fall until he could jump clear onto nearby scaffolding. So that is the case of Mr Brett Fritsch. And I want to read to you excerpts of the statement which was given by his mother to the South Australian Magistrates Court, Industrial Magistrate Court. And I think when we're debating or considering provisions such as this, we should reflect on the individuals who are impacted by these events. These, these, these changes aren't just words on a page. They have material impact in terms of everyday Australians, loved ones who are doing their work duties uh, and suffer harm. So this is what Brett's mother said. Quote, this is my victim impact statement, but I am not the victim here. Brett, my beautiful boy, is the real victim. Brett has been robbed of his life of being a devoted and loving hubby and daddy when he was so happy and in the prime of his life. You have changed the natural order of life for me. A mother should never outlive her child. And she goes on, talking about her grandson and the impact of this tragedy on her grandson. I quote, watching Brett's little one grieve and struggle with questions about death that a now four-year-old 
should never have to deal with is utterly heart-wrenching. He periodically asked me about his daddy. He asked me last year, my daddy is lost. Where is he lost to, Nana? And he has cried and got angry and frustrated because he can't possibly understand or find in his vocab the words to explain his feelings and queries. End quote. And finally, Brett's mother says directly to the magistrate hearing this case as follows. Your Honour, I need for something very positive to come out of all of this. Please don't allow my Brett to have died in vain. You have the authority to send out a message loud and clear to construction companies that workplace deaths and serious injuries will not be tolerated by the courts." End quote. So I can't imagine what it's like to be in the position I can try to understand, but I can't fathom what it must be like to lose your son and then be faced with that position of dealing with a grieving family whilst you're also dealing with a mother's grief. But I think it is fit and proper that we consider those words as we consider this legislation and also consider that this legislation will have impact on everyday Australians. Everyday Australians, and Senator Green referred to those who are killed at work and those who suffer serious injury. So these are not just words on a page. This is dealing with everyday Australians. So in this case, the industrial magistrate identified no less than four failings of the company involved, Ferrocon, and I'll go, I'll go through them. First, Ferrocon also knew decisions may have to be made during the course of each lift, but left all safety considerations of the job up to the supervisor and workers to, at best, be identified, discussed, agreed upon and implemented on an ad hoc basis. Second, the second major failing of Ferrocon was to not ensure that a site and task specific safe work procedure was developed for lifting this particular beam on 16 July. Third, Ferrocon's third failing was in not prohibiting the installation of the beam unless sufficient space was available on the ground inside the building on which to lower the beam for the purpose of re-rigging. And fourth, Ferrocon's fourth failing was to not ensure that the lift complied with its own general job safety analysis for structural steel erection and, in particular, a written requirement that riggers were not to stand under a load." End quote. Clearly, clearly, acts of negligence, omissions, which would fall within the definition of negligence as is introduced by this bill. And it should be recognised that in relation to the standard of proof that is required in this regard, there is reference, there is reference to the criminal code definition of negligence, and that is this. A person is negligent with respect to a physical element of an offence if his or her conduct involves such a great failing short of the standard of care that a reasonable person would exercise in the circumstances and that the conduct meets cri or merits criminal punishment for the offence." That is the standard, and that is the standard which every single employer in this country should meet. Every single employer should be meeting those standards, and if they aren't, there needs to be consequences, because there are consequences for people such as Brett and his family. And we need to take that carefully into account. And I say that as someone who comes from the mining industry. For 12 years, I was working in the mining industry. Before that, I was involved in a number of investigations into fatalities on mine sites, serious injuries, and the memories of the consequences of those fatalities for the individual workers concerned, for their workmates and their families, have stayed with me. Lastly, I want to deal with this point, and again, it came up in Brett's case in relation to this issue of general indemnities. And I quote from the case, Ferrocon had in place a general insurance policy 
which apparently included indemnification of its director for fines imposed for his criminal conduct. So in this case, the director, the responsible officer of this company, had an insurance policy which provided an indemnity with respect to any penalties he received. The insurance cover carries a $10,000 excess or deductible payment. As Ferrocon is in liquidation, because the company went into liquidation after this, so no recourse against the company, and has no assets with which to pay the excess, the responsible officer has paid it personally. So the responsible executive, responsible officer, paid the excess personally to get the benefit of the insurance policy. And the magistrate continues. He may not even bear the full cost of this if claimed as a tax deduction. By his payment, he has insured the insurance company, grants both Ferrocon and, more importantly, him the indemnity he sought. In this way, the responsible officer has made arrangements to avoid the vast bulk of the anticipated monetary penalty. In my opinion, the responsible officer's actions have also undermined the court's sentencing powers by negating the principles of both specific and general deterrence. The message his actions send to employers and responsible officers is that with insurance cover for criminal penalties for occupational health and safety offences, there is little need to fear the consequences of very serious offending, even if an offence has fatal consequences." End quote. So that, that is the issue that this legislation fix, fixes. Because it should not be the case. It should not be the case that a responsible officer who has been grossly negligent, grossly negligent, should be able to get an indemnity through insurance against the penalty which is imposed after going through appropriate legal process against the consequences of him breaking or she breaking the law. It should not be the case that someone should be indemnified through insurance so that they don't have to take the real financial consequences, which cannot in any way, cannot in any way really um, in any way compensate or appropriately um, be an appropriate indication of the loss suffered in this case by Brett's family, the loss of that young life. But it should not be the case that a responsible officer should be able to get indemnity insurance to cover that cost. And uh, I see Senator Roberts is here in this um, has just arrived, and I know Senator Roberts has held very responsible positions in the in the mining industry as uh, a site officer and had responsibility for safety. And I'm sure Senator Roberts would agree with me that the number one obligation upon people holding those issues, those positions of responsibility, is to make sure all of your workers, after they spend a day at work get home safe and sound to their loving families. That is the number one responsibility, the primary responsibility. So it is, uh, it is wrong that in a case such as this, in terms of the, the fatality, the death of Mr Brett Fritch, that the responsible officer should have been able to avoid, avoid responsibility, the cost of meeting the criminal penalty that was incurred by him because he did not did not discharge his responsibilities as a responsible officer. So if I can um, say for the record that this is a case uh, where the Senate is looking to close this loophole. It is about more than just words on a page. This is about people, people um, who have suffered uh, great loss in their families and the human ele element of this must always be remembered uh, and always be considered. So I hope uh, Brett Fritch's mother somewhere, 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 somehow knows that this place is, is now uh, rectifying this situation where the responsible officer had responsibility for keeping her son safe and sound managed to avoid liability to meet the penalty which were justly imposed against him. Thank you, Senator Scar. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I want to read a summary of this bill because I'm a servant of the people of Queensland and Australia, and I know I'll only get uh, two minutes tonight, and I'll be in continuance in the morning. This is a sneaky 
dangerous bill that, if implemented in full, puts many employers and employees at risk of severe penalties, including up to five years jail and fines of up to $600,000. There is an obligation on employers to enforce safety measures, which could include compulsory vaccinations against COVID or similar diseases for employees. <clears throat> Secondly, if a complaint is made about the employer, even if the complaint is made not involving deliberate actions, the onus of proof is reversed and the employer is considered guilty unless he or she can prove their innocence. That's a complete turning, overturning and reversal of fundamental legal principles. Any legislation that includes a reversal of the onus of proof is a very major event and never should be considered non-controversial. The reversal of the onus of proof flies in the face of the accepted principle that a person should be considered innocent until proven guilty. The onus of proof is on the person asserting guilt. This is known as the presumption of innocence. And I notice all the lawyers in this place, in the previous bill on the TGA, which is in continuance, and this bill hang their heads and pretend it goes away. The reversal of the onus of proof is a major issue and should only be imposed in exceptional cases. Labor have at least three pieces of legislation proposed in this week's session, and two on the non-contro list include provisions for the reversal of the onus of proof. They include the Export Control Measures Bill as well as this Work Health and Safety Bill. We will definitely be opposing this bill in its current form. It is a sneaky, dangerous bill. We will be raising two amendments, and if they pass, then we will be supporting the bill. I want to say, just before I get cut, uh, shut down for the night, that in my experience— Order, Senator Roberts. <laughs> it being 7.30 p.m., uh, you will be in continuation, and I propose that the Senate now adjourn. Senator Polly. I rise this evening to speak about youth mental health and the impact of social media. Professor McGorry spoke with me recently on how there's been a concerning increase in the number of young people dealing with debilitating mental health problems. Whilst there has always been issues with bullying and harassment of young people, there used to be an escape by going home. Now the bullying follows our children home on social media. The faceless way that people can bully others on social media, meaning that bullying is so often more uh, distressing, and people uh, that are perpetrating this action actually get to hide behind a screen. The pressure on young people to fit in with their peers and to be up to date with trends and to, to be grown up before their time is widespread, and some of that has been contributed to social media. Young people are feeling pressured to have sexual relations before they're ready. They're being pressured into participating in other activities that I believe puts them at risk. Without the necessary skills and experience, it's hard for young people to be able to identify when they're being groomed and who perhaps are the perpetrators of and the risk they put themselves in by not understanding the implica impl implications of child exploitation. And if our youth do not comply with the norms, then they too um, are subject to further harassment and bullying, and that social media, that pile on, uh, just gets greater and greater. And it puts an enormous impact on to young people's mental health. Children are being pressured to grow up, uh, to use social media, perhaps before they're truly ready as individuals. Quite often we find that children are influenced by their peers and that we know that it's pretty natural 
that we all mature at different, different pace. And only too often we're finding that children are ending up in circumstances and situations through social media that they're really not skilled to cope with. They don't have the experience to deal with it. And unfortunately, too many parents and carers aren't afraid enough and have enough experience themselves with social media to be able to necessarily understand and identify the dangers. We all know that low self-esteem is made worse by the pressure placed on young people by themselves, but also by their peers. Dr Emmanuel, from Senior Director of the Mood Disorder Centre at the Child's Mind Institute, says that social media is making self-esteem even more difficult and worse for young people. These are real issues that young people are dealing with every day. Social media has also contributed to the horrific rise in the sexual exploitation and abuse of children. This is happening not just overseas, this is happening in our own backyards. This is happening across all our communities. Children are spending an inordinate amount of time on the internet, playing games and using social media and unfortunately potentially being targets of predators. And this isn't just, as I said, a problem for countries overseas. This is, this is a problem in Australia. This is a problem in my own community. Just in the last six months or so, we've had almost half a dozen perpetrators uh, brought to justice in my home state. We need to be serious when we're considering how we deal with social media and the impact that it's having on our children. We need to engage with them. We need to know who they're engaging with on social media. This is an ever-present problem in terms of perpetrators that are out there taking advantage of vulnerable young people. We need to be mindful of that. We need to educate ourselves as parents and as carers and as grandparents. I can't emphasise how important this education is in yes, helping Senator us to Polly, protect our children. Senator Canavan. Uh, thank you, Madam, Acting Sorry, Madam President. Uh, uh, I would like to speak tonight about Malcolm Tiger Mackenzie. Tiger is a 70-year-old proud Aboriginal man. Tiger lives on a property near the town of Hawker in the stunning Flinders Ranges area of South Australia. Tiger has worked hard all of his life and he's taught his children and grandchildren the importance of education and hard work. He proudly declares that his family includes five tradies and a sergeant of police. In 2019, the local Port Augusta newspaper wrote that Tiger Mackenzie is a champion of the Aboriginal people. As an Indigenous leader, he wants to get his people into business and jobs. Mr Mackenzie of Port, Port Augusta is described as a motivator, activist, intimidator, provocateur, visionary and one of a kind. He aims to bring about the best for his Aboriginal community and the region they live in. Tiger, Tiger can be proud of what he has built from humble beginnings. He grew up in a mission. When he left to attend school uh, later on in life, his education was stymied by discrimination. But he was gifted at sport, and through the connections he made at football, he was able to find work as a driver for the Commonwealth Railways. He later mentored young Indigenous people who worked at the Roxby Downs Mine, and he served as a councillor on the Davenport Council. Tiger is a great Australian character. I had the privilege of working closely with Tiger, his family and his community when, as Minister for Resources, we were consulting on where to select a site for a national radioactive waste facility. Tiger wanted this facility in his community because he could see the potential that it would bring in terms of local jobs and economic development opportunities, especially for young people. I was, uh, I, Tiger recently phoned me up uh, because he wanted to share with me his views about The Voice. Tiger supports uh, a voice uh, that, can break, that can improve the lives of Aboriginal people on the ground. We had a broad ranging and respectful discussion about the proposed voice. At the conclusion of our discussion, I proposed that I make a speech in the Senate providing his perspective as a thoughtful and worthwhile contribution to this debate, hence this speech tonight. Tiger wants to support the voice, but he's disappointed about the lack of detail coming from the government about the proposal. While not denying the goodwill of those supporting the voice, Tiger is concerned that the government is not telling the Aboriginal people how the voice will benefit them. 
And from Tiger's perspective, this benefit must mean more education, more jobs and business development opportunities, especially for young Aboriginal people. He questions, Tiger questions how a panel of bureaucrats in Canberra can determine how the voice will work or how they can choose representatives or how they can decide where benefits, support and funding will flow. He says they need to get out and listen to people. They are getting well paid just to sit in Canberra. While Tiger strongly supports native title, uh, he's also worried that, that bureaucrats in that system might simply see the native title rep bodies as being more broadly representative, an easy option for the voice that could effectively block the small v voice of individuals on the ground and not share the benefits more widely. Tiger just wants to see resources shared where they can do the greatest good, and he uses the example of working with G'day groups at Wilpina Pound, a model that could work in other locations across Australia, where local Aboriginal people sit down with tourist operators and determine how they can work together for the benefit of both the business and the local people. I agree. What Indigenous Australians want, just like every all other Australians, are practical examples and solutions that promote education, training, employment and business development, and that breaks the cycle of unemployment, welfare dependence, violence and crime. In my opinion, we can do these things without creating another big, expensive bureaucracy. It was a great honour to work with Tiger and his community to try to achieve more economic opportunities for the Hawker region. Unfortunately for Tiger, the vote in his region did not support a radioactive waste facility, and instead the project is proceeding in Kimber. Uh, nearby, uh, in, also in South Australia, where 60 per cent of people voted in favour. But I recognise Tiger's unwavering passion and commitment to deliver practical outcomes for his family and community. I, as I have seen him fight for them, I have come to understand where he gets his nickname of Tiger. Madam President, I hope we can approach the debate on The Voice in a similar way to the respectful discussion that Tiger and I had. Aboriginal people are individual people. Each of them has their own individual positions. Not all of them have the same view on any issue, let alone the voice. Indeed, they cannot even be divided into arbitrary, binary, yes or no categories. Some are maybes, some are don't knows, or even some are don't cares. But all of these views must be respected. Otherwise, the voice proposal will not recognise Australians. It will just divide us. Across all that diversity of opinion, I'm sure there are a lot more Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, like Tiger, who share some level of dissatisfaction, disappointment, frustration and caution about the voice. They want to be more fully informed. They want to know how the voice will improve their lives and, importantly, improve the futures for their grandchildren and children. They want to know that someone will listen, understand and act on their concerns, not just speak for them, but listen as well. I hope Tiger's request does not go unheard. Thank you, Senator Canavan. Senator Grogan. Thank you, President. Um, in 2005, Tom Carmer, as the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Social Justice Commissioner, called for a commitment, a deep commitment, to achieve equality in health and in life expectancy for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people within 25 years. That was 2005. We're now in 2023. The outcomes of the Closing the Gap annual report last year highlighted the need for significant more action. We do not see ourselves making the progress that was anticipated back then. We do not see ourselves making the progress that was anticipated when Kevin Rudd said sorry in 2007 or when any of the other multitude of reports and investigations have been released to tell us exactly what this latest report tells us as well. We're not there. We're not making progress sufficiently. There are far too many of the recommendations that are either stagnant or going backwards. So the implementation report that was released this year is that chance to turn those goals to turn those aims into a genuine action-based plan, to set ourselves real targets, to set ourselves a real trajectory to make a fundamental difference, because that's what we really need to do. Um, the implementation plan includes such things as acceleration of building of new and remote housing, which is essential. It includes support for family violence and prevention um, legal service providers to deliver those legal and non-legal supports to women and children experiencing family and domestic violence. 
and it also includes support for First Nations water infrastructure because we still have communities who do not have safe and reliable drinking water. There's also uh, measures to look at the education outcomes for First Nations students, including on-country education and delivering improved access to junior rangers and more choice for families when it comes to culturally appropriate distance learning, because distance learning is something that they that is their option if they do not wish to leave home. We definitely need to do things differently. We need to work in partnership with communities to get better results. We must work together to close the gap and ensure that First Nation Australians have the same, same opportunities as every other Australian. Alongside the implementation plan, the voice to parliament will be critical. I myself have worked in um, Aboriginal affairs in various roles, and I've seen time and time again ideas, reports, suggestions put forward and fail to be implemented partly, not completely, or not given enough time, or to actually be poorly pitched. So the idea of running the voice to parliament as that voice, that advice for how things will go on the ground, how it will actually play out for people who are living in those communities, who are experiencing the health, life and life expectancy challenges that we see so readily every single year in the Closing the Gap report. The voice to parliament will be an enormous aid to us closing the gap by talking to the people who are affected, to talking to the people for whom we say we are trying to improve the outcomes, asking them, listening to them, taking their advice. The voice will make a difference and it will help us to close that gap. Thank you, President. Thank you, Senator Grogan. The Senate stands adjourned. We'll meet again tomorrow at 9am.